Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, Cabbage Head Fanfix. Back with amazing fanfiction. This is the second part of, What if Deku had inheritance quirk? Now before starting, please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. The following day had its ups and downs. The first half of the day was fine. Izuku had managed to get all of his homework done, despite his long nap the evening before. It was after that, when the final heroes and villains matches finished that things got complicated. They dissected each battle, discussing strategy, compatibility of quirks, successes and failures of everyone's matches, but saved the first for last. Izuku's fight with Kakin seemed to be the one that everyone had an opinion about, and many were divided on how it was handled on both sides. Izuku listened and took notes about everything they said, especially where it pertained to him, and didn't say much unless he was asked to clarify something. This was a time to listen to critique. Not argue about whether the choices he made were the correct ones. Kakin, on the other hand, seemed to take everything anyone said as an insult or a personal attack, especially those who said that his escape excuse and subsequent attack from behind was a stretch in explaining his behavior. He shouted and growled and threatened every person who dared criticize him, even if no one seemed to feel threatened by any of it. All might let them hash it out for a while, until Kakin started literally sparking off at people. These are all very interesting points, All Might conceded. I find it very telling in many ways how many of you took this assignment very seriously and embraced your role as though it was an actual real-life scenario. Also, as Yeyarazu pointed out, how many of you used the fact that it was a school exercise and exploited the parameters of that to your advantage, knowing that in a real-life situation, that wouldn't fly. Many of the class looked at each other either guiltily or triumphantly. That started out another rehash of who had taken their roles seriously and who hadn't. Ada was pleased that everyone in his hero, villain group agreed that he had taken to the role of villain wholeheartedly, but Izuku couldn't fathom it. He wished that they had been allowed to hear what everyone was saying during their turns. He'd only known the speedster for three days, but it was pretty obvious that Ada was a die-hard rule follower. Still, his team had won, so there was no arguing with the results of his team up with Hiroraka. The bell rang while they were teasing Ayama about accidentally burning a hole through the missile with his naval laser. Everyone gathered their things and were standing to leave. When Aizawa called out that Bakugu and Midoriya should stay behind, Izuku sank back down into his seat, wondering what this was about, but afraid he already knew. His battle with Kakin had gotten personal on both sides, and now they were probably going to be in trouble for it. Aizawa came and sat in Siro's chair, facing the two boys with a sigh. You can guess why I asked you both to stay behind, he said. TCH, Kakin said. It was a noise dripping with derision. Sorry, sensei, Izuku said contritely. Why are you apologizing? He asked, his voice giving nothing away. I fought dirty, Izuku said, because I was angry. Aizawa looked at Kakin and just waited. What? Kakin asked defensively. I didn't do anything wrong. When Aizawa just continued to stare at him, Izuku squirmed uncomfortably in his seat. He really wanted to say something to Kakin about being more cooperative and respectful to their teacher, but didn't think it would be appreciated by either of them. When Kakin didn't say anything further and just stared defiantly, Aizawa pulled out his phone and showed them a photo. Izuku had already seen it, his back before it had been healed. Izuku remembered having a slight freak out when he'd noticed blood in his urine last night, before remembering he'd taken damage to his kidney earlier. Even though the injury had been healed, the blood had already been shed. The picture didn't seem to have any effect on Kakin, who stared at it with a bored expression. Aizawa flicked at the screen with his thumb, bringing up another picture. This time Izuku gasped at the sight of Kakin lying in a bed in the nurse's office. Both of Kakin's eyes were black and swollen shut, and the pillow beneath his head was stained with blood. His throat was a mass of purple bruises that traveled up to his jawline and down to his collarbones. His costume had been peeled away to reveal a shoulder resting at an odd angle, much lower than the other, and bruised just as badly as Izuku's back had been. Izuku could feel tears sting the backs of his eyes and pull on his lashes. The pain must have been unbelievable, and it was a mercy that Kakin had been unconscious for it. Recovery girl was right. Kakin could have easily snapped his neck, and Izuku would have had to live knowing that he'd had a part in it. Aizawa's eyes flicked briefly to Izuku's before going back to bore into Kakin's steely gaze. This time, the blonde was scowling at the picture, then looking away as though embarrassed. He still didn't offer any kind of remorse or explanation. Let me tell you my observations about this fight, Aizawa said quietly. For all he spoke softly, his words were very impactful and filled Izuku with a feeling of dread. First, Midoriya. A throat punch is fighting dirty, but let me be the first to tell you that it's a valid tactic. It's quick, and often disabling in a situation that needs an especially fast resolution. The media will drag you for it, but you'll probably be alive to live through the bad press. Use it sparingly. 
Izuku didn't tell him that he wasn't the first to tell him this, but that was because he had a huge lump in this throat that he wasn't sure he could speak around. He nodded jerkily. The rest of your fight was pretty clean. You telegraph a bit too much. You're too trusting. Those are things we can correct. He nodded again, taking comfort in the implication that he was not going to be expelled for his actions. Now for Bakugu, Aizawa continued. The first thing you did wrong was not listening to your partner. Yeirazu isn't a recommendation student for nothing. She's incredibly intelligent, capable and inventive. She still lost to half and half, Kakin grumbled, making Izuku want to scream at him to shut up for his own good. Would that still be true if you'd followed the plan she wanted to use? Aizawa asked. Kakin shrugged and looked away. It made Izuku wonder what Yeyorazu's plan had been. He'd have to remember to ask her. Your second mistake was not only underestimating your partner, but also your opponents. Todoroki was also a recommendation student. He got edged out by Midori. But if there had been fewer recommended students this year, he would have won the spot easily. You were outclassed and outmatched from the get-go. Bullshit. Kakin spat, finally showing some emotion. How so? Aizawa asked as if one of his students hadn't just sworn at him disrespectfully. Izuku was also curious about this. Kakin wasn't in middle school anymore, where he'd been a big fish in a small pond. This was Yue, where the standards were high and the students' skills even higher. Had he expected to walk in and own the place? Maybe he had. I'm better than any of them, Kakin averred, even though he had no proof at the moment. No, you're not, Aizawa said flatly. So let me set the record here straight. You almost didn't make the cut into Yue for the start. Your discipline records show you've got a mean streak and a bad habit of bullying. We don't tolerate that here. Izuku was shocked by this, though maybe he shouldn't have been. How far back did they look at records? Kakin had been a jerk in middle school, but hadn't particularly been out of control. At least not that Izuku knew about. Maybe he'd found someone new to pick on. Kakin looked as though Aizawa had slapped him across the face. Your one saving grace was the entrance exam, where you took on the zero-pointer to save Yuraka from being crushed while she was trapped in the rubble. That was what convinced the committee to give you a chance. That, and the fact that you've kept your nose relatively clean for the past couple of years and scored very highly on the written exam. Izuku chewed on his lower lip, remembering the first day of school. Yoraka had thanked Kakin for saving her from the zero-pointer and he had said he hadn't done it for her. Had that been true, or had that been a typical Kakin response, trying to seem aloof and cool? If it was true, the committee had misunderstood Kakin's intentions and he had only passed due to a stroke of luck. Kakin seemed to realize it, too. He clamped his mouth shut so tight his jaw bunched and his lips compressed into a thin line. You've got talent, Aizawa conceded. Your quirk is powerful and you have excellent control over it. However, your battle exercise told a story of a hothead who can't handle teamwork or failure with dignity. You flouted the rules of the scenario to continue to attack a classmate. One you have a past history of bullying. If it had been anyone else you went after, we might have just chalked it up to zealousness, but it wasn't. Not only did you attack him when you were declared eliminated, you were planning on pulling the pin on your gauntlet at close range, indoors. He would have dodged, Kakin said petulantly, but without much venom. Undoubtedly, Aizawa agreed. Do you know what would have happened to him if he wasn't able to dodge? And you'd made a hit. Kakin was looking at the top of his desk now, looking as though he might throw up. Izuku wondered if he should ask to leave, since his role in the conversation seemed to be over. He didn't get the chance. You're the one who designed and made the specifications for your costume. You know that your gauntlets store a significant amount of your sweat in order to set off especially large explosion. To set one off at close range, indoors could have had two possible outcomes out of many that would have been catastrophic. What do you think they are? When Kakin didn't answer, unable to look at their teacher, Aizawa turned to Izuku. What are they? He asked more kindly. The building could have taken damage that could have destabilized it. If it had hit a load-bearing wall, it could have collapsed part of it, Izuku said, having already considered this when doing his homework. That's one, Aizawa agreed. What about what could have happened to you? Almost anything, Izuku answered, trying to evade giving the answer he knew his teacher expected, depending on whether or not I could dodge in time. If you couldn't, Aizawa asked. It probably would have killed me, Izuku admitted. He had considered this, as well. He doubted that it had been Kakin's goal. He probably absolutely believed that Izuku would dodge. Still, it was still a possibility. He had wondered why the team that made their costumes would allow such a dangerous support item, and guessed that they had assumed a hero would never use it against another human being. Aizawa's gaze swung back to the top of Kakin's head. It could have killed him, and it almost killed you, he pointed out grimly. You were reckless and vengeful. Those are two things that will get yourself or someone else killed in most situations. Izuku was stunned to see a tear drop from Kakin's downturned face and splatter on the desktop. Was it from regret, rage, helplessness? It made Izuku's heart hurt in an indescribable way that wasn't anger or anything like that. Maybe it was pity. So, the question now is, how do we handle this? Aizawa asked. 
The feeling of dread in Izuku's chest doubled. Kakin's head jerked up, seemingly of its own accord, and the dread Izuku felt was mirrored in the other boy's expression. Normally, I'd just expel you, the teacher said bluntly. Cut my losses and send you packing without losing a moment of sleep over it. After hearing that Aizawa had expelled an entire class before, he was surprised that Kakin wasn't already on his way out the door. But, Kakin managed to croak. The powers that be have asked me to reconsider and mete out a different punishment, he said, not sounding happy about it. I'm not convinced, so I agreed to a compromise. Both boys looked at Aizawa, waiting for the other shoe to drop. Their teacher rubbed at his eyes with his fingers before retrieving a bottle of eye drops and administering them, letting them wait. Midoriya gets to decide. He finally said, whether you'll be expelled or be sent to general studies, instead, you're being dropped from the hero program until after the sports festival, but have a slim chance of returning to the hero course if you stay out of trouble and perform well in the festival. If Izuku decides you can stay, you will also be required to perform 100 hours of community service at the place of our choosing. Izuku's jaw dropped. He couldn't believe they were putting this on his shoulders. Why? Kakin must have been thinking the same, because his expression twisted. Everything in his demeanor said that he expected to be tossed out. Izuku went with his instincts. I think he should stay, Izuku said quietly, not looking at Kakin. He felt conflicted, since his life would be so much easier without having Kakin there all the time. He was trying to think of what All Might would do, or what Sir would have to say about it. He has an amazing quirk and intuitive fighting skills. He just, he needs to learn to care about people. Am I allowed to suggest that his community service involve helping other people in some way, and not just doing chores or picking up trash or something? Kakin was strangely quiet about this. Izuku looked at him, expecting to see disgust or anger, but instead he saw skepticism and suspicion. So, I can come back if I do well at the sports festival? Kakin asked, his voice sounding raw and stay out of trouble and complete your community service. I would also strongly suggest making a standing appointment with our school counselor to help you get that ego under control. Aizawa looked 100% serious about this. Izuku was half hopeful Kakin would accept, and half hopeful he'd cut his losses and leave. Did that make him a bad person? Izuku, I believe your ride home is waiting for you, Aizawa said after that. You go on ahead while Bakugu and I finish our discussion. Izuku quickly gathered his bag and bolted for the door not wanting to witness any more of this discussion than he already had. He would find out tomorrow whether or not Kakin took the offer to stay, or not. He found All Might waiting for him near his van, scrambled in, and buckled his seatbelt in a hurry. I can see you've survived your meeting with Aizawa, All Might said, sliding into the driver's seat and starting the ignition. You knew about that? Huh? Izuku asked, feeling mildly ill after making such an important decision for someone else. I was going to be the one to meet with you both, but my time in that form ran out before I had a chance, All Might said ruefully. Plus I think in this case, Aizawa was probably scarier than I could have been. So the point was to scare Kakin? Izuku asked. Yes and no, All Might said, pulling into traffic. A lot of factors came into play in this situation, including a long phone conference with his parents last night to discuss it. It was their idea to let you decide if he would be allowed to stay at UA, but he was going to lose his place in the hero course, regardless. His parents hope that this will scare him straight, so to speak. I feel kind of bad, but at the same time, there's no shame in being relieved, All Might told him quietly, especially with the past you both share. Aizawa agreed to let you decide to determine young Bakugu's fate because it would help him keep his reputation for being willing to expel anyone at any time intact. That boy has serious potential, but it's wasted on a personality like that. If he can learn to actually care for others instead of always seeing himself as the victim, he could turn out to be a great hero. It's up to him, now. Izuku wasn't sure how to feel about all of this. Was Kakin capable of learning such a thing after all this time? So you think I made the right choice in saying he should stay? There was no doubt in my mind that you would choose that. You're the opposite of everything he is, sometimes to a fault, All Might said simply. But that throat punch, Izuku blushed and shifted in his seat. Yeah, I really do feel bad about that. If I hadn't done that, maybe things wouldn't have been so bad for Kakin's injuries. I'm pretty sure it would have ended badly. Either way, All Might told him. But it's still, unseemly. Thanks, Gran. Probably, Izuku said. But maybe not as bad. Since they showed us the pictures of Kakin's injuries, and they were. They were terrible. I was scared that my being there might have made them worse. Since my quirk can sense when someone is hurt like that, All Might took his eyes off the road to look at Izuku for a moment, and it took him a while to reply. That is something we will definitely have to take into account. In the field, you will come across victims who are weak and close to dying. That's the nature of rescue work. And damn near unavoidable, All Might told him. Izuku had thought of this before, but his mind always tried to shy away from thinking about it too hard because of the implication because you can't be around someone too weak for any length of time. 
We will have to find a solution, a way to keep people safe from you, and vice versa, All Might mused. I'll have Murai call some support companies and see if some sort of shield or suppressor might help. Maybe call David to start him looking into it. Izuku knew that Murai was Sir Nidai's first name, and he suspected that David was referring to David Shield, the American that had worked with All Might in the United States when he'd had been fresh out of UA. He felt humbled and awed that such a famed scientist might be asked to help him. In the meantime, if you come across a case like that, where you're not sure someone is going to survive, it's best that you clear out and let others handle that person. You'll help them more by not helping them, if that makes sense. In the event of larger disasters, there are always a lot of people who need rescuing that you won't pose any danger to. Izuku nodded glumly. Wouldn't that make him half a hero? What if I'm the only one around? He asked. In that case, you have to let your heart decide. If the choice is them dying without help, or dying knowing someone is doing everything they can, which do you think they'd choose? All Might asked gently. You also have to decide how willing you are to bear their quirk for the rest of your life, which is no small consideration. Izuku thought back to the discussions and lessons he'd had with Sir about ethics and morals and hard choices. Somehow, in all of that, Izuku had never imagined making a choice between what kind of inevitable death one person would have. It was a heavy weight in the back of his mind. All Might steered into the pull-up curb in front of his building and put a hand on Izuku's shoulder. Remember that this is likely a temporary problem, he said in a comforting voice. We'll find a solution, and then nothing can stop you. Izuku hoped that was true. Kakin did not come to class the following day. Izuku stared at his empty seat all morning, and pretended not to hear the whispers of the others speculating about it. As Aizawa took the front desk, he made an announcement without preamble. Bakugu has been transferred to general studies for the time being. He's still on campus, so if you happen to run into him and he gives you any trouble, you will come and report it to me immediately. Is that clear? Yes, sensei. Everyone answered. Not daring to make a fuss over it in front of the teacher, Izuku barely heard it when Aizawa told them that they needed to choose a class representative. The classroom erupted into excitement over this, and hands shot up into the air with everyone demanding to be chosen. Izuku realized that a position as class rep would look good on transcripts when they graduated and entered the hero scene. Knowing that he already had support from All Might and Sir, this wasn't as much of a concern for him, but it would seem weird if he didn't seem interested at all. He raised his hand slightly, to make a good showing. Finally, Ida took charge by shouting over the din and saying they should put it to a vote, stressing the importance of choosing a good leader and not just someone who wants the job for show. Aizawa said he didn't care how they made the decision, as long as it was made before homeroom came to an end. Izuku helped Ida by passing papers out so they could write in their candidate, then collecting them once everyone was done. He handed the stack to Ida and sat down again, having voted for Ida, who obviously wanted the job, but had also proven he could get everyone's attention. He was serious about his school and how he was perceived, and would pay attention to details and rules. Izuku knew that most people would end up voting for themselves, so his vote for Ada just might be enough. It looks like our new class representative will be Midoriya Izuku and the deputy representative will be Ada Tenya, Aizawa said flatly. He gathered his sleeping bag and left the room as everyone broke into chatter about it. Present Mike entered as Aizawa left kicking off the English lesson with a loud good morning greeting in English. At lunchtime, Izuku stayed back for a moment to ask Sensei about Kakan. He had been worried about how the demotion would affect Kakanam and what his chances were of regaining his place in the hero course. That isn't something you should be worrying about, Aizawa told him without rancor. Bakugu has some growing up to do, and some serious reflection on what it means to be a hero. Whether or not he does that is up to him. I just can't afford to wait for him to do it where he could negatively influence or impact any of the other's learning or safety. But, what are the chances that he could do well enough in the sports festival to earn it? Izuku insisted. It's only happened once before. And that was a different set of circumstances, Aizawa said. It's not probable. But it can be done if he's willing to do what needs to be done. Now go eat your lunch. Battle training today will be chaotic. Izuku caught up with his friends just as they were reaching the cafeteria, but didn't have much of an appetite. You must eat something. Ida cajoled with an air chop when Izuku said he wasn't hungry. Hero training is next, and you'll need your energy. Izuku knew he was right, but nothing sounded appealing. He hadn't eaten much for breakfast, either. Some fruit, Ida asked, trying to persuade him, waving a banana. Do you feel sick? Iroraka asked in concern. No, I just have a lot on my mind, he denied. You should at least have some rice, she said firmly. Lunch Rush's rice is amazing. To appease them Izuku agreed to take the rice and a packet of fura cake for the top, and a bottle of orange juice that Ida set on his tray, probably thinking he was being sneaky. They were nice people, he shouldn't be letting someone who wasn't so nice dominate his thoughts. If you're worried about being class rep, Yuraka said cheerfully, you shouldn't, you're going to do great. Your fight with Bakugu was amazing. 
And you kept your cool and even made sure that the nurse took care of him, even though you were injured, too, and even though he cheated. That's true, Ada said. While I don't approve of punching people in the throat, I can't deny it was a very effective strategy. He did manage to eat his rice and drink his juice under Ada's careful eye, but their meal was interrupted by what sounded like a fire alarm. This is a level 3 security breach alarm a pleasant voice informed the crowd of dining students. Please make your way outside using the nearest emergency exits. Students all stood up and rushed the exits, with the first years totally confused about procedure and causing a slight problem with traffic flow. What's a level 3 security breach? Ida asked a passing upperclassman. Someone breached the security gate. They said, that's the alarm to evacuate. There were reporters everywhere this morning, Yuraka said as they shuffled forward into the crowd asking about what it was like to have All Might as a teacher. I'll bet one of them tried to sneak on campus. We're there, Ada asked in surprise. I didn't see any either, Izuku said. Yeah, but you two get here crazy early. She pointed out. They probably got here after you. It didn't take long for the crowd to bottleneck in the small space that led to the emergency exit, and the three of them were packed shoulder to shoulder with other students and unable to move. Wait, Ada said to his friends, I can see outside, and the gate is open, and staff are trying to get reporters out. We're panicking over nothing. Tell them that. Your Raka said, Midoriya, can't you levitate? You could rise up and shout to everyone, Ada suggested. I don't think I can be that loud, Izuku told him, already shouting to be heard. They quickly devised a plan for your Raka to use her quirk on Ada to make him float. Then he would use his engines to propel himself to the front of the crowd to yell down at them, since he was loud enough to project his voice. Everyone calmed down at once. Ada bellowed, causing the students to quiet down in surprise. There is no danger. It is merely the press trying to gain access to the school. The teachers and staff are handling it now. There is no reason to be alarmed. Everyone made noises of relief, and the space began to clear, both from the front and the back of the line as many turned to file back into the dining hall. Thanks, exit sign Ada. One of their classmates called with a laugh. Izuku had to admit that the pose that Ida was forced into, balanced above the door on the narrow ledge of the door jam resembled the pictogram on most emergency exit signs. Yuraka giggled as they waited for him to jump to the floor, once the space was empty enough, and went back to their trays. Their food had gone cold, but Yuraka still scooped up the last of her rice quickly until she resembled a rosy-cheeked chipmunk as they hurried to return their trays and head to class. Once they were changed into their gym uniforms as instructed, they met in the sports arena, where there were mounds of dirt, fox holes, large pillars and various other debris scattered around. All Might met them there and divided them into two teams. And then there was a rousing game of capture the flag that had all of them sweaty, dirty and excited within the first 15 minutes. While the game was fun, it was also challenging, and Izuku got to see lots of inventive ways for his new classmates to use their quirks. Izuku's team lost the overall game, but it had been a close contest and they good-naturedly complained that it was because their team only had nine players, and the other team had an invisible girl who didn't mind getting naked. By the time he was showered and ready to go home, Izuku was in a much better frame of mind. That good cheer lasted all of five minutes past the time he met All Might in the parking lot for his ride home. All Might was distracted and didn't look happy about something. What's wrong, All Might? Izuku asked with concern. Are you feeling sick? The security breach today has me worried. All Might said grimly. The reporter's getting in. Izuku asked, wondering if it was really that big of a deal. Annoying, yes, enough to worry All Might. Why? Well, that too, All Might said dismissively. But it's how they got in that's troubling. That's a good point, Izuku said. How did they get the gates open? Ada saw it through the window. It wasn't open, All Might said ominously. It was destroyed. Destroyed. How? Izuku asked with dismay. It seems like it was turned to a pile of rust. All Might said, looking at Izuku meaningfully. Like someone with a disintegration quirk touched it, Izuku asked, feeling as if a lead brick had dropped into the pit of his stomach. Exactly like that, All Might said. There are security cameras everywhere, though. Did any of them catch footage of who did it? The footage was destroyed. It seems that the gate being taken down might have been a distraction while someone hacked into our system. It will take a couple of days to scan all of the data and see if anything was taken, opened, corrupted or something else. So, you think it was Shigaraki Tamura, Izuku said. But he probably didn't come onto campus. That's the theory we're going with at the moment. All Might said. Of course the campus was searched scanning ID badges and passes, infrared and attendance records. There was no one on campus who shouldn't be. Damn, Izuku murmured. They really aren't going to stop trying to get to me, are they? All Might was silent, but his hands gripped the wheel, his knuckles turning white. Izuku felt the same way. The rest of the ride back to his apartment building was tense and quiet as they both considered the implications of today's event. Centipter and Bubble Girl both met him in the lobby and escorted him up to his apartment and checked the apartment extra well. 
Sentipter even ran scans of Izuku's computer and his dad's home computer to make sure there hadn't been external tampering. They found nothing and left him alone again. He had a feeling they were not far away, even though he couldn't see them. Izuku had an argument with his father that evening. It wasn't something that happened often, but this time, Izuku was adamant. He was not going to stay home from school until there were more answers. It's for your own good, Zu, his father said. That guy is crazy, and all he has to do is touch you, and what happened to that gate could happen to you. Don't you remember what he did to Granny Ito's house? To her cat. Where will I be safer than a school full of heroes and the most powerfully gifted kids in Japan? Izuku argued. I can't miss school. They move too fast for that. Were you safe when there was a security breach today? His father said, unconvinced. Yes, Izuku returned. I was. I wasn't in any danger at all. I was eating lunch when the alarm went off, and there wasn't a single report of anyone being threatened. The gate thing was a distraction so no one would notice they were hacking the computers, probably to get information about you. What can they possibly learn about me that they don't already know? Izuku asked. I can't think of a single thing, can you? Except maybe any new quirks I might have gotten since All Might fought all for one. That gave his father pause. Izuku knew he'd won when his father stopped arguing and sighed, rubbing his chest as if to calm the fire that wanted to stoke to life there. Promise me you'll follow all of your teacher's instructions. I will, Izuku promised, and that you won't go anywhere alone. Always have an adult with you or nearby. I always do. They even have adults around when we eat lunch, Izuku told him, not mentioning that the teachers there were buying lunch themselves. It didn't mean they wouldn't help if there was trouble. His father reluctantly nodded. As long as All Might is still driving you home each day, I suppose it's all right. He didn't know if his father was aware that All Might was down to just three hours a day in his hero form, and that he used it almost completely just teaching class most days. But he wasn't going to bring it up. They'd just started the school year, and Izuku was determined not to fall behind. Aizawa had impressed on them that every second of their schooling was precious. Deal, Izuku said instantly. By the way, when were you going to tell me that you got voted to be your class rep? That's fantastic. His father said, offering an olive branch. Huh, oh, with everything else today, I kind of forgot. Izuku said, I'm not even sure how I got the votes. I'm not surprised about Ida, because he's so strict about rules and everything, but they barely know me. Another reason, in his mind, that he couldn't afford to miss school. I'm going to need to get everyone's cell phone numbers so I can let them know about important stuff. I'm sure they voted for you because you're such a nice kid. His father said confidently. It was as good a reason as any, he supposed. Izuku wasn't sure how he'd earned anyone's confidence, and he hoped he didn't let them down. Still, choosing the class rep had taken the focus away from Kaken's absence in the classroom for the time being. He wasn't so lucky the following day. Hero training would be taking place at a training facility in a far corner of the campus, and it was far enough that they would need to take a shuttle bus to get there in good time. After Ida and Izuku checked to be sure everyone was on board, the bus began its journey across campus. Aizawa had said that All Might and another staff member would be supervising them, but they hadn't shown up before the bus pulled away from the curb, so Izuku assumed they would meet at their destination. So, Midoriya, Hiroshima said loudly across the aisle, What's up with Bakugu being transferred out? You and him got called to stay after the other day. Then the next day he was gone. I, uh, Izuku wasn't sure what he should or shouldn't say or if it was a secret. Come on man, Kaminari said to Kirishima. Equally loudly, everyone could see he had the personality of steaming crap. It's not like it's a surprise he didn't cut it. Plus, he kinda cheated, attacking Midoriya after All Might said he was captured, Asui added. And he'd already been warned once that if he used his quirk on another student outside of battle training, he'd be expelled. He probably got to stay in general studies, since when he did that, it was still technically battle training. Even though he was out, Siro pointed out. Izuku was relieved that they were coming to their own conclusions, so he didn't have to decide what to tell them. Good point, Sato said, but I don't know if I'd stick around the same school. After getting booted from the top program, it's still one of the top schools in Japan, not just for heroics, Yeirazu pointed out. He couldn't have hoped for better, really. The rest of the class nodded. I've been wondering, Midoriya, Asui said, you have a lot of quirks, but which one is your favorite? Though, I guess I never really thought about it all that much. Some of them are just there, you know. He said, I guess maybe my balance and agility. It would take a lot of force to make me fall, so that's really helpful. Not your strength enhancement, Hiroshima asked in surprise. I mean, that would be my favorite. Even though yours seems to mess you up sometimes, mine is just hardening. It's good in a fight, but it's not really that exciting, you know. Really, I think it's amazing. Your quirk is more than strong enough to go pro with. Izuku said enthusiastically. Speaking of strong, Ida said, Todoroki seems to have quite an amazingly strong quirk, as well. Everyone turned their heads to look at the classmate in question. But he was sitting alone at the back of the bus, staring out the window. 
That's definitely true, Yeyarazu said with a nod. I speak from experience. Most of them laughed at that, since they'd all watched her on the monitors as Todoroki had literally encased her in ice two days before. Ayama joined in by saying something about strength not being the only important aspect of hero work, and that popular appeal also played a large role. They didn't get much further than that, because the bus pulled up in front of an enormous domed building, easily as large as a professional sports stadium. They filed off and followed Aizawa up the steps and into the building as the bus drove away. All of them stood on a large platform with a view of several different sections, with an atrium in the middle. Honestly it looked like an amusement park similar to Universal Studios Japan. Each section looked as though it could be used to film action scenes in a blockbuster movie. There's the flood zone, the landslide zone, the conflagration zone, etc. Every kind of disaster or accident you can imagine. I built it myself, and I call it the unforeseen simulation joint. So it was the USJ, just like Universal Studios Japan. That couldn't be a coincidence. Izuku could feel his heart rate picking up with excitement. Which zone would they be working in today? Maybe he could get the support class to add a body cam to his suit, so he could use the footage to take notes about everything after doing stuff like this. It's the space hero, 13, Izuku said excitedly. The person who had spoken was dressed in a costume very similar to an astronaut and was known for their record of spectacular rescues as a pro hero. Yuraka seemed just as excited as Izuku. I love 13, she enthused. They're well known for their excellence in rescue operations. I thought All Might was supposed to meet us here, Aizawa told 13. Sorry, senpai, they answered. It seems he ran into trouble during his morning commute and ran out of time. Izuku watched as they held up three fingers as they stressed the word time. All Might had overdone it already today, and wouldn't be able to keep his hero form for a while. He likely would miss this lesson, which was disappointing, but Izuku knew that his hero work was more important. Aizawa sighed in. Frustration. Anger. It was hard to tell. So irrational, he muttered quietly. So be it. Let's get started. Before we get started, there are one or two things I want you to be aware of, 13 told the students. Or three or four. Maybe five. Everyone signed, bracing for a long lecture before they could get to work. As you may know, my quirk is called Black Hole. Izuku and Yuraka both nodded vigorously making their classmates chuckle. You've used it in some amazing rescues. Yuraka said. You've saved people in all kinds of disasters. Izuku inserted. That's true, 13 acknowledged. However, my quirk could also easily be used to kill. Everyone sobered immediately and fixed their attention on 13. My quirk is called black hole. And like a real black hole, anything that gets sucked in will be torn to shreds and disappear forever. We live in a super-powered society with many restrictions and regulations. Quirks like mine are heavily monitored. Our society may seem safe and stable. But if someone like me was to lose control or become a villain, then people would certainly die. Izuku was all too aware of that. From his own encounters with villains and from his lessons with Sir and All and Might, training and guidance were essential, even if you didn't want to become a hero. During your quirk test with Aizawa on your first day, you learn how much better you can perform when you use your quirk as a tool to aid you. During your battle training with All Might, you learn how dangerous your quirks can be to others. Today's training will teach another aspect, as well, how to use your quirks to save lives. Everyone visibly straightened with attention and eagerness. Izuku was practically vibrating with excitement. Your quirk is a tool, and not meant to inflict harm on others. My goal is that you leave here today with the understanding that heroism is about helping people. Thank you for listening. 13 finished with a theatrical bow. Everyone applauded. Izuku, though excited, felt a pang at the thought that this was exactly the kind of lesson that Kakin could have used to help him understand what he needed to learn. Great, Aizawa said. First off, his words trailed off as something out of the corner of his eye caught his attention. Izuku turned his head to see what had distracted him, and his eyes widened as his blood ran cold. A vague memory, maybe from a dream, resurfaced in his mind and told him exactly what the black swirling mass in the atrium was. A warp gate. Kirishima used a hand to shade his eyes as he squinted at the figures pouring out of the warp gate. Are those robots? He asked, sounding confused. Like at the entrance exam. Get back, Aizawa said sharply, grasping his capture weapon with both hands. Those are villains. Everyone huddle up and don't move. 13. Protect them. Aizawa moved to the top of the stairs, staring down at the dozens of villains that had poured into the atrium below. While his teacher was scanning the crowd, Izuku was fixated on the man with white hair and froze. He knew that face. A photo of it was hanging behind Sir's desk, and he'd studied it several times. He was older now, of course, but the scarred, cracked skin was unmistakable, Shigaraki Tamura. He snapped out of it as 13 started issuing instructions. He pulled his cell phone from one of the pouches. He had an emergency button that automatically dialed Might Tower, but the call wouldn't go through. 
call could not be completed, trying again in 30 seconds. They're jamming signals in and out, Kaminari said to 13, who had asked him to try to reach the school with the receiver in his headgear. 13 and eraser head is it? A pair of glowing eyes had emerged from the swirling blackness as it took on a mildly humanoid form. Kurajiri, according to the teacher's curriculum file that we went to so much trouble to procure yesterday, all I might was supposed to be here, and yet I don't see him. So it was you scumbags that caused all that trouble, Aizawa growled. Shigaraki was covered in what looked like, severed hands. Izuku shivered, were they fake, and just for show. It was creepy as hell. He even had one stuck to the front of his face, and another on the back of his head, as if they were squeezing his brain. Sensei, don't let the one with the white hair touch you. He's got a disintegration quirk. Don't ruin the fun, you little brat, Shigaraki said. You're at the top of my list after all might, M. Idari Izuku. Izuku could feel the eyes of his classmates shifting to look at him. He knows her name, Siro said, sounding fearful. What kind of villains are stupid enough to attack a school for heroes? Hiroshima asked. This place is pretty far from the school, and they picked a time when there would only be a few people around. They're not as stupid as you think they picked a perfect set of circumstances to launch a sneak attack, Yeirazu said. Izuku could hear 13 responding, but didn't listen to what they were actually saying. Instead, he was trying to keep his eyes on both Shigaraki and Kirajiri. They were clearly the ones responsible for this attack. Where is All Might? Shigaraki demanded. I went to all of the trouble to invite all these playmates, and he isn't even here. That's no fun. He's not coming, Aizawa said. You'll have to play with me, instead. Not coming. No fair. I'll bet a few dead kids would get his attention and bring him running. There's too many of them to fight by yourself. Izuku told Aizawa, your erasure requires eye contact, and there's no way you can erase all of them. No hero is a one-trick pony, his teacher told him. 13. Take care of them. Evacuate and get far enough away to contact the school. Midoriya, you especially need to get out of here. Aizawa leapt for the atrium, clearing the stairs downward without touching them. It was almost a shock to see their normally sleep-deprived sensei move so swiftly. He met the villains head-on, wrapping them in his weapon and dispatching them left and right, working his way to Shigaraki. All of you kids, get outside. 13 commanded, gesturing toward the door. Wow, Izuku said, marveling at Aizawa's skills. I can't believe he's taken so many down when he's that outnumbered. Not just his quirk, but his combat skills are. Midoriya, less analyzing and the evacuating. It's your job as class rep to make sure everyone understands their job. Ada's tone was harried and held a hint of frustration. That won't be happening. Kirajiri's voice said out of thin air. A moment later he materialized as a black cloud between the students and the door. Hello, we are the Villain Alliance, Kirajiri told them, sounding almost cordial. You'll have to excuse the disruption to your studies, but we have a mission to complete, to end the life of the symbol of peace. He means All Might, Kaminari said, stating the obvious. He can't kill All Might, mind all but wailed. He'll come and wipe them out. Wham, right. They must think they've found a way to kill him, or why else would they come here? Asui reasoned. Izuku knew that Asui was right, and if All Might had truly used up all of his heroic power for the day, where did that leave them? Even if he showed up, he was weak and wouldn't be able to defend himself or the class. This was extraordinarily bad. It seems the schedule we received has been revised, Kirajiri observed. But my role here hasn't changed. Not if we end you, first, Kirishima shouted. He hardened his skin and charged toward the black hovering mass, Sato and Kaminari right behind him. Kaminari let loose with a surge of electricity, while Kirishima and Sato both took a swing at each of the glowing eyes. No, get back, all of you. Thirteen shouted, the cap on the end of one of their gloves popping open on a hinge. Izuku's blood rushed even faster, knowing that if Thirteen activated their quirk while the three boys were in the way, they'd be ripped to shreds. That was actually a good try, Kirajiri intoned. And even though you're just students, you are the best of the best. Be gone. Writhe in agony and torment until you breathe your last. Izuku barely had time to dodge as a tendril of blackness appeared in front of him while a whirlwind of blackness began to churn around them. He barely managed to push Ada and Yuraka out of the way of the spinning warp gate in the process. Izuku saw that Shouji had dropped to his knees, covering at least two others with his webbed limbs, and Ada had quickly grabbed Thirteen by the back of their costume and rocketed out of the way. As soon as he realized what was happening, everyone else vanished. Izuku told himself not to hyperventilate when he saw most of his class disappear. He reminded himself that Kirajiri only transported people to other places, so unless he moved them directly over an active volcano or something, they had a chance of being okay. For now, he had to worry about what was happening in front of him. The warp gate had vanished. And along with it, Kirajiri, at least for now. Thirteen and Ida were standing, braced for whatever might happen next. Shouji stood to reveal that he'd been shielding Siro and Mina, and Yuraka was dazed, but fine. If they think they've got a way to beat All Might, 
Then there's only one thing we can do, Izuku said to the remaining group. Yes, 13 agreed. Find a way to escape and get more help. Izuku knew they were right, but he also knew that it wouldn't be as simple as that. They were now as outnumbered as Aizawa sensei, who was still battling his way to Shigaraki down in the atrium. He might hold his own against the other villains, but Shigaraki was a whole other level of evil. He needed backup, and soon, these doors are shut tight, and I don't think my acid can melt through them that fast, Amina said, inspecting the sealed entry. I'll bet me and Shouji could pry them open, Izuku said. If we can get them open for long enough for Ada to get through, he's fastest and could run back to the school for help. Thirteen approved the plan, but lamented that the doors would automatically close once he and Shouji let go. You'll have to maneuver yourselves out after everyone else goes through. Izuku and Shouji nodded in understanding before getting a grip on the seam between the doors. They were on the count of two out of three before pulling when Kirajiri appeared again. Siro, Izuku shouted. He has some kind of collar, so he must have a body somewhere in there. Let me handle this. Thirteen shouted, pushing a ready Siro behind them. You get Ida and the others out. Thirteen activated black hole while Izuku charged up one for all. Sparks of green and red traced over his skin and he and Shouji pulled the doors open just enough to let Ida slip through. Run as fast as you can, Ida. Yuraka shouted, slipping through the gap behind him. Mina followed, as did Siro. Izuku slid sideways to brace his back against the opposite door and his feet against the other, holding it open for Shouji to duck through. I'm going to yank you out, Shouji told him as he got to his feet. Just then, Thirteen screamed, and Izuku saw a portal opening behind them, as well as in front. Their own quirk was being used against them by swallowing their hand with the front portal and making it reappear behind. Using his agility, Izuku spun out of the door gap and back into the USJ, letting the door slam closed, leaving the others on the outside. Thinking quickly, Izuku sped to the portal behind Thirteen and closed the cap on the glove, effectively shutting off their quirk, but the damage was done. Thirteen fell to their knees and then face down on the ground, a gaping hole in the back of their suit and their back. Izuku only just had time to check for a pulse, which was barely there, before Kirajiri enveloped him in a warp gate and moved him away. It was almost instantaneous. Izuku fell from a few feet in the air to the ground, springing to his feet to see he was in the atrium, beside a fountain. He could see the steps leading up to where he had just been standing, and Aizawa making headway through the crowd of villains advancing on him. Izuku prayed he was far enough away from Thirteen so his quirk didn't weaken them any further than their injury already had, and that his own quirk hadn't made them dot 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 he forced his mind away from that thought and made himself focus. He scanned his surroundings to find his best course of action. He really wanted to get back to the entrance to try to help 13. That wound had been troubling, possibly fatal, since he couldn't risk close proximity to her. He needed to get Aizawa to help her. That had to be his first priority, even though Aizawa was also fighting for his life. At least he was still on his feet and not bearing any serious-looking injuries. You what? Shigaraki snarled from closer than Izuku had realized. If you weren't our transport out of here, I'd turn you to dust right now. He saw that Kurajiri had materialized next to Shigaraki and was talking to him. Well, that's game over, then. If the kids reach help, not only will All Might come, but so will the rest of the UA staff, Shigaraki was saying, scratching horribly at his neck. Izuku couldn't believe his luck. Were they just going to leave? We'd better make sure that at least a few of the students die. And their teacher, Shigaraki decided. Namu, after you take care of Eraserhead, grab Midoriya. He's coming with us. Don't kill him, yet. In the blink of an eye a hulking black villain that Izuku had assumed was there to protect Shigaraki was suddenly in front of Aizawa. With a single fist on the top of his head, Namu sent the hero crashing to the ground, where he lay utterly still. It was impossible for Izuku to tell if he was still alive as he cried out, Sensei. He had just launched himself at the villain when it turned toward him, and it moved so fast that Izuku felt its arms scrape against his own as they passed each other. The villain was grotesque-looking, with an exposed pink brain with eyes sunken into the sides of it, and a beak like a bird, if birds had sharp teeth. It had human-looking hands and feet, but the skin was black, and looked torn open in areas as if stretch marks had burst from being stretched too far. Izuku planted himself in front of Aizawa, facing this Namu, and held his ground. Don't you like my Namu? Shigaraki asked Izuku, spreading his arms wide. Sensei had him made just for me, but that wouldn't have been possible without your help. Izuku wasn't sure what he was talking about, and didn't have time to examine the dread pulling in the pit of his stomach as he was forced to jump away from the Namu, to avoid being grabbed. That was fine, if it was chasing him, it wouldn't have time to finish off Aizawa, who had a very faint rise and fall to his back. He also needed to get away from Aizawa himself, in case his injuries were potentially fatal. Izuku needed to stall for time. Surely Ada would reach the school quickly, since it had only been about a five-minute bus trip. He only needed to evade until help arrived. How long had it been since he'd helped the others get out of here? 
one for all thrummed in his bones as he launched himself away. He jumped high in the air with his levitation paired with his strength. It wasn't really flying, but it was close enough for now. The trouble would be keeping momentum and speed. He wondered if the conflagration zone would be the best place to lead the monster. His own costume featured fire resistance and his mask had a filter for smoke. Maybe the fire would be too much for it, and it could be slowed down. He reached the far wall by the entrance and ricocheted off of it like a pinball in a pachinko machine, shooting himself toward the dome at the far side of the USJ that was painted with flames. The Nama was in pursuit, but Izuku seemed to be able to stay ahead of it so far. Would the roof of the conflagration zone be too hot to land on? He was about to find out. As he got within three meters of the side of the dome in his descent, he tucked his knees to flip over so he could hit the building feet first. The force of his landing didn't break the panel as he'd hoped, and Izuku slid down the side of the building until he was on the ground. Luckily the answer to his earlier internal question was, no. The surface of the dome wasn't hot at all, and was probably super insulated. The impact of the Namu, however, did break the panel and it plunged through the hole it had created. A few moments later, it crashed back out from the inside, smoking and covered in blisters that disappeared right before Izuku's eyes. Healing or regenerating quirk, Izuku groaned. That complicated things. He'd thought it was super strength or speed, but there was no mistaking the instant healing he was seeing. Unless he had multiple quirks. Then it sunk in. Sensei had him made just for me. But that wouldn't have been possible without your help. Crap. Crap group crap. The Namu lunged for him again. Izuku levitated with a leap using one for all, and launched himself by shoving off at an angle against the ceiling. He bounced around the USJ that way for some time, with quite a few narrow misses. Apparently tired of the game, Shigaraki called the Namu back to him. Izuku froze, unable to hear what the villain was saying to the Namu, but it wasn't hard to figure out. The behemoth sped over to Aizawa and lifted both arms over its head, preparing to slam them down onto Izuku's teacher. No, Izuku didn't even realize he was moving until he was already halfway across the USJ and to his teacher. At the last moment, the Namu turned and snatched Izuku right out of the air by his arm and held him firm, even as Izuku did everything he could get free, including kicking the monster's elbow in an attempt to break the arm long enough to loosen his grip. It was no use. The Namu delivered a brutal kick to Aizawa's side that sent him tumbling across the atrium, all the way to the base of the steps, just meters below where 13 was knocked out. Aizawa had left a pool of blood where he had been before the kick, right around where his head had rested in a dent in the ground. Izuku wondered what had happened to him while he had been leading the Namu in the world's most terrifying game of tag. Well, at least we got the kid, Shigaraki said with a sigh. We'll have to be satis. Just then the door to the USJ exploded inward and All Might in his hero form stood silhouetted for a moment in the entrance as he took in what was happening. Fear not, I am here. All Might spotted Izuku dangling from the Namu's arm and gritted his teeth, looking as wild and angry as Izuku had ever seen him. It wasn't a smile, it was a rictus of seething rage, preying on children. Izuku watched along with Shigaraki, and the classmates who had shuffled back in behind All Might, as the number one hero ripped the tie from his neck and tossed the shreds away. He looked down at 13, who was quickly surrounded by Shaoji, Mina and Yuraka, hoping to help in some way. With a single bound, All Might had swept away anyone remaining around Aizawa and gently picked him up. The sensei hung limply in his giant hands, blood dripping from his head and arms. All Might turned and spoke to Shaoji, who hurried down the steps and gathered Aizawa in his many arms and began to carry him back up. All Might continued to walk toward Shigaraki with intent written in every line of his body. Shigaraki didn't look concerned, though. Stop right there, All Might, Shigaraki called out. Unless you want to see this boy's arm ripped off. All Might halted in his tracks, huge hands fisted. I'm sorry, All Might, Izuku said, even as he continued to struggle. I wasn't fast enough. Almost the moment the words were out of his mouth, a huge surge of ice encased the Namu, leaving just its hand free, with Izuku dangling from it. Todoroki stepped from the shadows and also attempted to freeze Shigaraki. But the villain was too fast. In an instant, Izuku used one for all to punch the ice as hard as he could with his free hand, right where the Namu's arm jutted out, and the hand actually broke away from the arm and let Izuku drop to the floor. Gah, he said as he pried the horrifying severed hand from his wrist. You, almost instantly, a new hand replaced the old on the Namu's arm, but Izuku had backed away by then to stand beside Todoroki. Thanks, he said as they both stood at the ready. You boys get out of here, All Might ordered, even as the Namu broke free of the ice. Too fast for any of them to register the movement, All Might had moved to the edge of the shipwreck zone to scoop up Asui and Minta, who had apparently been hiding there. He placed them down near the stairs and ordered them to retreat and help with Thirteen and Aizawa. Izuku didn't move from his spot, and neither did Todoroki. There was no way either of them was going to turn their backs on the villains. The only reason Izuku even turned his head was because he sensed someone approaching from behind. 
He was about to deliver a blow to their would-be assailant when Yuraraka whispered to him. Are either of you hurt? He put his fist down and noticed that she and Siro had sneaked over to check on them. I'm fine, Todoroki said in his usual bland tone. I'm okay, Izuku said as well, turning his gaze back to the villains. The now free Nama was still standing beside Shigaraki, and Kirajiri was behind them both, awaiting instruction. I'm pretty sure your arm is broken, dude, Siro told Izuku. Izuku looked to where his arm was bent at a slightly unnatural angle with some surprise. Tape it for me, quick, Izuku said, snapping his gaze back to the standoff between All Might and the rest. Kirishima just showed up at the bottom of the stairs. And I see Ayurazu and Jiro, too, Yuraka told them with relief. She took hold of Izuku's injured arm and held it steady while Siro used some tape from his elbow to wrap it snugly over his sleeve. Shirajiri, bring me the kid. Namu, kill All Might, Shigaraki ordered. Izuku had to tear his eyes from the Namu as he charged All Might, because Kirajiri had appeared in front of them, seeing the collar on the villain again. Izuku knew they had a chance and spoke quickly as he dodged. If he can wear a collar, he probably has a body. He told the others, that means we can bring him down. Todoroki tried ice, but it vanished into the blackness of a portal without impact. Izuku levitated upward to take the attention away from his classmates, which gave Yuraka time to sneak up behind him and use her quirk on the collar and the blackness above it. Siro then stepped forward to shoot his tape, adhering it to the metal collar around where they presumed Kirijiri's neck to be. It was hard to tell with all the flailing, but Kirijiri now looked something like an amorphous black balloon being whipped around in the suddenly strong wind being generated by the Namu and All Might trading blows at an unbelievable pace. You should get out of here, Todoroki told Izuku. They're kind of trying to kidnap you. Izuku knew he was right, but he also knew that All Might only had so much power left before he was out of time. If this didn't end quickly, All Might already had steam rising from his body, though it was disguised by the flying dust and debris. He also knew that he couldn't go near the exit, because Aizawa and Thirteen were critically injured there, without giving himself time to think about it. Izuku jumped high into the air with the help of levitation and kicked off of the dome overhead to speed downward like a missile, pulling back his uninjured fist and slamming it forward straight onto the Namu's exposed brain. At the same moment that the Namu was stunned from Izuku's blow, All Might shouted, plus Ultra. The finishing blow All Might had meant to deliver hit the Namu square in the chest. The force of the blow sent the Namu flying into the air, and the wind it caused sent Izuku flying, as well. Izuku flailed, twisting to try to get his bearings, thinking he'd springboard off of the dome again to land safely on the ground. That would have been what happened, except for the fact that All Might had hit the Namu so hard, that the panel of dome that was the USJ shattered, and Izuku was left with nothing to springboard off of. He flew out the window along with the Namu, who was nothing more at this point than a giant, grotesque ragdoll. A sudden jolt stopped Izuku abruptly, and he began to fall toward the ground, though he would likely hit the dome, first. He looked at his leg, which hurt with a sharp pain and saw that Siro's tape was stuck to his pant leg and shoe. Uh oh! Izuku exclaimed as he arced closer to the dome. Now was not the time to marvel at Siro's skill. He engaged his levitation, which saved him from a nasty impact, and released it a moment later so he only dropped a couple of meters before hitting. From there, he used a utility knife from one of his pouches to cut the tape free, and slid down the outside of the dome and hit the ground with a thud. His leg and arm both hurt like hell, but he was still alive. He could see police cars and ambulances arriving around the front of the building, jogged around to them, limping a bit. Izuku. He skidded to a stop at the sound of his voice and scanned the sudden flood of people spilling out of emergency vehicles everywhere. There was Sir, hurrying toward him, with an expression of enormous relief. Sir, Izuku said in relief. You're injured, he said at once, signaling a paramedic over. That's not important right now. Aizawa and Thirteen. They are, being tended to as we speak, already on their way to the hospital he insisted. Your turn. But All Might is still in there and he was already out of time before he even got here. Izuku kept his voice low, knowing it would be bad if anyone caught on. Go with the medics, Izuku. I'll go check on Tashinori, Sir said firmly. There's nothing you can do about it, either way. The paramedic guided Izuku toward the back of an ambulance. You can't take me to the hospital, he said to the paramedic firmly. Your arm is obviously broken, the medic said. Your leg should be x-rayed, too. Recovery girl will see to the boy's wounds, Principal Nezu said calmly as he approached, riding on the shoulders of the hero Snipe. In fact, there is a ride waiting for him right now. Izuku thanked the medic and followed Nezu and Snipe to a large van with dark windows and gestured for him to get in. Cementos was behind the wheel and gestured for him to hurry, Izuku could see why. Sir and All Might were sitting in the back, with Sir bracing his boss up with a hand on each shoulder. Is it safe for me to be in here with him? Izuku demanded, already reaching for the door handle. It will be fine, Sir said curtly. Please hurry, Cementos. Without further ado, Cementos hit the gas with a heavy foot and sped off toward the school. 
Aizawa and 13 are being taken to the nearest hospital, Cementos told Izuku before he could ask. We might have more information once you've seen Recovery Girl. Izuku didn't reply, because he was carefully watching All Might for any sign at all that he might be in distress or weakening further. As soon as the van pulled to the front of the school, he could see that the nurse was already waiting with a pair of robots carrying a stretcher. Sir carefully guided an unsteady All Might onto it. I'm going to go change clothes, Izuku said, so that she can get him stable and settled before I go in. Sir paused, looking torn. Finally he nodded and turned to follow the nurse toward her office. I'll come help you out, Cementos offered Izuku, walking with him to the changing rooms. At least to get that boot off, I noticed you're limping. Izuku explained how he had been saved from a nasty fall, or being levitated too high by Siro's quick thinking, but that it had jerked his leg pretty hard in the process. Cementos empathized, and helped Izuku get his boot off, helped unwrap Siro's tape and made sure he was okay on his own for a few minutes before leaving him to change his clothes. Izuku took his time showering and putting on his school uniform to give Recovery Girl time to treat All Might. First, he tried not to think of the rest. When he emerged from the changing room, Sir was standing in the hallway. All Might is stable and sleeping, he told Izuku. Your turn. Izuku nodded, feeling a wave of relief wash over him as he limped along beside his mentor. Has there been any word about Sensei or Thirteen? Izuku asked as they walked. The end of the school day had come and gone while Class 1A had been facing peril, so there were no students milling around, wondering what was going on. It's too soon for that, Sir said quietly. Recovery girl can't even go work her magic until they're both strong enough for it. It's time to worry about yourself. I should have made you go straight away, but you seem to need some time to gather yourself. I didn't know if All Might was so badly hurt that I could do him more damage by being near him. Sir sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose, making his glasses slide down a bit. I told you before that you don't need to worry about that. But what about the others? Were any of them hurt? Kurajiri sucked them up in a warp gate. Izuku insisted. Is everyone accounted for? Did they catch Shigaraki and Kurajiri? Shigaraki was taken away by Kurajiri. Though Snipe swears he hit him several times with his shots. The other students are all accounted for and largely unharmed. The rest of the villains have been rounded up and taken into custody. That thing, the Namu, Izuku said, gulping an air past the tightness in his throat. Shigaraki said that it was made for him, and that I helped. Now that he had time to slow down and consider the implications of that, he was beginning to feel nauseous. Sir looked at him sharply, and paused mid-step for a moment as he realized what Izuku was telling him. None of what happened today was your fault, he said firmly, though he sounded angry. If what he said is true, it's not because of anything you did. He could very well have been lying, to try to scare you into making a mistake. But, if they can make monsters out of blood or whatever else they took from me, what else can they do? They said they were going to kill All Might. Izuku, Sir said, stopping to face him and make sure that he was listening. They wanted to kill All Might, true. They wouldn't be the first to try. And they failed, just like all of the others. Izuku took a calming breath and began to walk again as Sir led the way. I just worry, because he's so vulnerable, now. Izuku said quietly. I know he's not weak. He could never be weak, even if he didn't have anything of one for all left. But they don't know that. One of these times, he might not have enough to beat them. That's true. That's why we're pinning our hopes and trust in you to do your best, so that when it's time, you can protect All Might from threats like this, instead of the other way around. Right? Sir didn't say it with any special intensity. But as a matter of fact he was stating, and simply reminding Izuku of what his goals were. In the meantime, All Might, myself, and other heroes will hold the line while you learn what you need to know to take your place among the pro heroes. That's our job, and you don't need to take over for us old folks quite so soon. The door to the nurse's office opened as Izuku and Sir were approaching, and a detective that Izuku remembered from before stepped out into the hall. I was just coming to look for you, Tsukachi said with a calm, friendly expression. Recovery girl was afraid young Midoriya here had been more injured than we realized and was passed out somewhere. I'm fine. Izuku said, eager to assuage their worry. I mean, I think my arm is broken, and my leg's a bit weird, but I'm not like, hurt. Both men looked at him as if he'd grown an extra head. He believes he's telling the truth, Tsukachi told Sir, sounding baffled. What would you consider hurt? Sir asked Izuku with a raised eyebrow. I don't know, Izuku said, feeling flustered. I know I'm hurt, but compared to All Might or Sensei or Thirteen, or... We are going to need to have a discussion about self-care and recognizing when to ask for help, Sir said, sounding a little tired. For now, go have Recovery Girl examine you. I'll need to take your statement. Soon, Tsukachi told Izuku apologetically. But it can wait until you're ready. Izuku was tired, exhausted, really, but didn't feel like he had room to complain about it when everyone else had also been through the ringer today. Recovery Girl recognized the signs, and immediately put him in a bed beside the one All Might was currently ensconced in. The hero's long frame didn't quite fit even the largest bed in the infirmary. 
and his feet hung over the end, making Izuku feel tiny in comparison. I'm reluctant to use my quirk on you until you've rested more, so I'm going to splint your arm and give you some fluids before I try to heal you. Then you'll probably sleep for quite a few hours. Are you sure it's okay for me to be near All Might? Izuku asked, still worried. Izuku, think, Sir told him calmly. I know that it doesn't seem like it, but All Might is essentially quirkless. Now, your quirk stopped affecting him once you received one for all. Izuku had forgotten. It was so easy, when All Might still seemed so heroic. Do you really think I'd let you two be in the same room if there was any danger? Recovery girl asked, sounding brisk and slightly offended. Relax and let me do my job. She went to work while Sir stepped into the hallway. And when he returned, Izuku was surprised to see his dad walk in behind him. Dad, Izuku said in disbelief. What are you doing here? Sir sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose again. He looked like a man whose patience was at its limit. Zu, you just fought villains who attacked your school, and you're injured. Where else would I be? Izuku guessed he had a point. He only really realized how upset his father was when he noticed tendrils of smoke escaping his nostrils. Sorry, Izuku said, blushing slightly. I didn't mean for you to worry. I'm okay. Recovery girl says she can fix me once I get a little rest. They told me Shigaraki Tamura and Kirajiri were there, along with dozens of others. His father said, sounding both angry and frustrated. They said they got a copy of the teacher's schedules. Izuku told him, trying to sound placating. He knew he should probably be more upset, but the worry for everyone else had put his worry for himself on hold. They were after all might. I don't think they knew I was even going to be there. His dad turned to look back at Sir for confirmation. That does seem to be the case. Though the investigation will take time to be as thorough as possible, Sir said with a nod. They brought some sort of manufactured monster with them that they believed had the strength to defeat All Might. After the fight, they found the beast over a kilometer away, showing no sign of life after its exposed brain was severely damaged. Izuku and his dad both shuddered at the same time for different reasons. That, uh, Izuku said meekly. That was me. I punched it on the top of the head while All Might was fighting it. Sir didn't look particularly surprised by this, but he did look guarded. His dad looked stunned. It hit Izuku then. The full implication of everything that had happened that day sank in, and his fear caught up with him. He had faced off against real villains, and in doing so had made a conscious decision to do what he felt was necessary to end things, no matter how brutal. I knew All Might was running out of time, and they seemed so sure that the Namu could kill him, and All Might was starting to do that thing with the steam before he changes, and I just knew I had to do something to end it quickly, because I couldn't go near Sensei and 13, Izuku said in a rush, hardly drawing breath as he explained. Did I, am I the one that killed it? More smoke wafted up from his dad's nose and mouth, and recovery girl quickly opened a window and turned on a fan. I don't know, Zu, his father said, reaching out to rest a hand on Izuku's head, but if you did, it's okay. Izuku's eyes slid past his father, whose own eyes were brimming with tears, much like Izuku's. It is, Izuku asked in a shaky whisper. It is, Sir said from behind his dad's shoulder. Midoriya kun, Detective Tsukachi said gently from beside Sir. I've been getting reports and taken statements from the scene. That thing was attacking with intent to kill, and so were the other villains there. Anything you did in there was self-defense, and nothing more. Be but heroes don't kill. Izuku wasn't sure why he suddenly felt so gutted by this, when he was fine up until this point. He had known at the time that punching anyone or anything in the brain at full force was likely to kill, and he'd done it with almost no hesitation. To save All Might, to save his friends and get his teacher's help. But death. He sat upright in bed so quickly he almost knocked heads with his father and shouted, Holy shit. Everyone startled and recovery girl put a hand over her heart as if having a heart attack. If that Namu died, did I? The idea that he might have inherited anything from that monstrosity was enough to make him feel ill. His father literally belched out smoke as he realized what Izuku meant. I doubt it, Sir said after only the briefest of pauses. Reports say it had regeneration, and you're still injured. Oh, thank goodness, Izuku said, not realizing he'd turn transparent until he let the breath he was holding out. Why do you think that is? His father asked, inhaling some of the smoke that had billowed out when Izuku had shouted. It could be any number of reasons, Sir said. The most logical would be that the Namu was too far away when his life completely ebbed away. It had enhanced regeneration and or healing, so it probably didn't die immediately. They found it over a kilometer away. And while Izuku's quirk range isn't very clearly known, it's definitely not that far. Okay, Izuku said with a sigh, allowing his father to press him gently backward until his head was resting on the pillow again. Okay, that makes sense. He was still torn about having killed, someone, something, but at least he hadn't gained anything from it. As amazing as regeneration and shock absorption and whatever else could be, he would have felt, tainted, somehow. 
He's going to need to see a counselor about this, Recovery Girl announced. Everyone, including Izuku, nodded. He would definitely need some time to work through all of the aspects of the day and what they meant. It had been a while since he'd been to counseling, but it was probably time to go again. Besides, Sir had told him once that almost all heroes saw counselors at one point or another in their careers, and some of them did it routinely. It made sense, if their whole lives were anything like today had been. Recovery Girl started an IV with fluids, and added a little something to help Izuku sleep. Sleep now, his father said, ruffling his hair lightly. I'll be here when you wake up. Izuku closed his eyes and let the drowsiness carry him away. As promised, Izuku woke to find his father sitting at his bedside, reading a book that looked like it was for pleasure reading instead of work, for a change. When he noticed Izuku shift, he dojered the page and closed it without hesitation. How long was I out? Only a couple of hours, his dad said quietly. Izuku looked at the next bed and saw that All Might was still fast asleep, but had turned on his side and pulled his knees up to fit better in the cramped space. Is he really going to be okay? Izuku asked as Recovery Girl came over to check on him. As fine as he ever is, she said, not bothering to keep her voice down. Sasaki-san will be here to pick him up in a little while, and he'll be back to his old self in a day or so. What about me? Izuku asked. You'll be fine in just a few minutes, she said briskly kissing him on the forehead. Izuku felt a mild tingle in his arm, and his leg made an audible cracking noise as it repaired itself, but it didn't hurt. The nurse nodded in satisfaction and began removing the splint on his arm. She only had to loosen the tape a little, and it slid right off like a glove, thanks to his slippery skin. The needle and plastic tube was removed from his arm and she held pressure on the tiny wound while she gave his hand another small smooch to close it. You've just woken up, but you'll still be pretty tired, she said. It's just as well school's been cancelled until Monday. You can take that time to rest up. They cancelled school. Why? Izuku asked. Both adults just stared at him. They have to conduct a thorough investigation and will need access to the entire campus, Sir said as he entered. Not just the USJ. Izuku nodded and began to mumble to himself about security systems, computer hacking, backup emergency generators and other things until his father cleared his throat. Sorry, Izuku said sheepishly. It's a lot to consider. It is, Sir agreed. And since you have a couple of days off of school... I'd like you to devote some of your time to reading this. When to put yourself first, Izuku read from the front cover, recognizing your own needs in stressful situations. He looked at Sir Night Eye with a scowl, not sure if he was being teased. Izuku, this is the second time since school started less than two weeks ago that you've delayed your own medical treatment to put others first. I know that, but the first time, Kakin was a wreck. He needed the help way more. What if that head injury had been super serious and I made it worse by being there? And then today, it was all might. Oh, might. There's no way I'm more important than him. Sir sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose under his glasses like he tended to do when he was frustrated. His father was shaking his head ruefully. Has it occurred to you that in a school full of heroes, there might be someone else able to render you first aid, or at least triage care while you waited for Recovery Girl? Sir pointed out. Or that Recovery Girl has been a pro for more years than you've been alive and might know a thing or two about treating multiple patients at once. Well, it makes sense when you say it like that, but... Izuku spluttered, feeling a little flustered. At the time it made perfect sense. Sir quirked a small smile and shook his head. Read the book. Yes sir, Izuku said with a sigh. Izuku's dad took that book and the one he'd been reading and slipped them into his jacket pockets. Good, we'll discuss this more another day. For now, I've got to get Toshinori back home. Much to Izuku's surprise, all it took to wake All Might was for Sir to call out, Toshi, emergency, suit up. All Might was on his feet in an instant, looking awake and alert, though not in his muscular form. What? Huh? What's the situation? All Might demanded before realizing where he was. Time to go home, Sir said briskly, holding up a very large bathrobe and a pair of slippers. No need to get changed. The car is waiting at the door. The school at night wasn't as creepy as Izuku thought it might be. The hallways were all still well lit, and there were police and security bots patrolling the corridors as they walked out. Sir stood ready to support All Might, but the hero walked out on his own, head held high. I'm sorry I failed you today, young Midoriya, he finally said as they reached the door of the school that led to the parking lot. What are you talking about? Izuku asked. You were amazing. Not so. It was irresponsible of me to use up all of my energy so early in the day, when I knew there was an important training session plan. If I had been more willing to let other heroes take over, you never would have had to face that thing alone. You can't be everywhere. All might, Izuku said earnestly. You're the one who always says that we don't get to pick and choose when we'll be needed. All Might sighed and rested a hand gently on Izuku's head. A hero also shows up when he promises to be somewhere. I learned more than one valuable lesson today, thanks to you. Now, go home and rest. I'll do the same. Izuku wasn't totally sure what All Might meant, but he nodded and thanked both heroes as he let his father lead him to his car. 
Izuku woke up later than he had in years the following day. He supposed that his body had needed the extra rest after being asked to speed up the healing on a broken arm and whatever had been wrong with his leg. He wandered out to the living room and found his father sitting on the couch, reading the book that Sir had given Izuku the previous day. Good morning, he said as he came into the room. Good morning, his dad said, looking up from the book. How do you feel? Good. I guess I was tired. I'm still feeling. I dunno. Tired isn't the right word, but a lot happened yesterday. It's a lot to take in, his dad said quietly. I've already heard from Sir Nidai, and All Might is doing just fine. Thirteen and your teacher are also on their way to recovery, though it'll take longer. That's good news, Izuku said, feeling relief. But there was still a weight on his chest he couldn't quite describe. Sir gave me a recommendation for a couple of therapists that work with heroes and people who struggle with the implications of traumatic events, his father said. I think it's a good idea for you to speak to someone sooner rather than later. I'm sure the school counselor is very good, but I want you to have the best. Izuku nodded, automatically trusting his words because the recommendation had come from Sir. If it was someone he thought was reliable, then it was good enough for Izuku. I've left a message, and hopefully we can get you in for an appointment soon. Izuku heard a soft buzzing sound coming from the dining area, and saw a phone vibrating enough to rattle against the wood. That's your phone, his father said, following his gaze. It's been doing that all morning. I heard it in your bag and took it out to charge it. I didn't want to wake you, but someone seems eager to talk to you. Izuku patted over and examined the screen. He had 11 missed calls from Ida and 4 messages from him, as well. There were also 4 from Yuraraka, 2 from Kirishima, 1 from Kaminari and 1 from Yeyurazu. Yikes. I uh, I kind of forgot that I'm the class rep. I should have texted everyone yesterday. Zu, they're probably calling to check on how you're doing. Not because you're class rep, his father said, sounding slightly exasperated. Sir was right. You need to learn to recognize where your priorities are and start seeing yourself as others see you. Izuku made a groaning noise. Now he was going to be lectured by Sir and his father. Great. Well, I'd better at least call Ida before he blows a gasket, Izuku said with an embarrassed shrug. Even as he finished saying it, the phone began buzzing in his hand. He quickly answered with, Hey, Ida. Sorry, sorry. I just woke up. The next hour was spent on the phone with Ida, giving his version of events and hearing about what had happened after Izuku left USJ via the hole in the dome. Ida had reached the school and burst into the principal's office to let them know there had been an attack at the USJ, which had prompted All Might to go on ahead while Nezu rounded up all of the teachers. Ida had traveled with the teachers back to the facility, where Snipe had shot Shigaraki several times, but Kurajiri had managed to spirit him away before he could be taken into custody. The two villains had abandoned the rest of their comrades, who had been rounded up quickly and arrested. Once the battle was over, All Might had been isolated by Cementos so they could prepare him for transport to get checked out at a hospital. Of course, Izuku knew what had actually happened, but was glad to know what story had been fed to his classmate. The two other injured teachers were taken away in ambulances, and Izuku's classmates had been treated for minor injuries by the medics on site. Everyone's parents had been called before students were released, and the police were still investigating. It all seemed so cut and dried now that it was over, but Izuku knew better. He praised Ida for his part in getting help and felt better knowing that he had been in touch with their other classmates to check on them and keep them in form. Ida was a far better class rep than Izuku. Sukachi made an appearance to take a statement not much later, and then Izuku was finally free to just sit and think. That wasn't necessarily a good thing. That night, his sleep was plagued with nightmares. Monstrous creatures were swarming the school, Namu. They were grabbing students and stuffing them into a huge, swimming pool-sized vat of green murky liquid. There was chaos as the teachers tried to fight, but there were too many of the behemoths. And Shigaraki Tamura was standing on the sidelines, grabbing kids, too. Only the kids that Shigaraki grabbed turned to ash instead of being thrown into the vat. But Dream Izuku knew that they were the lucky ones. Dream Izuku was strapped to an exam table, unable to use any of his quirks. He had tubes in each of his arms and legs that were attached to the top of the vat full of students, and dripping blood onto them. Each one his blood touch transformed into a Namu identical to the others. Their skulls melted away to expose their brains as their faces stretched into sharp toothed beak. They rose as mindless monsters from the tank to join in the attack on the other students. All Izuku could do was scream and thrash in an attempt to get free while a disembodied voice promised him. You won't even remember this in a few minutes. Izuku screamed as one of the Namu creatures appeared in front of him and grabbed his arm. I quote him sorry. Izuku's own voice is what woke him as it bounced off the walls of his room. Bat, and his father gripping his shoulders and shaking him, begging him to wake up. Izuku could just barely hear his own ragged breathing over the sound of his thunderous heartbeat roaring in his ears. His father had a vague cloud of smoke over his head, probably from exhaling it while trying to wake his son. Izuku's eyes were wide as he tried to comprehend that he was now awake. 
He faded in and out of transparency as his breath hitched once, twice, three times. Then a sob escaped and he gripped his father in a tight, soothing hug as the tears began to flow. His father's warm hands rubbed his back as he Izuku purged the poison of his dreams from the reality of the moment. Soft words of comfort that Izuku couldn't really hear, but still understood were murmured into his hair. And when he had finally exhausted the tears, and the trembling had stopped, he sat back feeling embarrassed. Sorry, Izuku apologized awkwardly. That was a crazy dream. There's no need to be sorry. His father assured him, reaching for the box of tissues on the desk and offering it to his son. It sounds like everything you've been bottling up is starting to leak out while you sleep. I guess, Izuku said, feeling thirsty. He blew his nose and took a couple more deep breaths to steady himself. Do you want to talk about it? His dad asked. That's okay. I didn't mean to wake you up, and... Stop that, his father said firmly, yet not angrily. You did not wake me up, and even if you had, making sure you're okay is way more important. What time is it? Izuku asked, looking around for his phone. It's only 11.30, his father said. You've barely been asleep an hour. Izuku was startled to hear this. It had seemed like he'd been trapped in that horrorscape for hours. Tell me about your dream, his father said. Maybe saying it out loud will help make it seem less daunting in your mind. Izuku doubted that, but gave it a try. He described everything that had happened in his dream, trying to detach his feelings from those of his dream self. His father listened with an inscrutable expression, but the wisps of smoke curling from his nostrils gave away the turmoil he was feeling. Zhu, his father said after a moment of silence, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that your subconscious is doing this to you, and that there are experiences you've had that have fueled that kind of nightmare. One thing seems obvious, though, you're blaming yourself for something that is not your fault. Izuku nodded. He knew in his mind that it was true, but he also felt a sense of guilt that he couldn't seem to suppress, knowing that something that was taken from him was used to hurt others. You'll be glad to know that I heard back from the therapist that Sir Ninai recommended. His father said at last, You have an appointment tomorrow afternoon. I'm pretty sure he and All Might pulled some strings to get you in that quickly, but I'm not complaining. Is that okay with you? Izuku nodded again, still in a slight daze from reliving the dream out loud. Yeah, I think it might be a good idea. He didn't want to burden his father with such ugly imagery after all. And a professional might actually have some advice or fresh perspective to help keep the nightmares at bay. His father finally left him alone when Izuku assured him he was alright. But he didn't sleep again that night. The therapist was nice. It was a man named Fujimori Aoki with literal flowers for hair. And it looked almost like he was wearing a very fancy swimming cap. The flowers appeared to be similar to lavender with its spiky peaks. It had a fragrance that was calming and not as feminine as one might expect. He had a sense of humor about his appearance too, which Izuku appreciated. Izuku kind of wanted to ask if the flowers ever wilted when the man was dehydrated, or if he was bald in the winter, maybe another time. The office was in a tall apartment building, on the very top floor, which served as both the man's home and his office. Izuku's father waited in a small nook with comfortable chairs and a variety of magazines, walled off from the residential portion of the penthouse. The office itself was just a plain room. With a desk with two chairs in front of it, a few plants, and a spectacular view that overlooked the city and a little bit of the ocean in the distance. There were four chairs, set up like a small square with each chair facing its diagonal partner. They all had a slightly different design to accommodate those who liked to sit up straight. Those who preferred to lounge a bit, one that reclined, and one that cupped the person sitting in it, almost like an egg. Izuku wondered if it was a sort of test or indicator to what his personality was like depending on which chair he chose. He tried to wait for Dr. Fujimori to take a seat first, so he could just sit opposite, but that didn't work. Take a seat anywhere that you find comfortable, he said. Izuku took a seat in the egg-shaped chair, which encouraged him to lean backward, which felt too casual. He stood almost immediately and went to the recliner, but didn't recline it. Fujimori seemed slightly amused but said nothing about the change of seat. Once Izuku seemed settled, Fujimori took a seat opposite in the one Izuku thought would be for people like Ada, who would sit straight up. He was holding a file folder under a clipboard, but rested them on his lap and simply looked at Izuku calmly. Today is going to be for getting to know each other a little better. Sometimes the first therapist you meet with isn't always the best one for you. It's important that you feel comfortable to speak freely and let go of some of your tension while you're here. The next hour was a bit awkward at first, but by the time Izuku left, he felt like he had made a start in addressing some of the things on his mind. He'd talked a lot, anyway. His father made an appointment for him for the next week, and then appointments would be weekly or as needed after that. On the drive home, the only thing his father asked about his appointment was what his first impressions of Fujimori were and whether he felt comfortable there. Izuku appreciated the privacy and the concern. I think I'm going to like him, Izuku said but I guess I won't know for sure right away. 
Izuku didn't see any reason why he shouldn't be okay with Fujimori, but he hadn't seen any reason not to trust Granny Ito, either. He had loved her and she had loved him, but in the end the center of their relationship had been betrayal. The only close friend he'd ever had was Kaken, and Izuku had felt betrayed by him as well. He hadn't allowed himself to form any true, close friendships for most of his life because he just didn't trust people beyond a surface level. He believed that most people were good, but maybe he was afraid that he'd find out they weren't. He said I should keep a journal, Izuku said, willing to share that much about his appointment, so I can write down things that bother me, or things I can't stop thinking about and stuff. He said it would help us use the time during our sessions to our best advantage. That makes sense, his father said. Do we need to stop and buy one, or do you already have something you want to use? And just like that, Izuku knew that not not everyone would betray him. Not his father, not All Might, or Sir. There were people out there he could trust. He just needed to take the time and have the courage to try to let people in. Ada and Yuraka messaged him regularly during the school closure. Ada was incredibly efficient, and had put together binders for himself and Izuku to help them with their class rep duties. His messages were usually something regarding school though he did often express concern for Izuku's well-being, since he'd been the most injured at the USJ. Hiroraka's messages tended to be more cheerful, in a getting-to-know-a-new-friend kind of way. Through their brief messages, which Izuku got flustered over, because talking to a girl outside of a school setting was out of his scope of knowledge, Izuku learned a lot about her. She lived in a tiny apartment not far from the school, because her parents lived in May Prefecture, several hours away. She ate a lot of ramen. But when Izuku asked if that was her favorite, she had said, not really, which Izuku took to mean that she ate it because it was inexpensive. He gave them surprisingly little information about himself. Some things were unavoidable, like his quirks, his love of all things all might, and things having to do with school. Habit kept him from sharing personal details about where he lived or what he did outside of school. They seemed content with that for now, but he wondered how long it would be before they thought it was weird. He should probably talk to his father and All Might about what it was okay to say and what wasn't, since the most innocent of conversations could have disastrous results. They'd learned that the hard way with his dad's assistant. Still, there was nothing stopping him from being friendly and appreciative of their concern and interest. He'd just proceed with caution. When school reopened on Monday, Izuku was surprised to see Yuraka as well as Ida when he arrived 25 minutes before the bell. Asui showed up not long after, then Yeyurazu. Everyone seemed relieved to see each other in person after the USJ scare, and were looking for answers that hadn't been answered with the back-and-forth messaging they'd done over the extended weekend. More students arrived early on this day than any before, and it seemed strange that school had only been in session for a couple of weeks. How did they know who you were, Midoriya? Siro asked, ignoring Ada's complaint that he was sitting on the desk. I've sort of run into them before, I guess. He answered cautiously. You guess. So you pressed. You're not sure. Well, it's a long story, but I met the guy with white hair and the warp gate guy before, but the meeting was kind of erased from my mind by their boss so I didn't find out until later. That's crazy, man, Hiroshima exclaimed, sounding excited. Tell me about it, Izuku agreed. Then, not feeling comfortable with all of the attention on him, Izuku decided a change of subject was in order. I'm glad everyone is okay, he said, and I'm sorry I didn't think to message all of you. I'm not turning out to be a very good class rep. I was thinking it might be a good idea to make up a group chat for our class, so everyone can check in with each other. That's an excellent suggestion. Ada approved. I'll do it, Kaminari offered, pulling out his phone. No, I'll do it, Ashido insisted. I think we should wait until our break to set it up, Izuku said. Class is about to start. That set Ida off on one of his tangents, waving his arms and urging everyone to get into their seats. He blushed furiously when Ashido pointed out that he was the only not in his seat, and quickly slid into his chair while they all laughed. I wonder who will get as a teacher until Sensei gets back. Iraraka whispered loudly enough for everyone to hear. Whoever it is, we will give them our utmost respect, Ada said, just as the door slid open. Good morning. Every jaw in the room dropped when Aizawa Sensei walked somewhat unsteadily into the room. It appeared he was covered head to toe in bandages, but was still wearing his hero costume. Both of his arms were wrapped in in slings, making Izuku wonder how he had even managed to open the door. His eyes were just barely visible through slits in the bandages, but what he could see was as bloodshot as usual. I'm glad you're doing well, sir, Ada said loudly as their teacher stood behind the desk. You call that well? Yuraka asked incredulously. Sensei, are you sure you should be here? So you asked? You don't need to concern yourselves with me, Aizawa said tiredly. You all aren't through fighting. Yumina, Izuku wondered if they were going to jump right into battle training again. Not more villains, Minda wailed from behind Izuku. Not more villains, Aizawa said. Worse, UAS Sports Festival is approaching. You'll be competing against other students in this school, including each other. 
Izuku drew a breath of relief, though he wondered why Aizawa would consider that worse than villains. They're still going to allow it to take place after the attack on the school. Yeirazu asked, sounding concerned. Izuku shared the sentiment, but the UA Sports Festival was huge. It was an event that drew national attention in. The way that the Olympics used to before quirks began manifesting all over the world. Apparently the thinking behind this decision is that UA needs to show the world that its safety and crisis management protocols are sound. There will be five times the police presence than usual to ease concerns. But that's not your biggest problem. Izuku had figured that tightening security would have happened even without the festival, so that wasn't a big revelation. He only hoped the villains didn't see it as a challenge. This is one of the biggest opportunities you'll be given. However, it's not only you that's getting the opportunity, competition will be fierce school-wide. It's not something that will be cancelled because a few villains gave one class some trouble on a remote corner of campus. You sure about that? Minda asked, sounding spooked. Izuku wondered exactly what Minda had endured at the USJ. He wasn't sure anyone had filled him in on that. Minda, haven't you ever seen the past sports festivals? They're huge and take tons of planning and… Of course I have, Minda said, sounding almost offended. That's not what I mean. The entire country gets whipped into a frenzy over this, Aizawa pointed out. It's a huge undertaking that not only the hero departments participate in. The nation's top heroes will be watching, Yeirazu pointed out. Most of them as scouts. That started a quiet murmuring among a lot of the students who were excited by the prospect of getting noticed this early in their high school career. They'll be looking for potential psychics. Kaminari enthused. Yeah, but some get picked up and stay psychics, never going pro. That'll probably be you, truly boy, Jaira told him, sounding annoyed. Hey, what I ever do to you? Kaminari asked plaintively. Izuku observed this with raised eyebrows, reminding himself to keep an eye out for Jairo's sharp tongue. It goes without saying what valuable experience and training as well as popularity you'll get if you get picked up by a big-name hero. This is a chance that happens once a year, so you get three sports festivals to make an impression. It's time to show them what you're made of, and earn futures for yourselves, Aizawa told them with more zeal than he usually put into his speeches. If you're hoping to be heroes, this is an event you can't afford to screw up. Present Mike launched himself through the door at that point and said in English, Good morning class. He wasn't as loud as usual, and his eyes seemed to have dark smudges under them, but Izuku could tell he was doing his best to be cheerful. He also didn't miss that Present Mike put a hand briefly on Aizawa's shoulder and asked how he was feeling. From some of the gossip he'd heard in the cafeteria, it appeared that Aizawa and Mike had been students at UA at the same time and were old friends. It seemed like a strange pairing to Izuku, but they did often say that opposites attract. The morning classes dragged by, with everyone's minds on the announcement of the sports festival instead of English, math and modern literature. As soon as the door closed behind Cementos, the room burst into excited chatter. I'm so freaking pumped about this, Hiroshima declared, hardening his hands and pounding his fists together. If we show what we're about, it's a big step toward going pro. They all moved toward the door to head for the cafeteria. Everyone's sure excited, Izuku said to Ida as they followed the crowd. Aren't you? Ida demanded, seeming more uptight than ever. This is an excellent opportunity to earn a spot among the ranks of heroes. Of course we'd be in high spirits. Yuraka was even more charged up than Ida, or even Kirishima. Let's go all out on this, she said fervently, her face carved into hard lines of determination. The others are turned to stare at her uncharacteristic mood swing. Everyone, I'm gonna crush this, she declared, sounding almost angry about it. Her hands were fisted and she pumped the air, encouraging the others to join in. Plus Ultra. So, Izuku asked, hoping he sounded casual as they fell into step with Ida and Yuraka. What made you guys decide to be heroes? Money, Yuraka said without hesitation. Money, both Izuku and Ida asked in unison. I know, I know, Yuraka said, looking embarrassed. It's super crass. It's just, my parents run a construction company that hasn't been doing so well for a really long time, so money's always been tight. They've worked so hard and don't have anything to show for it, you know. I want to give them a more comfortable life, and live comfortably myself, too. Izuku felt ashamed at his initial reaction of outrage to her reason for becoming a hero. He had already suspected that she was living as cheaply as possible from the messages they'd exchanged. There was nothing wrong with wanting a better life for yourself, and that went double for wanting it for others. That was a kind of heroism in itself, wasn't it? I don't see anything wrong with that, Ida said reasonably. Though I think you'll work harder to achieve your goal than in most other jobs, it will likely happen faster with hero work. Thanks, I'm not sure about Midoriya, but I'm pretty sure you grew up as a rich boy, didn't you? Yeah. Izuku had the same suspicion, and even a reason besides the obvious because of his fascination with heroes. He nodded at Yuraka's supposition, even as Ida's shoulders slumped. Ah, uh, I have tried to change my formal way of speaking 
but I'm afraid I have slipped far too many times to be convincing. Izuku smothered a grin at the idea that Ida had actually been trying to be more casual. If he truly was making an effort, what had he been like before? Either way, he had failed miserably, and Izuku found that hilarious. Your family is the one that founded the Idaten Agency, isn't it? Izuku asked. You knew, Ida asked, straightening again, as if the slumped shoulders were too much of an effort to maintain. I do now, Izuku grinned. Your hero costume kind of gives it away. Uo, Uraraka said, sounding very impressed. Yes, the Ida family have been in the hero business for generations. He said proudly, puffing out his chest. The turbo hero, Ingenium is my elder brother, Tensei. I hope to one day follow in his footsteps. Wow, Ingenium is really cool. His engines are in his arms and his mobility is insane. He's a very popular hero with at least 60 sidekicks under him at Idaten. Izuku said, impressed that they were brothers, since there was definitely a wide age gap there. Ida seemed to soak in the praise, a wide, proud smile on his face. What about you, Midoriya? Uraraka asked. What makes you want to be a hero? Is it because you have so many quirks that are good for it? It does seem like a natural choice. Ida agreed. Well, I lost my mom in a villain attack when I was little, and I just want to save people and scare the bad guys away from committing crimes, just like All Might does, Izuku said sheepishly. I know I've got a long way to go, and All Might is the best in the world, but a very worthy goal. Ada approved. I'm so sorry about your mom, Uraraka said, covering her mouth in horror. Thank you, Izuku said sincerely. Hers was the first quirk I inherited. She was protecting me when she died. It sounds like she was quite a hero herself, Ada said softly. I'm sorry you lost her. Izuku nodded, sorry to have made things awkward. Instead, he resumed walking toward the cafeteria. Uraraka started to change the subject. When Kakan appeared and said he wanted to talk to Deku alone, Ada and Uraraka stepped in front of Izuku to block the other boy, but Izuku stopped them from doing anything further. It's okay, guys. You go on ahead and I'll try to catch up. If you're sure, Ada said, managing to sound like he suspected Kakan of plotting murder. It's fine, really, Izuku assured them. Get lost four eyes, Kakan growled, making Izuku sigh. What is it? Izuku asked once his friends had moved into the cafeteria. What really went down at the USJ? He demanded without preamble. There's all sorts of rumors flying around, but they aren't telling anyone anything. If they aren't telling, then maybe they don't want you to know. Izuku asked, knowing he was being petty but not managing to care. Look, I'm going to be taking my place back in that class next week, and I have a right to know what I'm missing out on, Kakan said boldly. Then I'll fill you in when you're back in class, Izuku said coolly. If you're back in class, it didn't really seem like Kakan's attitude had changed much in the short amount of time he'd been relegated to the general studies course. I'll be back, all right. I've been training my ass off, Kakan claimed. You do get that this was never about your skills right. Please tell me you understand that much, Izuku pleaded, unable to believe Kakan was that dense. I know that, Kakan growled with a huff. But that isn't going to help me win the sports festival, is it? Izuku hoped he meant that. He'd looked into the rules about it, and the situation the loophole was designed for was for kids who didn't perform well in the entrance exams for some reason, but who still made it to one of the other courses. If they wanted to get moved up to the hero course, it was a possibility to be so impressive that they couldn't deny that you deserved a spot. Izuku wasn't sure how performing well in the sports festival was going to teach Kakan anything he needed to know about being a decent human being. Well, good luck, then, Izuku said awkwardly. See you around. You're seriously not going to tell me about the USJ. Not right now, Izuku said. Is everything all right, boys? All Might asked, peering around a corner at them. Fine, All Might. Izuku assured him with a little wave. Just talking. I'd like to have a talk with you myself. When you're finished chatting with Bakugu-kun, if you wouldn't mind. All Might asked. We're done here, I guess, Kakan said. He turned on his heel and disappeared into the crowded cafeteria, leaving Izuku alone with All Might waiting. Should I grab my lunch first? Izuku asked him. No worries. I'll feed you. The teachers get a special menu. All Might said cheerfully. Izuku shrugged and followed All Might to a small lounge, where he instantly deflated into his skinnier form. True to his word, there was a tray on the coffee table in the middle of a grouping of seats, and All Might gestured for Izuku to sit and eat. What is this about, All Might? Izuku asked, accepting the cup of tea he was handed. Mostly, it's about the sports festival, All Might said, nudging the tray when Izuku didn't immediately start eating. I can't believe it's already here, Izuku said, picking up a bowl of rice with sliced beef layered on top. Yes, well, it's a good thing, in spite of the security risk, All Might said. The amount of time that I can hold my hero form is down to about 50 minutes. 50 minutes. Izuku practically shouted in disbelief. But it was just three hours, before. Before I fought that Namu, All Might supplied. Yes, I'm sore. Izuku started to apologize, looking at his knees in shame. Don't apologize. All Might interrupted. 
He had a small coughing fit that left flecks of blood in his chin. You're so much like me, in that regard, All Might told him. But this isn't your fault. We knew it was going to happen sooner or later. And this just sped the process up. That's why I passed one for all to you. You're my successor. If I was better at using it, maybe I could have beat that Namu, and you wouldn't have had to fight it at all, Izuku said glumly. There's no time for maybe right now, All Might told him firmly. To be honest, you probably saved my life. If you hadn't joined the fight when you did, I'm not sure I could have taken him out. I was in real trouble, there. Izuku didn't like to think about it, since it was likely his blow that had killed the monstrous Namu. What I want to talk about right now is the sports festival. Do you have a plan? Not really, besides trying to win, Izuku admitted. It's hard to plan for something when you don't know what's coming. That's true, All Might said, but I have faith in you. I'm not sure what they have planned, but I wouldn't tell you, even if I did. You have to earn this by yourself. Izuku nodded as he ate and listened. It wouldn't hurt to see if you could find some footage of previous festivals to get an idea of what it might be like. It's usually set up in a three or four part series of events designed to weed out the weakest competitors. First, by the end, it's usually the kids in the hero course left for the final round, but not always. This year, young Bakugu will be looking to make a name for himself so that he can re-enter the hero course. There could be others with the same aim. Izuku knew he was right. He'd watched almost all of the previous sports festivals on television for as long as he could remember. Surely there were at least a few blogs that talked about them or made predictions about what this upcoming one might contain. It could be worth looking into. The important thing is that my time as a hero and the symbol of peace is running short. And there are some criminals and villains out there who are beginning to see that. As my successor, it's time for you to start standing out. You need to tell the world, I am here. So that they get used to the idea that I am not the only one villains need to fear. The sports festival is an excellent chance for your name to start becoming known to the world. As pep talks went, it would have been a great one if Izuku didn't feel the weight of its importance resting on his shoulders. They talked some more, and Izuku had muttered his way through an entire conversation with himself before the bell rang, signaling the end of lunchtime. He went back to class with a lot to think about, and very little time to prepare for the battle of a lifetime. Everyone seemed stoked about it, planning how they would spend the next two weeks training until the sports festival. When classes were dismissed for the day, they were stopped short at the door to their classroom by a crowd of students who all seemed to be waiting for them. What's going on? Yuraraka asked in surprise. Looks like they're here to size up their competition. Yay Irazu surmised. We are the class that survived a villain attack. After all, it does make sense that they would want to look before the sports festival, Ada agreed. Though blocking the hallway is not the way to conduct oneself at such a... It's true, a boy from the back piped up, pushing his way to the front of the crowd. He had fluffed up, bluish-purple hair and dark shadows around his eyes. We came to get a look at the competition, but you don't look that impressive to me. You look just like the rest of us. Hey, Kirishima objected. Rude, I'm just saying what everyone else is thinking. The outspoken kid said, Those of us that didn't make the hero course got diverted into general studies or other tracks. There are a lot of us, did you know? Izuku did know, though he wouldn't have, if Kaken hadn't been demoted. And depending on the results of the sports festival, they might consider transferring one of us into the hero course. What? Really? Minda asked in surprise. Izuku found himself nodding in confirmation, until the boy said something Izuku hadn't known. I've heard the opposite is also true, too. If you bomb at the festival, you could get booted out to make room for someone who performed better. In fact, I heard there's already an available seat in 1A. Bed seats mine eye bags. Izuku actually winced when he heard Kaken's voice from near the door. It only took a moment for him to also push his way forward to confront the other kid. That's not what it looks like from here, Sparky, purple hair said, sounding bored. I'm taking that seat back. I didn't get sent to general studies because I lack skills. And there's no way you'll beat me in a contest of quirks, Kaken declared. So it was your charming personality. The other boy said with a smile. Imagine being such a DK that even your powerful quirk couldn't keep you from being kicked out of heroics. And I've met some really grouchy and unapproachable pros, so that's saying something. Izuku bit his lip. The kid had a point, but it seemed cruel to point it out in a crowd. He really does know Bakugu, Siro muttered to no one in particular, just as Kaken's temper was about to explode through his palms. The door to the classroom next door burst open. Hey, hey, hey. A kid with silvery hair and crazy long, silver eyelashes said, seeing everyone gathered. I heard you guys fought some villains and I came out to find out more. But all I see is this arrogant jerk. You'd better not be making the hero department look bad. Wait a minute, Tetsu Khan. Came another loud voice. It wasn't hard to see who was speaking, since he was so tall. Izuku grinned when he saw Yurashi looking over the tops of most people's heads. I'm pretty sure that's the kid that got kicked out of 1A, Yurashi said bluntly. And there's Midoriya. He'll tell us about the villains. Izuku mentally sighed as all eyes turned to him for a moment. 
Thankfully, Sekijiro Sensei came out to see what the fuss was about. Everyone needs to clear out of here, he said loudly. Unless you all want attention deep clean in the sweat out of the mats in the gymnasium. That was enough to get most of the students to make a hasty departure. Izuku quickly wrote his email address and phone number down and passed it to Yurashi when they met in the hall. Then he said goodbye to his friends and went to catch a ride home with All Might. The first thing Izuku did when he got home was search for footage of past sports festivals. He was still poring over them, making notes an hour and a half later when his phone pinged and he saw he had a message. It was from Yurashi and simply said, let's have lunch together tomorrow. Izuku smiled to himself and shot back a, sounds good. As if that call had opened a floodgate, Ida messaged next to ask if, as class reps, they should be doing anything to help the class prepare for the sports festival. Next came a message from Yuraka about their English homework. Then the class chat got busy until Izuku pointed out that there were videos online about past sports festivals, and things quieted down again. Then everyone started sharing links to different sites and videos, and it was very late by the time Izuku finally got to sleep that night. Lunch with Hirashi was interesting. They met at the entrance to the cafeteria and got trays and took them to a table, where they were joined by Ida and Yuraka, as well as Tetsu Tetsu and Honuki, who Izuku had met before at the exam for the recommended students. Tetsu Tetsu reminded Izuku strongly of Kirishima in both attitude and quirk, and wondered if they knew each other or were somehow related. Introductions were made, and instead of small talk to get to know one another, they immediately started discussing what had happened at the USJ and what they thought might happen at the sports festival. Izuku briefly made eye contact with Kaken, who was watching their little group with narrowed eyes, but Izuku blinked and turned his head away to break the contact. He was under no obligation to go out of his way to keep the other boy up to date on what happened in the hero class right now. Maybe if he saw him later, he could suggest the videos of past festivals as a way to prepare. But he told himself he wouldn't go out of his way to do so. I heard that the other courses could use support items to help them if they want. It's supposed to even out the playing field, since they aren't getting the physical training the hero course gets. Honnuki said, Some of the support students are crazy talented, too. Urashi said, There's one girl who blows up the support classrooms and studios almost every day, and they can't even get that mad, because she comes up with so many brilliant ideas. We'd better be ready to face some formidable opponents, then. Ada declared, and not only from our own classes. That one boy with the purple hair sure seemed to want to get into the hero course, Yuraka said. I wonder if he'll use some kind of tool or gadget to help him. Anything is possible at this point, Izuku said, feeling excited by the prospect of a challenge. We should try to be ready for anything. I'm not going to go easy on you guys, Yurashi warned, sounding cheerful about it. I'm in it to win it. Me too, Tetsu Tetsu said enthusiastically. So am I, Yuraka announced, not wanting to be left out. By the time lunch was over, they were in high spirits, and training that afternoon was both fun and challenging as they worked hard to keep up with each other in a game of tag in an area that looked a lot like the landslide zone of the USJ. The guys in 1B don't seem too bad, Yuraka told Izuku as they headed back to class after training. That Yurashi guy's loud, though. Izuku laughed at that. He is, but he's a good guy, just passionate, about pretty much everything. All the time. I don't think we talked about what our quirks are, Ida said as he joined them. What does Yurashi do? Hmm, I guess there's no harm in telling, Izuku said. He manipulates wind, and he's really, really good at it. That sounds like a really useful quirk, Yuraka said. Do you know anything about Tetsu Tetsu-kun or Honuki-kun? Ida asked. I'm pretty sure that Tetsu Tetsu is similar to Kirishima, Izuku said. I think I heard that he can turn to steel or silver or something like that. Super sturdy. Honuki's is called softening, and he can soften any non-living thing he touches, and it's amazing. He can turn the ground to quicksand. Or rocks into clay dot 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 that sort of thing. Well, Yuraka said. Another super useful quirk. He was one of the recommended students that ended up taking the entrance exam. He came in second to Todoroki, followed by Kaken. I mean, Bakugou. We've got some crazy strong quirks among the first years. Speaking of Kaken. At the end of the day, Izuku looked out of his classroom window and made a decision. With a sigh, he broke a few school rules by hopping out of a second floor window and landing on the grass in front of the school, then heading to the front gate where he managed to head off Kaken before he left the grounds. What do you want, nerd? Kaken asked him without much rancor. I just wanted to give you this, Izuku said. I'd probably get in trouble for it if Sensei found out. But as class rep, it might respond. Your class rep? Kaken interrupted to ask. Yep, it is deputy class rep. Anyway, as class rep it's my job to make sure everyone has everything they need, like handouts and stuff. If you're so sure you're coming back to 1A, you should probably keep up. So this is all the notes I took about the hero training we've done and the assignments we were given since you've been gone. Kaken looked suspicious as he slowly reached out and took the thick folder from Izuku's hand. 
Why are you doing this? He asked. I'm not sure, Izuku said. I just think you should have a fair chance. And if you're really reflecting on why you got suspended from the hero course, you're going to need to be up to speed when you come back. If not, I won't bother keeping notes and stuff for you anymore. It's up to you now. Izuku turned and dashed off without waiting for a reply. He had said what he needed to, and had added a note telling Kaken about the videos he could watch of the previous sports festivals, even though he probably already knew about them. He hoped he didn't get in trouble for it, but he was training to be a hero, after all. It was his job to try and save people. The rest of the two weeks seemed to go by in a blur. There was a lot of activity around campus as stalls were erected along the lane leading to the sports festival arena. Tons of security and police were roaming around, making sure everything was extra secure. Izuku and his friends took their afternoon hero training extra seriously and spent less time in the class chat than they had when it was first set up, since everyone was spending every extra moment they could practicing moves and preparing as best they could. Izuku didn't go to Might Tower for extra training, not wanting to have an unfair advantage this close to the competition. He suspected that if he had asked if he could, Sir would have been disappointed in him, and he definitely did not want that. His father had gotten him a set of hyper-dense dumbbells after he'd received one for all, and he'd been using those, along with the stairwell of his apartment building for home exercise. He pored over his notebooks, going over the strengths and weaknesses of the other students that he knew of, memorizing the best countermoves and ways to take them down without injury or humiliation, if possible. He had gotten special permission to wear his gloves during the competition if he wished, as long as they didn't have any gadgets or other special attributes to them. On the day of the festival, Izuku was a bundle of nerves and excitement, practically vibrating in his seat as his father drove him to the school and then went to find his own seat in the stadium. He'd been lucky to get a seat, and Izuku suspected that Gran had given up his own ticket so that his father could attend. Izuku navigated his way to the waiting room assigned to his classroom where he found Ida pacing back and forth like a soldier on guard duty. Midoriya, he greeted stiffly. Hey, Ida, you're the first one here like always, Izuku said, feeling like his voice was a little too loud and too chipper. Today is a very important day, Ida said with an air chop. This is an incredibly important step in making a name for ourselves. My whole family will be watching and they have high expectations. It is a lot of pressure, Izuku agreed. But you've worked hard, and you've had the added benefit of being brought up by heroes, yourself. You'll be amazing. I thank you, Midoriya. That's very kind of you to say. Izuku smiled at him, hoping that some of his own nerves would dissipate if he helped to calm others. Ajiro arrived at the same time as Hagakure, then Yeyurazu, then Kaminari. Each of their classmates trickled in, some louder and more boisterous than usual, others more quiet. Everyone had their own way of dealing with stress. When everyone had arrived, Izuku cleared his throat and raised his voice. Okay everyone, as your class rep I just want to say that I've seen how hard everyone has been working. I know we haven't been at this school for long, but our training started a long time before that, when we first knew that we wanted to come to UA to become heroes. Keep a cool head when you're facing hard situations and remember your goals. You're all going to do great. Plus ultra. Plus ultra. The loudest of them repeated. The others still raised their fists in the air in salute when the loud ones shouted, so Izuku felt comforted that his little speech hadn't been a total dud. The door opened a moment later, and Cementos leaned in to tell them that they would be headed into the stadium in five minutes' time. The tension returned to the room, with Kirishima doing a little last-minute stretching, Yuraka appearing to meditate, and a few others just sitting silently. Izuku was surprised when Todoroki approached him with his usual stoic expression. I just wanted to let you know that I think that I'm stronger than you. Kaminari nearly fell out of his seat. Dude, a declaration of war. Anyone want to take bets on who'll place highest? Minda asked. Maybe you are, Izuku said, unsure of where this was coming from. But strength isn't everything. There are going to be a lot of eyes on you, since you helped All Might beat that Namu at the USJ, but no matter who is watching, I'm going to beat you, Todoroki said flatly. Hey, 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 Kirishima said, hopping up from the floor to mediate. What are you trying to pick a fight for? Especially now, Todoroki shrugged off the redhead's placating hand. We're not here to play at being friends, he said, so that doesn't matter. I don't know why you've suddenly decided to single me out as a threat, but there are a ton of students here that have their futures hanging by a threat. They're all going to be aiming for the top, trying to beat anyone in their way. That includes me. Yeah, Todoroki said, that he turned on his heel and left the room, leaving everyone staring after him. Look at it this way, man, Kirishima said, smacking Izuku on the bad companionably. He's one of the best in the class, and he thinks you're his main rival. In a way, it's a huge compliment. I guess, Izuku said with a shrug. Let's get out there and show them what we've got. Everyone stood and filed out of the room, heading toward the entrance to the field. Izuku made sure everyone was accounted for as he followed them all. 
but he was wondering the whole time what exactly Todoroki had on the line in this competition. Was it just pressure put on him by his hero father, or was there something more? Before he had time to worry about it anymore, the sports festival got underway. With present Mike and Aizawa commentating for the first-year classes, they made an interesting pair, one over the top with volume and enthusiasm, the other quiet and apathetic sounding. Izuku knew that Aizawa cared about his students, but didn't seem like the type to seek out attention in any way. By the time everyone was gathered by the entrance, present Mike had the crowd whipped into a frenzy of excitement, heaping praise upon Class 1 for their performance at the USJ. The other classes got good intros. But even Izuku thought he went overboard, making one out to be much higher than the others. It was going to make them a target, if they weren't already. He could hear some of the other classes muttering about being there to serve as a foil to make the hero course look good. Once all of the classes were gathered, Midnight took over and announced the athlete's pledge, while many of the audience members howled and shouted for the R-rated teacher and hero. Izuku remembered reading about her as he was researching her quirk, and she was apparently the reason that the Hero Association now had a dress code, of sorts. Todoroki Shouto, please come forward. Todoroki's going to do the pledge, Minda asked in surprise. It's probably just because he's so good looking. It's because he scored the highest in the entrance exam, Izuku told him. Highest in the hero course, one of the girls from general studies sniped. Highest in the school, actually, Yeyarazu corrected her coolly. He just barely missed out on getting in on recommendation. Whoa, really? Looks and brains and an amazing quirk, Kaminari said in amazement. Life's just not fair, sometimes. Todoroki ignored them all and climbed the short staircase to the stage, where a microphone was set up. I pledge to do my best to win, he said stoically. You should all do the same. There was silence for a few heartbeats as everyone tried to figure out if he was being arrogant or sincere. His intonation was so flat that it was impossible to tell. So Midnight began to clap, and others followed suit. Soon the crowd was roaring again as Todoroki rejoined the class, looking uninterested in the curious or baffled looks he had garnered. Let's get right to the first challenge, then. Midnight called out with a snap of her leather whip for emphasis. What'll it be? The large electronic screens that were mounted to give everyone an optimal view of events showed a slot machine-like effect, whirling until it settled on two words that took some of the wind out of Izuku's sails. Dungeon Crawl. Some of the students looked disappointed, some excited, but most were baffled. What does that mean? Hagakure asked. In video game terms, it's an underground labyrinth full of dead ends, hidden passageways, pitfalls, monsters to fight and puzzles to solve, Izuku said off-handedly while his mind whirled with possibilities. Then he began to mutter. If there are 20 students in each class, and there are 11 first-year classes, that's 222 kids competing. But the business classes generally don't compete since the festival is an optional event and their work is. Snap out of it, man. Kirishima told him, shaking his arm. We're getting ready to move. He was right. While Izuku had been figuring out logistics and statistics, the rest of the group was hurting toward a large metal square in the ground. That was presumably the entrance to the dungeon. There was no indicator as to which side would open first or whether it would simply raise into the air or flip open or slide. Everyone stood around the area, but left enough space for the door to go in any direction, not wanting to be crushed or pushed by it when it did move. The first student who makes their way through is the winner of the first round. Midnight announced to students and the cheering crowd alike. Ready, go. The metal plate in the ground suddenly fell downward, dropping into Inkai blackness that was impossible to see the bottom of. They heard a distant WHUMP of the metal plate hitting the bottom, sounding as if it had landed on dirt or something soft. The first test had begun. Most of them hesitated, but not Kakin. Izuku watched as the explosive blonde dropped gleefully into the pit and out of sight before anyone had time to even register it. Hirashi and Todoroki weren't far behind, and Izuku knew he couldn't afford to wait, either, any longer, and he'd be fallen on by the rest of the group as they decided to jump. He used a leap with his levitation to get above the crowd and over the pit, then allowed himself to drop. There was hardly any light from above when he landed with a stinging concussion to his legs and feet, but he hurriedly moved against a wall in case anyone else dropped from above. A moment of groping found the entrance to a tunnel, and a brief flicker of light. There was the echo of a crackling sound, and Izuku knew that must be Kakin, using sparks from his quirk to light the passageway. It could also be Todoroki, but he didn't often use his fire. Stubbornly so. Judging by how far ahead the light seemed, it stood to reason that there wasn't much ahead of him until a little way down. He put his left hand against the wall and noted that they were generally smooth, as if cut by machinery, and used the wall as a guide to advance as fast as he dared. He could hear more people behind him, and knew he couldn't afford to waste a moment, so he broke into a run, seeing the faintest hint of light as he rounded what seemed like a curve in the wall. There were lights on the floor at regular intervals on either side of a large cavern with columns of rock or cement jutting up from the floor like a dense forest. 
The light didn't reach the ceiling, nor could the far wall be seen from where he stood. There was no sound of explosions, so Izuku surmised that Kaken wasn't blasting his way through, probably to keep anyone else from getting through easily and catching up to him. Izuku paused for a moment to listen, trying to hear over his own pounding heartbeat and breathlessness. There, a groan of effort, pain, someone was still making their way through. Izuku activated his levitation quirk once more and rose to see if the ceiling was near enough. Was there a reason the lights only shed light a couple of meters off the floor? His hand touched the rough rock of the ceiling, and he crawled forward along it, discovering that the pillars weren't as tall as they seemed from the floor. He crawled straight ahead, keeping focused on the far side, where the light grew dim again. A few of the pillars were tall enough for him to push off with his hands or feet, and that gave him some speed. It became obvious that the passage narrowed again to another corridor, which in the dim light seemed to be only about two meters wide. He allowed himself to drop to the ground once he passed the pillars and entered the corridor, with his left hand on the wall again. Suddenly, he ran full speed into a dead end, and had to curve around back the way he came to find another way. He made it down an estimated 50 meters before he came to a T, branching off in two directions. Damn, which way to go? He stood at the center of the corridor and stepped into the one that bisected it, then clapped his hands loudly. One direction only echoed a single time, while the other echoed several, so that was the path he chose. His heartbeat seemed to echo his steps as he moved forward as fast as he dared. There was another sharp turn, and he ran through a curtain of some kind, straight into a brightly lit room that blinded him for a few precious seconds. It was sheer luck that had him skidding to a stop at the mouth of a deep pitfall that he couldn't see the bottom. The other side was about 10 meters across, and there were three thin wires stretching across the expanse, and three nylon cords dangling from the ceiling. The ceiling appeared to be covered in needle-sharp bristles, similar to porcupine quills. The wires it is, he muttered to himself, bending down to see how taut the one nearest him was. A moment later, he was thanking all the gods and powers that drove the universe for his balance quirk, because the first wire was an illusion. The second one, too. The only one that was real was the one on the far left, and it seemed to sag a bit, but held fast when he tested his strength against it. He took a deep breath and began to walk across. His balance and agility came in handy again and he made it to the other side relatively quickly, only to be forced down onto his hands and knees to get through the next passage. A true crawl. One moment, he was crawling as quickly as he could, and the next, a trap door on a hinge caved downward and dumped him into a strange environment. A ball pit. He asked aloud at first, but he was wrong. These weren't just balls, they were bubbles, tough enough to withstand him landing on them, but rubbery and slightly luminescent. When he gained his feet, he trudged forward, surprised at how much the bubbles resisted him. They came up to his shoulders, but there was only about a half a meter over his head, so he didn't know if levitating and crawling on the ceiling would work. He tried anyway, and was surprised when the bubbles followed him, clinging to his clothes and to each other, causing him to drag them. He spotted a rope ladder hanging down from a hole in the ceiling, and assumed that was his way out. Then he spotted another in the other shadowy corner. It was kind of like trying to navigate a dark space by candlelight. He couldn't tell if there were other ladders to exit by in other areas, so he went with the one closest to him. The struggle to reach the ladder was costing him time, and he was sweating now. He reached the ladder and pulled himself up into the hole, causing one of the bubbles to pinch between his body and the edge of the hole. It popped surprisingly loudly. G.A.H. Izuku cried out. Then he clamped his eyes and mouth shut for a moment as his senses were assailed by the most putrid smell imaginable. A green mist was spreading below him and sinking around the other bubbles when Izuku opened his eyes again. His eyes streamed with tears and his mouth tasted like sweaty feet as he forced himself upward, only to hit a ceiling. There was no latch or seams. A dead end. Damn it. He swore and let himself drop down the floor, intending to try the other ladder. He could hear indistinct voices now, getting closer. He hurried as much as he could, sticking close to the wall until he was under the other ladder. He jumped with a touch of one for all, keeping his hands extended above his head in case it was another dead end. More bubbles burst, but Izuku was through the hole and into the next chamber before he got a whiff of whatever had been unleashed. He felt sorry for the people who hadn't made it this far, yet. It was worrying that he hadn't run into Kaken, Yurashi or Todoroki yet, but there was nothing he could do but soldier on and hope that there were other passages that led through the maze. The next surprise was the floor suddenly sloping down and Izuku finding himself skidding on loose gravel and sinking ankle-deep in what he hoped was water. There was zero light. He reached his hands upward so he could levitate and find the ceiling, but the ceiling was closer than an arm's length above his head. Still, he could crawl just above the pool of whatever and avoid getting soaked in questionable liquid. He allowed his body to levitate until he was horizontal, and began to advance, only to find that the ceiling had been greased. There was no traction. Great. He lowered himself back down to the ground and ran a few meters back down the corridor the way he'd come, counting his steps as he went. 
With a running head start, he levitated back up at the last possible second with a boost in this launch from one for all. He skidded across the greasy ceiling, grunting when he hit uneven patches, until his hands touched a wall. He released his levitation and slid down the far side of the tunnel, landing back into the liquid at ankle depth again. He had no idea how deep it had been, or if anything had been at the bottom, but he wasn't going to worry about it now that it was behind him. He noted that there were rope lights on the floor of the narrow passage again, leading him onward, and he followed. It wasn't until he got a breath of what smelled like fresh air that he felt like he might have actually made it to the end. He could see daylight ahead and sprinted forward, his heart picking up pace as he ran. He could hear cheering crowds from the arena and could make out the shape of a door, then came to a stop at what could only be called a portcullis of heavy steel barring the way. He took a deep breath and charged up one for all. The verdant sparks crackled around him and he drew back his fist, punching the wall next to the gate, making the cement wall holding it in place explode outward. He climbed through the hole and sprinted for the corridor that he could see led to the arena. Above him, Urashi was riding a whirlwind at great speed. An explosion later, and Kaken was right on his heels, as well. Todoroki was right beside Kaken, and they seemed to be smacking at each other with explosions of ice and fire, each trying to slow the other down. Urashi could see what was happening, and sent a gust of wind that sent the two boys tumbling, and almost did the same to Izuku, but Izuku kept his balance and charged after him. The entrance to the arena forced Urashi to leave the air to make it through the gate, and Izuku burst across the finish line without knowing if he had beaten Urashi or not. He just let his body tumble across the cool grass and stared at the bright blue sky while his chest heaved, trying to suck in enough air. Holy crap, man, Urashi said, leaning over Izuku with a wild grin, where did you even come from? Izuku looked up at Urashi and burst out laughing. Mostly it was out of relief, but also partly because the other boy was covered from head to toe in neon-colored splotches of paint. I take it there are multiple exits, Izuku heard a female voice say. Possibly Ye Urazu. Urashi was grinning at Izuku's hilarity and Kaken and Todoroki were shouting at each other, and Izuku finally struggled to sit up. Who won? He asked, looking around at students still pouring through the gate. The judges are watching the replay, because it was so close. Midnight told him, a huge grin on her face. Present Mike was going crazy in the MC booth, and the crowd was a thunderous roar that Izuku had been basically tuning out all this time. But it flooded back when he looked at the giant screen above him that read, Please stand by. That close? Izuku asked no one in particular. Urashi sat down beside Izuku in the grass while they waited, and they compared a couple notes with each other about some of the obstacles. That explains why you stink so bad, Urashi said cheerfully. And why you look like a rainbow threw up on you, Izuku countered. You know, it probably wouldn't have been so close if you had stopped to use the key for that last gate. He pointed out. There was a key. Izuku asked with a puzzled look. That made Urashi bark out a laugh that had all eyes turning to them. Izuku laughed at his laughter, and it began to spread to a few others as if contagious. A few seconds later, present Mike's face appeared on the screen. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a decision from the judges. The preliminary elimination round winner is a tie. Urashi and Asa of Class 1B and Midoriya Izuku of Class 1A. Yes, Urashi shouted in triumph. He jumped to his feet and hauled Izuku up with him, lifting Izuku off his feet in a crushing hug. A hug which left Izuku with splatters of neon paint on his gym uniform and grease all over Urashi's arms. Kaken was cursing up a blue streak and Todoroki simply walked off the field to a water cooler to get himself a drink. The two victors were surrounded by friends and classmates congratulating them and Izuku's eyes scanned the crowd, looking for the box his father should be sitting in. Instead, he saw All Might in his true form smiling broadly at him, and Sir Nidai looking very pleased and applauding along with the crowd, wondering where his father had gone. He let himself be buffeted by the crowd of students while they waited for further instruction. Those with minor injuries, please go to the first aid tent to be seen. Midnight directed, pointing to a white tent with a red cross on it with her flogger. The rest of you will go back to the waiting rooms, where there will be refreshments and replacement clothing, if needed, Cementos told the kids who didn't need any medical attention. He seemed to be looking straight at Yeyorazu, who was wearing a tube top and black biker-type shorts instead of her gym uniform, for some reason. All of the girls were glaring at Maita, and Izuku wondered if he even wanted to know what had happened with that. Staff will be freeing those students who were unable to escape from the maze, and we will resume the festivities in 30 minutes, where the first 50 finishers from the preliminary round will advance. Present Mike told the audience, Feel free to visit the concession stands or stretch your legs while you wait. Izuku was surprised to hear that there were some who got trapped, but supposed it made sense. It was supposed to be an elimination round, after all. For now, he wanted to at least air out his stinky clothes or change them, and rest for a few minutes. Zu, so, Izuku turned around to scan the crowd at the sound of his father's voice. He finally caught sight of his father's green curls, and waited for him to catch up. Zu, so, you are amazing. 
His dad said, slightly out of breath. I'm so proud of you. Izuku ducked before his father could ruffle his hair. I'm not sure what might be in there, Izuku warned. Even with the Teflon, there was some pretty gross stuff. I saw that. There were dozens of screens showing all of the passageways. There were lots of different ways out, but even more ways to get lost or trapped. It was brilliant. His dad gushed. I don't have to ask if this is your father, Ida said, approaching with Yuraka and Yeirazu close behind. Yep, Izuku said with a grin, knowing how closely they resembled each other. Everyone, this is my dad. Dad, this is. We're his friends. Yuraka chimed in with a little wave. I'm Yuraka Achako. I'm Ida Tenya, the speedster introduced with a stiff bow. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'm Yeirazu Momo, she said politely. Please forgive my unconventional appearance. Young lady, I admire the way you handled that situation. You would have been justified in clobbering him instead of just tossing a net over him. His dad said, making Izuku do a double take back at Mainta, who was being shouted at by Jairo, Ashido and Hagakure. Time was of the essence. Yeirazu pointed out wryly. I hate to be rude, but I must excuse myself to go and change. Izuku's dad nodded and waved as she trotted away giving Minto a wide berth. Izuku made a mental note to find out what had happened and see if something needed to be done about the sticky-haired boy. Izuku was class rep, after all. I didn't mean to take time away from everything. His dad apologized to Izuku and his friends. I just got so excited that you won that I couldn't help it. Izuku grinned widely, pleased that his father was having a good time. Yuraka looked like she wanted to pat his father's head, and Ida looked amused. The two of you are amazing, too. Your quirks are so cool, his dad told them. We should get to the waiting room, Izuku said, when the screens overhead began to show students being pulled from pits or unstuck from giant spider webs. His father dashed away then, and Izuku let the chatter of the other kids flow around him as he considered what the next round might be. The waiting room had a small changing area for each gender, and Izuku grabbed a new uniform from the row of lockers with his number on it and rid himself of the foul-smelling one. He splashed some water over his hair and wasn't surprised to see some dirt wash down the drain. The bright side of having a Teflon-like coating was that it only took a few moments to towel his hair dry. Did everyone in our class make it through the first round? Izuku asked as he came back to the main waiting area. No, Yuraka said, looking sad. Ayama fell into a pitfall and couldn't make it out. And no one's seen Koda yet. Izuku bit his lip in worry. I guess there aren't any animals in an underground labyrinth to help. I hope he's okay. He'll be retrieved. Regardless, Yeirazu said, freshly clad in a new uniform. The judges keep track of all individuals, in case they need help. Izuku nodded. That made sense. He looked around the room and saw Minda crouched in a corner, looking traumatized. What happened there? He asked quietly. That little pervert tried to use his hairballs to get a free ride on Yamomo's back, Mina said indignantly, and she had to shed her jacket and pants to get him off. While creepy, it was a viable strategy, Izuku supposed. He was going to ask why everyone was so angry when Yuraka picked up the explanation. Then he got all excited and tried to jump on her again, saying he hoped this time she'd end up naked. Izuku's lip curled in disgust. When Yuraka said the word excited, she had pointed to her own crotch, and Izuku got her meaning immediately. He had the urge to haul Mind out into the hall for a little talk himself. Ada, however, was already on it, and had gone to give the diminutive pervert a long lecture that was probably worse than any beating. I fended him off with a weighted net, Yeirazu said, hugging her middle. But it cost me some time. I'll make sure to give a report to Sensei about it, Izuku promised. That's just wrong, and he should face consequences. So what do you think the next event is going to be? Kaminari asked, joining the conversation and changing the subject. That underground thing was insane. Did anyone else get stuck in that room with the stink bubbles? They discussed some of the things they'd faced in the maze and speculated on what was to come until it was time to regroup on the field. Well, Hiroshima breathed. They emerged to find floating stages filling the center of the arena. There were at least a dozen, all of them at varying heights and widths from the ground. They were all different sizes, and had different features, like the rooftop of a city high-rise, or a grassy field with a pond, one a parking lot complete with cars. They each looked like they had been taken from somewhere else and dropped into the air to float over the school's arena floor, which was covered in a fine layer of red powder. This looks like something out of Super Smash Bros. Siro observed with wide eyes. That's freaking awesome. So it's going to be a melee battle? Yuraka asked, sounding both worried and excited. That's what it looks like, Izuku said. I'm sure they'll tell us. They didn't have to wait long to find out. Ladies and gentlemen, Midnight called out. The cameras focused on her perch on the lowest stage, where she was sitting on a pipe tube that was straight out of a video game. This stage was only about two meters off the ground. Welcome to the second elimination round. 
In this round, our contestants will be attempting to knock each other from these stages any way they can, including using these. She reached down into the pipe to pull out a long pole with padding on both ends that made it look a lot like a giant cotton swab. Don't be fooled by its benign appearance, she warned when the crowd started to grumble. Each of these babies packs a punch with a spring-loaded tip on one end. She dropped the pole on one end, and the impact against the stage caused it to trigger and bounce about three meters into the air. When it came tumbling back down, she caught it deftly and gave it a twirl like a long baton. She pressed the sprung end on the floor to reset it before twirling it again. The other end, she smacked it against the pipe and there was a bright flash and a snap of electricity. The crowd roared in approval as Midnight's hair showed distinct signs of static. Dot 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 will give whomever it hits a short jolt of electricity. Not enough to injure, but possibly enough to incapacitate for a second or two. Each weapon is designed to allow for five charged hits before it simply becomes a battering ram. Kaminari was rubbing his hands together in glee, and Izuku made a mental note to steer clear of him, if possible. Can we use our quirks, too? Kaken called out loudly enough to be heard by midnight. Of course, she said with a purr into her microphone. It's more fun when it's rough. The men in the audience shouted and applauded even louder at the double entendre as Kaken grinned with satisfaction. You are also allowed to move from stage to stage if you're able, she added with a smile. But beware, if any part of you touches the ground at all, you're out of the competition. The red powder you see on the ground will stick to you and be an indicator of whether you touched. But it is also a shock-absorbing substance that will help cushion anyone who falls from an unsafe height. Several students shuffled backward to ensure they wouldn't touch any red before they even started. To begin, there can only be four contestants on each stage, maximum. The ten students who finished first will have three minutes to choose a stage to start from. The next ten will then get a chance. Then the remaining thirty will take their places in the remaining spots. There are lighted circles on each stage to indicate starting points, and that is where you will pick up your weapon. When the lights turn green, the battle begins. The contest ends when 40 students have been eliminated. The last 10 will advance to the final round. Once Midnight had finished her explanation, a ramp lowered down from the first stage to the edge of the grass. Ladders on tiers above then dropped down from one stage to the next, which overlapped or came close to the next tier down so that it resembled a giant, hollow wedding cake in shape. There was one small stage at the top with barely enough room for two people, then three stages on approximately the same level with each other in a triangular pattern around the top, but about three meters down. Those looked like they could hold three people, but it would be a close combat situation. Below those was six more stages of varying sizes in an offset circle, and then six long, narrow stages at the bottom in another triangular setup. The bottom ones were the ones that would be easiest to be forced off of, because they were only about two and a half meters wide. This could be tough, one of the kids from 1B muttered, looking concerned. Izuku wondered what his quirk was. Anyone with decent reflexes and physical fitness at least stood a chance of getting a place in the final round. The biggest threats were going to be Urashi with his wind, Kaken with his explosions, and Todoroki with his ice. If he could avoid those three, he felt like he had a good chance, but was there any chance that Kaken wouldn't come after him to eliminate him? Not good. Those of you who placed in the top 10, choose your starting place. Midnight said. In an instant there was a series of explosions as Kaken headed straight for the top stage. Hirashi gathered a whirlwind to lift himself up to one of the topmost stages, as well. Izuku ran up the ramp and then levitated, choosing a spot in the upper six stage tier, planning on facing off against some of the students who had finished lower in the rank of the first round. Avoiding the strongest was a valid strategy here, if he could eliminate enough to whittle down the numbers. H.I.'s levitation could help him avoid touching the ground, as long as he didn't get caught in a wind. This stage had quite a few columns and poles jutting up from the floor. There were bars similar to those he'd used in gymnastics class. Something that resembled a pommel horse, but without the handles and pairs of rings hanging staggered in a row, like monkey bars, almost. A parker setting, perhaps. There was no padding on the floor though, and no place to land softly. The entire stage was about 5 meters, and a ragged circle shaped as if it had been ripped out of an urban park or something. He tightened the straps on his gloves as he searched for where he should stand. He found one of the four lighted circles and stood in it, where it blinked once and made a quiet chime to indicate it had been chosen. He picked up the padded staff, which was heftier than he expected it to be. There was a tiny lightning bolt painted on the handle under one of the pads, and a spring pictogram under the other. Easy enough. None of the first ten chose the same stage as him, and three minutes after the first, the next ten were allowed to take their places. Again, none of them chose his stage. The final thirty were allowed to move then. And that was when two other contestants took places near him, each a few meters away. He heard the chimes as their rings accepted them, but then heard a third, though no one seemed to be standing on it. Malfunction, or Hagakure. Hem, the weapon didn't move. 
and Izuku kept his eye on that spot while the countdown began to wind down. The size of the platforms meant that not all of the circles would be occupied, so it was possible that it was just an indicator that all contestants were in place and everything was locked down to start. As soon as his ring turned green, Izuku took no chances and lunged for the empty ring and felt something solid. He got a grip on what felt like an arm and spun in a fast circle. Oh, a girl's voice complained as one of the contestants advanced on Izuku and got hit by an invisible girl for their trouble. While the attacker was reeling back from the blow, Izuku flung Hagakir toward the edge of the platform, hearing her shriek as she went over the edge. If luck was on her side, she'd manage to hit a stage below and continue her fight. If luck was favoring Izuku, she'd miss and tumble to the ground. Izuku didn't have time to contemplate on it, because the other two who were on the platform were engaged with each other at the moment. He could barely hear present Mike shouting out the numbers of those who were out as he quickly retrieved his own weapon and Hagakir's. He flipped them so that the lightning bolt on each was facing forward and swung his arms out wide, bringing them together to hit the other two fighters in the backs of the legs taking them by surprise and stunning them. He flipped one of the staffs and jabbed one of the fighters in the chest while his legs were buckling, causing the spring to engage, giving him a hefty shove over the edge of the stage and out of sight. The second boy he'd hit with the jolt of electricity was faster to recover and advanced on Izuku with his own staff. Izuku danced on the balls of his feet and waited for his attacker to charge. He waited until the boy's weapon was in range, then used the spring end of his remaining pole to launch himself in the air. On his downward drop, he slammed the staff onto the boy's arms, making him drop his own weapon. Izuku dropped his staff and wrapped his arms around his opponent, holding his torso immobile. The boy kicked at his shins and even tried headbutting Izuku, but it didn't do him any good. Izuku simply heaved the boy off of his feet and walked to the edge of the stage. He flung the boy outward and saw him land on the stage below, which wasn't that far of a drop. Before Izuku could decide whether to go down or up, two more fighters dropped from stages above, and another sprung up from below. The one who had sprung up was Tsuyu, but she seemed intent on traveling upward past the stage, so Izuku didn't pursue her. The two that had fallen immediately tried to climb back up to where they had fallen from. Izuku waited until one was halfway up the rope ladder on one side then just pulled with one for all on the rope until it snapped. He had intended to use the ladder as a sling to throw her off the stage, but she got tangled in it and fell down. A quick glance told Izuku that she hadn't been lucky enough to land on a stage below. No you don't. Izuku spun to find Yuraka behind him, and nearly levitated to get out of her reach, but she had slapped the hand of the second person who had fallen. He had been trying to sneak up on Izuku, and Yuraka had sent him floating. Izuku grinned and leaped up to give the floating boy a hard volleyball-type slap that sent him out past any stage. Iraraka released her hold and let him drop into the sea of red below. Thanks, Izuku said. You saved me. Ten of us can make it to the final round, she said. It'd be cool if they could all be from 1A. Yeah, Izuku said. Wanna pair up for the rest of this? Nah, I'm on my way to the top, she said with determination. Wanna give me a boost? Izuku crouched so that Iraraka could put her foot in his threaded fingers and then use her quirk on herself. A moment later, she was soaring upward to the next level of stages. Izuku was suddenly inundated with a large group of contestants from the lower and adjacent stages, and was considering abandoning ship to another stage when he had a thought. He backed up to the edge of the stage he was on, leaving a couple of meters to be safe. He had fighters approaching from every direction, though most of them were distracted by each other as they sought to unbalance those around them. Izuku took the opportunity to really charge up one for all. He added a little levitation until he was about three meters up, his head almost brushing the underside of a stage above. Hey, why's he glowing? One of the girls on the stage asked warily as the green sparks flared. Izuku balled his fists and let himself drop like a rock, slamming his fists onto the floor of the stage in the process. As he had hoped, the stage listed down under the pressure of his blow, and the other end shot up like the bow of a sinking ship. His arms stung as bodies came tumbling past Izuku who had to quickly levitate again to keep anyone from trying to take him down with them. He knocked his head on the underside of the stage above again, but it wasn't hard enough to injure him. He watched in amazement as the end of the stage he had hit dipped to knock two of the lower stages off balance, sending several kids over the edges. A couple had to leap to keep from being crushed. The end that had hit the stage above had also caused a few to fall. Izuku ran up the slope his stage now created and used it to jump onto one of the stable ones. Maybe he could unbalance another the same way. Just then, he realized that he was facing Kakin, who had come down a level, and that Urashi was on the other stable stage slightly below, but adjacent. Todoroki stood on the remaining stage, which he had iced over, with glistening icicles hanging from the edges. Crab! Kakin was just about to attack when a loud horn sounded and the crowd broke into a deafening cheer. We have our ten finalists. Present Mike shouted frantically. Can you believe it? 
These 10 powerhouses took down 29 of 40 classmates in just 37 minutes. Izuku could hear the rumble of Aizawa's voice making a reply, but couldn't make out what was being said. He'd made it. He had a feeling that most of the tougher opponents had been taken out by the others, but that didn't matter in the long run. He turned to look at one of the screens, which was practically at eye level, and saw the names and pictures of top 10 finishers. Urashi Inasa Class 1B, Midoriya Izuku Class 1A, Todoroki Shouto Class 1A, Shinzo Histoshi Class 1 Degrees Celsius, Bakugu Katsuki Class 1 Degrees Celsius, Asui Tsuyu Class 1A, Uraraka Achako Class 1A, Hiroshima Ijiro Class 1A, Siro Hanta Class 1A, Shizaki Ibarra Class 1B. Dang, I thought I got a lot more. Uraraka pouted as the stages lowered closer to the ground for easier dismounting. I would have gotten more if I'd started at the bottom, Urashi reflected. I'm pretty sure the stages were moving around, Kirishima said as they reached the grass. Just because the area below was clear one minute, didn't mean there wasn't another stage there the next. I think you're right, Izuku said with a nod. We might have tossed a lot off our stage, but then they landed safely or were able to climb back up and someone else knocked them off later. Someone else? Siro asked incredulously. You took out, like, four of the stages with one hit. Izuku blushed and scratched the back of his head. Sorry, don't be sorry, Hiroshima said, wrapping a companionable arm around his shoulders. That was cool as hell. A few of them were scraped up, but none of them were seriously injured, thank goodness. Izuku hoped that none of the competitors who had fallen or been thrown off had been injured, either. There was one girl there with what looked like thorny vines for hair, and he wondered if she was able to control them. That might explain how she kept herself from falling off any of the stages. The other finisher looked familiar to Izuku, and it took him a moment to realize that he had been one of the kids who had come to the Wana classroom to pick a fight. We'll be taking an hour break for lunch and such while the field is cleaned up. Please feel free to enjoy some of the field games or rest and relax until the final round. Midnight told them once they were all on firm ground. You're allowed to go to lunch rush for food or hit the concession stands. But you must be back here in one hour or forfeit your spot. Got it. Yes. They all answered in unison. I'm going to go find my dad, Izuku told the others. See you after lunch. Izuku waved to the others and darted around a group of reporters before they could close in on him. An hour wasn't all that long, and Izuku wanted to be sure to get a bite to eat before the final round to keep his energy up. He fought his way through the surging crowd, many of whom tried to stop him to congratulate him on his performance. Many wanted to know exactly what his quirk was, but he just smiled and shrugged. He finally spotted his father, who was looking at the signs on the walls saying where the participants' waiting rooms were. Dad. He called over the heads of the crowd. His dad squinted into the sea of people who basically dwarfed his son, but finally spotted him and waved. Izuku reached him a few moments later, and led the way to the waiting room for 1A. It was unsurprisingly empty, since most of the others were off getting lunch or playing on the field. His father was holding a shopping bag that was full of festival food, and he set it down on the table and started handing his son containers of yakisoba, okonomiyaki, and all sorts of other snacks. Not the healthiest, I know, but I knew you'd be hungry. You didn't manage to eat much for breakfast. It was true. Izuku had been far too nervous to eat more than a few mouthfuls of rice and some miso soup. Now he was ravenous and dug into the greasy food with gusto. While he ate, his father described how the latest event had looked to bystanders. When you hit that stage and made it go almost vertical, every screen in the arena focused on you, his father said with obvious glee. You looked so badass with the green sparks flying around you. Everyone was asking who you were and where you'd come from. It was amazing. Izuku grinned at his father's enthusiasm and wondered if All Might and Sir were just as impressed by Izuku's performance, or if they saw the flaws in his thinking or movements. He knew that he would likely have to go over his performance with them, and with Aizawa and his class to critique it, but for now it was nice to have his father's appreciation and attention. Look, Zu, his dad said as Izuku plowed through the food like a starving man, I know you feel a lot of pressure to perform well today, and you have been, but I want you to know that even if you don't win, you've done incredibly well. I'm really proud of you. Thanks, Dad, Izuku said, getting a little choked up by how sentimental his dad was being. Your mom would have been very proud, too. She was always telling me how you pretended to play as All Might save people from the clutches of evil. Now you're actually training to do just that. She was a hero, too, his dad told him, dabbing at his eyes with a napkin. And the reason you get to be here today. Then I'd better do my best to make sure I deserve that, Izuku said with determination. They cleaned up the remnants of the meal, and Izuku walked with his dad back to the entrance of the field where they parted ways. There was some sort of scavenger hunt going on as he went out to the field, and the floating stages and red powder were now gone. 
For some reason, the girls in his class were dressed as cheerleaders and beating on Kaminari and Minta with their pompoms. Izuku pinched the bridge of his nose as he had often seen Sir Nidai do when he was feeling tested by the nonsense happening around him and finally understood why. He had a feeling that some of the boys in his class were a little too focused on the female anatomy for their own good. He might have to have Sensei intervene before one of the girls seriously maimed one of the boys. One of the support students won the scavenger hunt. And everyone cheered as she was given a large bag full of sports festival swag as a prize. The girls had finished delivering their punishment on Kaminari and Minta and had disappeared, presumably to change clothes before the final event. There was some sort of entertainment in the middle of the field that was keeping the crowd entertained, but Izuku was too nervous to pay attention. The last event would have him facing off against the strongest students in first year, two of which he didn't know the quirks of. Are you ready for this Midoriya? Uraraka asked as she appeared behind him a short while later. She was back in her normal gym clothes and looked as nervous as Izuku felt. I don't know, he admitted. Any idea what quirks Shinso or Shizaki have? Shizaki has vine ropes for hair, and she can make them grow or retract at will and whip them around like crazy. I got swiped with one of them, and it scratched my arm up pretty bad. Recovery girl fixed it super fast, though. Shinsu, I don't know about. He's the guy with the hair, right? Siro asked, coming up behind them. He mimicked an explosion around his head to describe Shinsu's hair, and Izuku nodded. No idea what he does. He doesn't look very intimidating, but he outlasted all those others, so he must be able to do something interesting, Siro guessed. Maybe Bakugu knows. They're in the same class, aren't they? I don't think he'd tell us, even if he does know, Izuku said doubtfully. Right now, we're rivals, and his spot in the hero class is on the line. That's true, Siro realized thoughtfully. You think he'll make it? Maybe, Izuku said. He's definitely strong enough, and his quirk control is amazing. That's pretty much what he's being judged on today, so he has a fair chance. I don't know how many people he's been up against who are as good as he is, but Urashi is no joke, and neither is anyone in our class. Do you want him to come back? Uraraka asked. I don't know, Izuku said thoughtfully. I guess that depends on if he's learned what he needed to, so he could satisfy Aizawa. I think it's ultimately up to him. He must think Kakan's got the potential, or he wouldn't have given him this chance. I guess, she said, though she didn't sound convinced. Have you seen Ida? Izuku asked, trying to remember when he'd last seen the deputy class rep. I know he made it through the first event, and I'm pretty sure he ranked high enough for the second, but I haven't seen him. He left, Kirishima said, walking up to the small group. He left. Izuku and Yuraka both said together. Why? Izuku wondered if Ida had been ashamed of not making it to the final event and had left to lick his wounds. That didn't seem like his style, though. I dunno. He got a phone call just after the first event and took off. Said something about a family emergency. Oh, no. Yuraka said, putting a hand to her mouth. I hope everyone's okay. Only something really bad would make him miss out on the sports festival, right? Izuku was afraid she was right. He was about to reach for his own phone when present Mike started shouting for the final 10 contestants to take their places in the middle of the field. There was a raised circle about 40 meters across. It wasn't raised much, less than a meter, but there was nothing besides a white chalk line to mark the edge of it. There was a small set of steps leading up to it, but most of the competitors ignored them and simply hopped up onto the dirt circle and met Midnight in the center. Ladies and gentlemen, Midnight announced to the roaring crowd, Our final event today is called... The screens around the arena did the slot machine effect again until it stopped on the words. Flag tag. Izuku looked at the other contestants to see that they were also somewhat confused. Flag tag. That was a game they used to play in P. In primary school, where you pulled other kids' flags from a belt, and then if you got yours pulled, you had to go do five jumping jacks to get back in the game. There was no winner or loser, really. I'll explain. Midnight announced. She pulled a belt from a box at her feet that had three flags attached to it by Velcro. Each flag was about 45 centimeters long and the belt and its flags were a bright, neon orange. Each player will wear one of these, with all flags visible and accessible at all times. Each player will have different colored or patterned flags. The first player to get one each of all ten different flags will take first place, then the second and then the third. Gameplay does not stop until there are three winners. A winner will immediately leave the ring once recognized by the judge. Anyone who steps outside of the ring for any other reason is automatically out. If a person still possesses all of their own flags when they get out, the number required to win will decrease by one per person. No one may destroy any of the flags or throw them out of the ring or they will be disqualified. Quirk use is allowed and encouraged. While she spoke, there was a simple cartoon being displayed on the screens giving a demonstration of how it would all work for the audience. Izuku thought this was going to be way harder than anyone in the audience could imagine. There were only three of any given color and one player had to get one of each of them to win. 
he would have to protect his own as well as seek out others. He couldn't really use levitate much, because both Yuraka and Yurashi could both also do basically the same things with their quirks. Yurashi could easily blow them all out of the ring if they weren't careful. He could try to pound the ground again, like he had with the floating stages to see if he could knock people out of the ring. But his arms still ached from the first time, and he knew there was some bruising that would make its way to the surface before long. He couldn't camouflage his clothing because they weren't made of plastic, and there wasn't really anywhere to hide, anyway. Knowing that Ciro wanted banana milk wasn't going to help him, either. Each of the competitors were directed to stand on small platforms that rose from the ground, equidistant from each other at the edges of the circle. Izuku could see Cementos crouched, with his hands on the ground beside the ring, creating the short pillars. Each was barely as tall as a shoebox, but marked very clearly where they should start from. Izuku looked to his right to see Ciro who gave him a little wave and said, No hard feelings when I win, right? Izuku rolled his eyes and looked to his left to see Uraraka. Both of them were a threat, but Izuku deemed Siro to be the most threatening of the two in this instance. Siro would need to be taken out quickly. He might regret the choice later, but for now, he wanted to reduce the number of flags he needed to collect. He charged up one for all, and when the horn sounded for them to start, Izuku leapt at Siro. He went in low and swept Siro's feet out from under him, ducking under the line of tape that the other boy shot at him. He rolled Siro over his shoulder and tumbled him out of the ring. Siro yelped and tried to use his tape to grab onto Izuku, but it slid right off of his arms thanks to Teflon. His balance kept him from tumbling out of the ring too, and he launched himself backward in a handspring just as a figure tried to ram him out of the ring as well. Izuku barely heard present Mike shouting that Siro and Yuraka were already out. It seemed that Kirishima had blindsided Yuraka at the start. Izuku was busy balancing on Kirishima's back, where he'd landed after the redhead had tried to bulldoze him a second time. It took a bit of maneuvering, since Kirishima was trying to shake him off. Izuku kept one gloved hand twisted in the back of the other boy's shirt as he reached down and snagged one of the flags from the redhead's belt. He used levitation to jump off without getting caught, and slapped Kirishima's flag beside his other dot 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 too. Someone had gotten one of his flags without his even noticing. How? Now that the initial rush of first moves was over, everyone had paused to take a look around and try to plan their next move. That was a mistake. The ground under everyone's feet suddenly erupted into ice and Izuku wasn't the only one to freeze up to his ankles or mid-calves. Izuku punched the ice to free himself, cutting up his knuckles in the process, then began to quickly snatch flags from those trapped and attach them to his own belt, just as Todoroki was doing. Kakan blasted himself free and took advantage of the same opportunity, as did Shizaki, even though she was still trapped. She sent her vines to snag flags free and return them to her. Izuku waited until Todoroki was trying to get close to Kakan without getting a face full of explosives before using pull. There was a series of ripping sounds as several flags came flying at Izuku from all directions. He reached out to try to catch as many as possible but Yurashi, who was up to his knees in thick ice, caused a whirlwind that caught most of them up and blew them straight toward his waiting hands. Izuku tried pull again with limited success. Then Kakin, angry about having all of his pilfered flags, and his own, stolen from him, charged Izuku, breaking his concentration. Izuku managed to dodge repeated explosions by hopping around the field, careful with his backward leaps to stay in bounds and out of reach of the others while doing his best not to fall on the ice. There was a lot of twisting, flipping and dodging as they wove around, each trying to outperform the other. Kakin had gotten scarily good at maneuvering around with his quirk, and it was all Izuku could do to keep ahead of him. Shizaki from 1B is out of bounds, present Mike said excitedly. This is crazy. She just handed all of her flags to Shinsu from General Studies and walked right off the field. Maybe the pressure was too much for her. Izuku wondered what that was about, but was more worried about getting away from Kakin who seemed to be trying to get him both out of the ring and take the flags. He was saved from whatever Kakin had planned by Kirishima, who was blown into Kakin from the side by a gale-force wind. They both went tumbling over the dirt and ice, and Kirishima didn't quite stop himself in time. His foot crossed the line at the edge. Izuku quickly used pull to steal the flags on Kirishima's belt as present Mike announced he was out. The air was full of blowing dust and flying chunks of ice, making it hard to see. Izuku was taken completely by surprise when there was a sudden slab of jagged ice holding him from neck to toes. Todoroki was using his earlier trick of trapping opponents to steal their flags, but there was a flaw in the plan. If that was his plan, because Izuku's flags were frozen with him, since no one could steal from him without breaking him out of the ice, Izuku took a moment to see what was happening. Todoroki was fending off Kakan at the moment, and Yurashi seemed to be shouting something at Shinsu. Then something weird happened. Hirashi pulled all of the flags from his own belt and was holding them out toward Shinsu. What the heck? Shivering, Izuku burst out of the ice with one for all strength. 
He ran forward and put a little one for all into his pull to wrest the flags from Yurashi's grip and into his own. Yurashi cried out, and Izuku knew he'd probably caused a friction burn on the poor guy's hand, but this was a contest. He slapped the flags onto his belt and turned to face Shinsu, only to have present Mike stop him in his tracks. We have our first winner. Midoriya Izuku from Wana has all seven flags. Midoriya, please step out of the ring and proceed to the waiting room. Midoriya moved on automatic, stunned to hear his name. He pulled off his belt and saw that while it had a couple of doubles, he had at least one of each. Kaken and Yurashi were both shouting something, but the crowd was too loud for Izuku to hear what they were saying. At the edge of the field, Midnight stood smiling at him. Good job. I'll double check your belt and make sure the extras get back into play, she said, putting her head close so he could hear over the din. He wasn't sure how that would happen, but was sort of in a daze of surreality as he was guided by cementos toward the corridor. Izuku felt himself being pounded on the back, and people shouting congratulations at him. He was still processing everything that had just happened. Had he really just won the sports festival? Seriously? He half expected someone to jump out and say it was all a joke. He could feel a smile creeping over his face as he pictured his dad. Going wild in the stands over this, he made it easily to the waiting room, since there were very few people not watching the final four battle over second and third place. The corridors were completely empty except for the heroes on duty. Their eyes were on the screens, though, caught up in the excitement themselves. He opened the door, surprised to find that it was pitch black inside. Then a hand reached out of the darkness and dragged him into it. Looks like my fishing trip was a success. Shigaraki Tamura crowed, holding Izuku's upper arm, carefully not using his pinky finger, but squeezing with a punishing grip. A cloth with a stinging, yet sweet smell was pressed to Izuku's face. Just breathe, little hero, Tamura told him, or I'll disintegrate your arm off. Izuku knew he could pull free if he really tried hard enough, but could he do it before he lost an arm? He wasn't sure. The adrenaline of the situation was making him take fast shallow breaths as he tried to stave off panic and think. Kurajiri, summon the dock. Izuku didn't hear any more as the blackness of sedation washed over him. He revived slowly, wondering how much time had passed. He could hear a door slamming and footsteps approaching as he opened his eyes and struggled to sit up. Huh, he's already awake. Izuku was still groggy and Tamura grabbed his arm in another vice-like grip and forced him to his feet. He was slightly unsteady, but became more and more alert by the second. Shigaraki Tamura, Kirajiri said sternly. I agree with him, and I must repeat my earlier warning that this is not advisable. Shut your warp hole, Tamura told the man, who was standing nearby. I'm sick of the old man going on and on about this brat. Izuku had turned transparent, but neither of the villains seemed to notice or care. They simply continued to argue back and forth until finally Izuku realized that they were talking about him. He heard a door open nearby, and some sort of strange, high-pitched noise blaring. The door slammed and the noise muted to nothing again. What's so great about him? So he has a bunch of quirks. So what? So does Sensei. He doesn't need this NPC. He shook Izuku as he said it, sounding a bit crazed. This did not seem like something the villains had exactly planned out. Izuku's teeth rattled as his head bobbled, but he stayed as still as possible, knowing that Tamura's quirk was quite deadly. He was working to puzzle out what was going on. How long had he been out? There was a sound of static then, and a flickering light in the dimly lit room. Tamura, what have you done? Came a low voice through a fuzzy television screen near dot 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 the bar. The voice was vaguely familiar, and behind it, the high-pitched noise returned, only through the screen instead of the open door. Izuku began to breathe again, simply because his lungs were screaming for oxygen. He looked around to see if Dr. Tsubasa was also nearby, but all he saw was a run-down bar, with a few tables and chairs, and stools lined up in front of the serving counter. I brought you a present, Sensei, Midoriya Izuku. Since he's all you seem to talk about lately, I knew you'd be so glad to have him here. Why not give him a few more quirks, even though I only have one? Tamura raged. I'll bring him down to you, and you never have to. No, the television voice was harsh, sounding labored, and it triggered something inside of Izuku. It was all for one. He was alive. He hadn't died facing All Might. He was. Where was he? Shigaraki had just said down. What did that mean? Was this bar on an upper floor, or was it a more general term, like downtown? Izuku's heart began to thunder and his whole body began to tremble with something indefinable that made him feel like he was going to explode. Fear. Yes. Confusion. Yes. And so. Much. Rage. But first, Tamura was rasping. I'll make him pay a bit for what All Might did to you. You can't really need all of him, can you? Tamura, get that boy out of here. All for one was ordering, commanding, desperate. You're not using your head. Think about what, why. All you do is talk about what a great asset he is and how fortunate it is that you found him. Let's see how he handles this quirk. Oh, so impressive. If only he was more malleable. Well, now he's here, Tamura said in a mocking, sing-song tone. Isn't it wonderful? He has it. 
He said for yourself that All Might gave it to him. Take it back. Then you can give it to me. You fool. Kirajiri, remove that boy at once. All for one grated out, sounding hoarse and out of breath. No, Tamura shouted, gripping Izuku's arm tighter. Not fair. Not fair. Not fair. Izuku felt warm all over, and the green sparks of one for all began to web over his skin. There was suddenly a burning pain where Tamura was gripping him, so Izuku jerked away and punched Tamura once, twice in the face with lightning speed before using his free arm to slam into Tamura's forearm to knock it away. There was a loud snap, and Tamura's arm was broken and hanging at an unnatural angle. Izuku jumped back from the man who had been gripping his arm, seeing that his own was dripping blood everywhere from Shigaraki's quirk. There was shouting from Kirajiri and possibly all for one and screaming from Tamura, but Izuku couldn't focus, because the pain in his arm and the pressure building inside of him were reaching a crescendo. Just as Izuku thought he might lose consciousness, there was an explosion that radiated from inside of him that seemed to throw out tendrils of blackness like shrapnel. It blew Tamura and Kirajiri back across the grimy floor. Tables and chairs splintered and tumbled back into the walls. The television fell from the cabinet it had been sitting on and the screen went blank. The door of the place splintered and blew outward, leaving an exit that Izuku needed to take, but was too stunned to. Get out, Kirajiri said. Go. A warp gate opened in the floor, and Izuku didn't even question where it would take him. He simply jumped into it and let himself fall. Almost anywhere would be better than here. He'd figure out what he would do if he ended up somewhere awful once he got away from this awful place. He wasn't sure what he'd been expecting from the experience. Maybe a short time in the void of space between here and there. Instead, he fell through a curtain of blackness into the brightness of sunlight. The landing could have been worse, all things considered. Izuku dropped into the grass from where the warp gate opened, about a meter above the ground. The tear in the air vanished as soon as Izuku was expelled from it, and left him gasping on the ground, clutching his wound, which stung intensely, like a burn. There was a scream from nearby, and then pandemonium broke out as Izuku was surrounded on all sides by people. Where have you been? Was that Ashido shouting at him? He's hurt, get recovery girl. That sounded like Kirishima, but his eyes were still adjusting to the brightness. Was he really back at UA? How long was I gone? Izuku asked, blinking repeatedly and getting to his feet with the help of many gentle hands helping lift him off the ground. He's here. A voice shouted. He's hurt. He came out of nowhere. Midoriya. Thank the gods, Aizawa said, still wrapped like a mummy, but managing to look concerned. Anyway, where's all this blood coming from? You've been missing for at least an hour. More people were arriving and he was being guided from the competition field where he had apparently been dumped to the corridor inside the arena walls. Pounding footsteps had Izuku turning to look behind him, and he saw his father and Sir running toward them, their eyes full of relief and worry. See you, his father shouted, actual flames flying from his nose and mouth in spurts. What happened? Hirajiri, Izuku ground out over the pain. That set off a burst of conversation, shouted orders and telephone and radio calls from the adults around them, while the other students looked confused and scared. Kirajiri, isn't that the creepy guy from the USJ? One of the kids asked, how did you escape? Sir asked him, briskly stepping forward and lifting Izuku firmly into her arms as if he weighed nothing. He began to stride purposefully through the corridor toward the exit, with Aizawa in the lead, growling at people to quit gawking and move out of the way. His classmates were trailing behind, all looking worried and baffled. I didn't, he told Sir, knowing everyone was listening, despite the chaos around them. Kirajiri opened a warp gate thing for me and told me to get out of there. Sir looked at him sharply, and his father looked bewildered. He aided your escape. Sir asked. The important thing is to get that arm tended, Aizawa told him. He pulled the door to the school open with bandaged hands and held it with his back so Sir could carry Izuku through and his father could pass. Then he blocked the door with his body. The rest of you should go home for now. Izuku heard him, and the other students' immediate protests as he was taken down the hallway to recovery girl's office, probably leaving a trail of blood in their wake. He tried not to wince too much as every stride caused a jolt of pain. She urged Sir to put him on a waiting bed, and Izuku gaped at the amount of blood covering Sir's suit once he'd done so. He realized that Sir had been using his own body to keep pressure on the wound while he carried Izuku inside. What happened? Recovery girl demanded as she pressed a clean towel to Izuku's arm and quickly bound it in place. I got touched by a guy with a disintegration quirk, Izuku said, relaxing when she gave him a shot of something that eased the pain almost immediately. Izuku's father was literally breathing fire at this point, gripping his son's other hand so tightly, Izuku thought the bones might crack. He looked at his dad with the best smile he could muster. His voice was still shaky as he tried to reassure him, knowing that the worst part still needed to be revealed. It's okay, now. It's not, his dad denied, shaking his head, but managing to bank the flames down to puffs of smoke. How did this happen? How could it? When I opened the door to the waiting room after I got the flags, there was a warp gate waiting on the other side. 
I thought the room was just really dark, but then a hand grabbed me and dragged me in. By the time I realized it, it was too late. Where were you taken? Sir asked. I'm not sure, Izuku answered, trying to picture the place in his mind. A bar of some kind. It looked old and dirty. There weren't any windows, and there wasn't anything on the walls. No pictures or posters or anything. The door flew open then, and All Might in his true form burst into the room looking frantic until he spotted Izuku. Sir, his dad, Aizawa and Recovery Girl all turned to see who had come in. Aizawa's capture weapon had started to float into the air, but fell back to his shoulders when he recognized the newcomer. Detective Tsukachi entered a couple of moments later at a more sedate pace, also looking relieved to see Izuku. He shut the door behind them. Let me get the boy settled before you start pestering him. Part of his arm is just gone, recovery girl said brusquely. Then I'll heal him as much as I can, but he's going to be asleep almost immediately after, for a good long while. Izuku tried not to focus on the as much as I can part of that as she hooked him to an IV drip to hydrate him and added a hefty dose of B vitamins to it to help him start generating more blood cells, or something. She explained it all as she handed him a bottle of orange juice and told him to try drinking it while she cleaned him up a bit. The blood mostly just wiped off his skin easily, but that meant that it went everywhere else, instead. She cut off his jacket and undershirt so it wouldn't disturb his arm, before telling the men in the room to ask their questions quickly. I'm giving you ten minutes, she said sternly, turning away to type on her computer. Tell us what you can. Izuku, sir prompted. Izuku did. He replayed as much of the scene in his mind as possible, and told them everything he remembered. Sir and All Might both looked extremely shaken by the realization the All for One was still alive and his father began spitting flames again. Aizawa was silent, simply observing everything going on, as if he was a fly on the wall. The fact that there was such urgency to get Izuku away says that all for one was very nearby and that he's in very bad health, Sir surmised. Do you have your phone, Midoriya? He didn't. He patted his pockets, but they were empty. They must have taken it. Excellent, Sir said. We can track it, even if it's not turned on. Your time is up, Recovery Girl announced, shooing the heroes and the detective out of the way. She didn't wait to see if anyone had any protests, and stepped forward and kissed Izuku's shoulder. A wave of tingles traveled up and down his arm. But it wasn't unpleasant. The sleepiness was actually welcome, as exhausted as Izuku was from such a long, exciting day. I'll be right here, his dad told him as he started to drift. Rest well, young Midoriya, he heard All Might say, feeling a soft ruffle of his hair. Then his eyes were too heavy to hold open anymore, and he allowed himself to be swallowed by the embrace of healing sleep. Izuku woke up warm, comfortable and really, really needing the bathroom. He opened his eyes to see that he was in his own bed, in his own room, with no recollection of ever being moved there. He threw back his blankets to find he was clad only in his boxer shorts. He slid his feet into slippers and shuffled down the hall to the toilet, then realized as he was washing his hands that his arm was working properly. His elbow felt stiff and a bit weak, and there was a neoprene-like brace on it that had slid down his arm in his sleep to reveal bright pink skin where his arm had been destroyed by Tamura. Izuku tugged the brace all the way down to examine the damage in the mirror. It actually wasn't as bad as he imagined it would be. The pink area was centered on his upper arm, extending almost to his shoulder and down to just under his elbow, and wrapped all the way around his arm, but obviously hadn't penetrated all the way through, or he'd be looking at a stump instead of a scar. Maybe being punched in the face had made Shigaraki loosen at least one of his fingers, to stop the progression of the deterioration. Zu, are you awake? His dad called from the direction of the living room. Almost, Izuku called back. Need to get dressed. Feeling okay. His dad allied back. Pretty good. Izuku called, hungry. He shuffled into his room and slipped on sweatpants and a t-shirt before emerging again. He found his dad in the kitchen, attempting to cook something. The rice cooker was open and there was a bowl of warm rice next to it, waiting. It's not much, his dad said when he heard Izuku come into the room, but I can at least get you some vegetables and rice. Thanks, dad, Izuku smiled fondly. What his father knew about cooking could fill about a half a page. Even with all of the times Izuku and Granny Ito had tried to coach him, his mind was always somewhere else, and he ended up burning whatever he tried to make. The fact that he was even trying was a testament to how worried he had been. Izuku kept a careful eye on the vegetables in the pot which were probably just about done, and fetched an egg from the refrigerator. He cracked the egg over his rice and stirred it in, then sprinkled some furicake cake on it for extra flavor. His dad successfully tipped the vegetables into a bowl and brought it to the table for his son, and sat across from him while Izuku dug in. Sir was able to track your phone, but it didn't lead to a bar. It had been smashed and tossed in a dumpster. Izuku scowled. He'd like that phone. He salvaged the chip or whatever from it, and he said he would have a replacement for you by this evening. Izuku nodded and managed to thank you around a mouthful of rice. There is some good news, his father said. They were able to tell where your phone had been, and they found the general area you were taken to.
they did find the bar, but by the time they got there, it had been recently abandoned. There was a cellar there that looked like it had been a storage room that was converted into some sort of hospital room. There were some things left behind that suggest it, anyway. It's possible that all for one had been there, and that he was in bad shape. It would explain why he seemed so desperate to get you out of there. You might have been inadvertently draining him just by being in the same building. Then why would Shigaraki take me there? Is he trying to kill all for one? Izuku asked, puzzled. Who knows? From what you told us, Sari, he doesn't exactly sound well-adjusted and sane, does he? Wait, Sari, what day is it now? Izuku asked, casting his eyes around for a clue to what the date was. It's Monday, his dad said with a shrug. Recovery girl said you might sleep for a couple of days. Since your arm was so damaged, she fixed you enough to get everything under control, then let you rest for a while, then she had to do a little surgery, nothing extreme. It was just to make sure the bones and muscles were reconstructing themselves properly. Then she healed you again to speed up the recovery for that. But sleep was just your body recharging after being sped up to heal so quickly. Well, I feel good now. What time is it? I could still make it to school. Not today. After what happened, the school cancelled for today to put more security measures in place. Izuku sighed and sat back in his chair. That can't be good. I mean, first villains attacked the USJ. Then they managed to get into the school, sort of, during the sports festival. That could have been a disaster. What if they'd wanted to plant bombs or something like that? All of those people, so many of them important heroes. Believe me, you're not the only one worried about that. The press has been having a field day with it. Izuku's heart sank. He hated knowing that the trouble that followed him everywhere he went was tarnishing the reputation of the school. It wasn't really their fault that one of the most evil villains to ever live was interested in him, and now they were facing a whole load of trouble for it. He wished he had his phone, so he could check the headlines immediately. His classmates were probably freaking out, too. Would the school see him as too big of a liability and ask him to withdraw? Is there anything else I need to know? He asked, thoughts spiraling in all directions. I should probably check in with my class and sir and all might, too. Also, was there any sign of Namu there with all for one? I've been in touch with sir and all might, his dad said. They've been checking in regularly to see how you're doing. But they're also busy trying to follow any tiny little clue about that bar you were taken to and where they might have gone. No sign of Namu that anyone told me about. Izuku nodded. I hope they find something good. Me, too. His father agreed. You go ahead and contact your classmates. I've got work to keep me busy. He pointed to his folded laptop and a briefcase on one of the kitchen chairs. Izuku retreated to his room, flexing his arm up and down as he attempted to ease some of the stiffness in his elbow. The brace he'd slid back on kept making a slow descent toward his wrist, and he wondered if the support people who had designed his costume could figure out a way to make something that could stick to him. Otherwise, he'd have to rig up some sort of over-the-shoulder strap to hold it up. He opened his laptop and logged into the group chat, which blew up the second his username popped up. Midoriya at Freckles has joined the class 1 a chat. Hiroraka at 0G's Midoriya. Zero at Stickman Midoriya. Ashido at Asidrip Midoriya. Takoyami at Darkness X2 Midoriya. Minta at Stickaballs Midoriya. Ayama at Sparkles Monami. Kaminari at Zipsap Dude. Hiroshima at Roxolid What the Heck, Man. Hagakure at Behind You Midoriya. Midoriya at Freckles who changed my name to Freckles. Hiroraka at Zero G's never mind that. What happened to you? Midoriya at Freckles lots of stuff. Got snatched by a villain. I'm fine now. Hiroraka at Zero G's Midoriya. Zero at Stickman Midoriya. Ashido at Asidrip Midoriya. Takoyami at Darkness X2 Midoriya. Minda at Stickaballs what? Ayama at Sparkles don't joke. Kaminari at Zip Zap WTF. 1. Hagakure at Behind You Spill It, Broccoli Boy. Ashido at Asidrip has changed Midoriya at Freckles to Midoriya at Broccoli Boy. Midoriya at Broccoli Boy seriously? Ashido at Asidrip SR Sly. Now dish. What happened? One second you had won the Sprouts Fest the next you were gone. The set up the winner pedestals and you didn't come out and D'Evrion freaked. Midoriya at Broccoli Boy long story short. The villains from the USJ opened a warp gate in the waiting room and pulled me in. The white hair guy didn't plan it too well and when things started to turn out bad they sent me back. Kaminari at Zip Zap started to go bad how? Minda at Stickaballs did you kick their butts? Midoriya at Broccoli Boy kind of. Something weird happened, and there was an explosion or something. Not sure, but they freaked and let me go in case I did it again. Now that he thought of it, Izuku had no idea what had caused the explosion that had blown Kirajiri and Shigaraki back and wrecked the bar. It was like his emotions had just blown up out of him in a shock wave or something. He would have to talk to his dad about it. He chatted with his classmates for a while longer, being as vague as possible with explanations about what had happened to him. He asked about Ada, but no one had been able to reach him. That was unlike him, and Izuku quickly did an internet search but didn't find any news about the Ada family. Whatever had happened hadn't made the news, or hadn't made the news, yet. 
He felt uneasy about it, and wondered if All Might or Sir might have any insider info they could share. He heard the door buzzer sound and hopped up to see who it was, so his father could keep working, but his dad beat him to it. Sir's face was displayed on the screen, and his dad pressed the button to let him come up to the apartment. Everything alright with your friends? His father asked as they waited for their guest. I guess, Izuku shrugged. They changed my name to Freckles in the chat, and then to Broccoli Boy. It's what I get for letting Ashido be in charge of setting it up. As an admin, she can do what she wants, I guess. His father laughed at that, and it was a good sound to hear. It seemed like a long time since either of them had really laughed. You do kind of need a haircut, his father said ruefully, ruffling his son's hair. You haven't had a chance to go out and do normal things like that in way too long. Maybe there's someone at school who can do it, Izuku pondered. Ashido seems like the type who likes to do makeovers and stuff. If they screw it up, I can always just cut it really short. My hair grows fast. In fact now that he thought of it, it was so long that he could probably grab a handful of hair and put it into a stubby ponytail if a rubber band would hold it. You're a braver man than me, his father joked. There was a light knock on the door at that point, and Izuku opened the door and welcomed Sir and All Might into the apartment. Niceties were quickly disposed of as they all moved to the living room to sit down. How are you feeling, my boy? All Might asked Izuku as he settled into an armchair. Practically as good as new, Izuku assured him. My arm's a bit stiff, and I'll probably need to work the muscles back up again, but it could have been worse. All Might looked pained at that last part, but nodded. I'm sorry this happened. You didn't do anything wrong, Izuku said with a shrug. I mean, I don't think anyone could have predicted what happened. It was Sir's turn to look pained. He coughed into his hand to clear his throat. I didn't mean, Izuku felt horrified by his own insensitivity. It's fine, Sir said. I understand. The truth is, I considered looking into All Might's future for the festival, just to make sure nothing would go amiss, but I felt like it would be a sort of cheating if I actually saw the results. The security was increased to five times its normal level, and I personally looked over the plans for ensuring your safety. So there was no reason for you to expect any danger, Izuku reason. I mean, who'd be crazy enough to stage an attack at an event full of pro heroes, right? I won't be making that mistake again, Sir said firmly. I will be using foresight to check any large events you're involved with. That goes for planned field trips, too. I won't try to interfere if I look in the future and see you're fine. But if you aren't, I don't care about my quirks track record. We'll move heaven and earth to change the cards to favor us. Izuku didn't put up an argument. It was hard hearing that there would be even more restrictions put on him. But he understood why it was necessary. He was also incredibly touched that Sir and All Might were willing to fight fate itself for his sake. I think our main focus should be in finding and incarcerating Kirajiri, All Might said, looking grim. If we have him in custody, we take away all for one's key mode of transportation and sneaking around. Once he's taken out of the equation, young Midoriya could have a semi-normal life without worrying about being taken at any given moment. Agreed, Sir said. Until he's caught, his father added. You don't go anywhere alone when you're away from home. Always take someone with you. An adult. Also, always carry this, Sir added, taking a new phone from his pocket. It was the newest model of his previous phone, and looked far more sturdy than Izuku's last phone. It has an improved tracker in it, and it has a military-grade case, waterproof, shock-resistant, and will stand up to intense heat or cold. Izuku took the phone and noted that it was definitely heavier and bulkier than his last phone, but not unmanageable. I've already had your information transferred from the remains of your old phone as much as possible, so you shouldn't have too much trouble making the switch, Sir said. I won't spy on you with it, but it is one of the best tools for us to use to find you if something happens again. The old one could only give us the general area. This tracker has much better accuracy. I don't think all for one will dare to try to take you again, but there's no telling what Shigaraki will do. Izuku had learned that firsthand. Any questions? Only about a dozen, Izuku said dryly. Such as? Sir asked patiently. What about the Namu? Was there any sign of any more at the bar or hideout or whatever it was? Do you think they have more of them? What even are they? If they have more, where are they keeping them? Uh, well, in all of the commotion, I see we failed to tell you what we've learned about the Namu, Sir said. All might seem to shift uncomfortably in his seat, making Izuku feel uneasy as well. From the examination of the remains of the Namu from the USJ we learned some disturbing truths. Sir told them, adjusting his glasses before continuing. It seems it is something like a version of Frankenstein's monster. Izuku tried to think of what he knew of that story, and shuddered. Dr. Frankenstein used pieces of corpses to build it. Precisely, it seems that on the whole, it was once a man who was experimented on, either before or after his death, and had the DNA of four different people inside of one host. They're unsure if the Namu developed quirks as the result of the experimentation, but it's more likely that all for one stripped them of their quirks before the doctor began his genetic manipulation. 
then reintroduced the quirks he believed would aid them in their cause. It was an artificially created life form that was essentially brain dead unless given a direct order from the person in command of them. It had no autonomy, no emotion and no idea of any difference between right and wrong. Benamu, literally translated, is no brain. Izuku felt slightly sick at the thought of anyone being experimented on that way. He was only slightly comforted by the fact that it apparently had no sense of self, and that whatever had made it what it was, was absent. He'd basically killed it, after all. Did it make him a bad person if he saw it as a mercy to it, that it was now completely dead? Everyone in the room seemed to be staring at Izuku, gauging his reaction to this information. I'm not sure what to think about all of that, he admitted. I have a lot of conflicting feelings about it. What? How? Why? As long as none of those feelings is guilt. All Might told him, we're probably on the same page. Even if, as Shigaraki implied, they used you in some way to achieve its creation, you are in no way at fault. Izuku nodded slowly. He understood that. He did. It was just hard to accept. Those whose DNA we identified were all criminals of one kind or another, likely lured in by all for one with promises of strength or wealth or other kinds of power. There's no way to be sure they weren't willing participants in the project. It's horrifying, no matter how you look at it, but just reinforces how imperative it is that all for one and his followers be stopped. Izuku noticed that his father had tiny tendrils of smoke beginning to form from his nostrils and sigh. This was so hard on him, and he tried so hard to be supportive all the time. What about the school? Izuku asked in an attempt to shift the subject and calm his father. My dad says they're taking a beating by the press. That's to be expected, All Might said with a sigh. It's what the press does. Let those in charge of that handle the public relations and put their spin on it. You'll likely be in the spotlight because it's obvious that you were the one who was taken. We'll do our best to keep you from having to face anyone from the press directly. Are you sure the school doesn't want to cut its losses and kick me out? Izuku asked, holding his breath as he waited for the answer. All three men looked shocked at the very idea. Izuku released the breath in relief. Absolutely not. The fact the villains are so afraid of you shows us we're on the right track in training you to be a hero. All Might said firmly, it's their duty to see you safely through, not throw you to the wolves at every sign of trouble. Izuku nodded again, knowing he'd be thinking about it for a long time. Are there any other questions you need answered before we move on? Sir asked, oh, yes, did they finish the last event of the sports festival, or did I ruin everything? Izuku asked as an afterthought. He was amazed none of his friends had brought it up. They all stared at him for a moment before nodding. We didn't discover you were gone until it was time to award the medals, All Might said. Urashi won second place, and Bakugu won third. Third, there was no way Kakin took that well. And Todoroki didn't place in the top three. That wasn't good, especially after he'd made a big show confronting Izuku about beating him with his superior strength. So, do you think that means Kakin will get to come back to the hero course? Izuku asked. That will be up to Aizawa and Principal Nezu. All Might said, I think they'll judge his overall performance and attitude since he was sent to general studies and make an assessment based on that. What about Shinsu? He said that he was aiming for a spot in the hero course, and that those who didn't perform well in the sports festival could be moved out to make room for general studies students who excelled there. I'm not sure of the rules on that, Sir said, but he is certainly an interesting young man. His quirk is very subtle, and could be an incredible asset in hero work. I never did find out what his quirk is, Izuku said with interest. From my observation, it seems to be some sort of mind control, Sir said with a small smile. I'll be looking into it to find out more. Mind control. Izuku had so many questions. That's a matter for later. I would like to know what exactly exploded when you were being held by Shigaraki. There was strange damage to the bar, but no evidence left behind to explain it, Sir said. Before you were healed by Recovery Girl, you said something about an explosion, but it didn't make a lot of sense. We didn't ask for further details because of your condition and your need for rest, but now we'd like you to clarify. I'm not really sure I can, Izuku confessed, thinking back to the incredible pressure that had built up inside of him. I remember being scared, and really, really angry and in so much pain that I couldn't think. I punched Shigaraki a couple of times to get him to let go of my arm, and I hit his arm to keep him from grabbing me again. I'm pretty sure I broke his arm. One for all was crackling around me, even though I don't remember deciding to use it. That makes sense so far, All Might encouraged with a nod. Izuku's father put a hand on his son's shoulder to ground him in the present while Izuku relived it in his memory. That's when it happened. I felt like I was going to pass out, or throw up, or both. Everything inside me was just boiling. All for one being alive. The shouting and the pain and the confusion and the blood all felt like they were all causing pressure to build up inside of me, and when it got to be too much, it just went. Boom, boom, Sir asked with raised eyebrows. Boom, Izuku confirmed. There was just this kind of pulse that pushed out of me in every direction. And there were black streaks shooting everywhere, but I couldn't tell what it was, and it disappeared right away. 
Maybe I imagined them. The force of it blew out the door, wrecked the tables, and knocked back Kirijiri and Shigaraki. That's when Kirijiri opened up the hole in the floor and told me to go. Very strange, sir mused. I wonder if it's some kind of new quirk we've never learned about, because you've never been in a situation dire enough to trigger it. Um, the USJ was pretty dire, Izuku pointed out. Yes, but those were slightly different circumstances. There were others there to help, and you had some modicum of control over the outcome of things. At the time, sir pointed out, well if having part of my body disintegrated is what it takes to trigger it, then I hope I never have to use it again, Izuku said with a huff. There's not really any way to find out for sure without a duplication of the event, is there? All Might asked. We're not doing that, Izuku's dad said with finality. No we are not, sir agreed fervently. At this point, it's just a theory anyway. Unless something similar happens again, then we can look at it more closely. It's puzzling, but not a high priority. Right now, we need to focus on finding out where they've taken all for one, and locating and capturing Kirijiri. Do you have any other questions for us? All Might asked. Just one, Izuku said. What do you call a boomerang that doesn't come back? All Might and his father looked completely baffled by the sudden change of subject. Sir simply smiled serenely, knowing that this was Izuku's way of letting him know that he really was going to be fine. What? His father finally asked, sounding as though he didn't want to ask. A stick, Izuku said with a weak grin. His father rolled his eyes. And All Might looked at Sir as if to say, I blame you for this, Sir and All I Might left shortly afterward. And Izuku cooked himself and his father a large meal for dinner and went to bed early. Thankfully his night was free of nightmares. The following day ended up being grey and rainy, and Izuku was surprised when Ida was just passing through the gate when his father dropped him off in front of the school. Ida was covered in a rain poncho, with galoshes large enough to accommodate his extra-large calves. Izuku wondered if it was to avoid getting water in his engines, but missed the opportunity to ask when Ida greeted him. He lifted his umbrella over his head and called out to Ida. Good morning, Midoriya. You're here earlier than usual. One should always give oneself extra time for their commute on days with inclement weather. There are bound to be delays in transit on days like today. Ada's voice sounded as robust and chipper as usual, but there was something missing about him. It wasn't anything he could really pinpoint, but he seemed a little too. Ida, alike, over the top, even for him. Izuku fell into step beside him, having to jog a bit to keep up with the other boy's longer strides. Yeah, Izuku said, eyeing him warily. That, and recovery girl wants to see me before class starts to give me a checkup. He didn't mention that if the press had been waiting, his father had been prepared to drive him around back to the staff entrance. Perhaps the early arrival, mixed with the bad weather had been a blessing. Ida paused briefly. Are you alright? I'm fine, Izuku said, waving it away, then speeding up as Ida resumed walking. I'm more worried about you. There's nothing to worry about, here, Ida said, slicing the air in a way that called to mind an umpire calling a runner is safe. Ada, you left the sports festival before the second event, even though you could have advanced. Then you didn't answer anyone's texts or join the group chat. Uh, yes, there was a family emergency. My brother was injured while on duty and in the hospital. I rushed to be with my family, but he's out of danger now. I hear congratulations are in order. You won the sports festival. What a splendid. That's not important. Izuku insisted as they reached the school and paused in the entryway to hang their wet things on the hooks there. Your brother was injured. I didn't see anything on the news. I looked, because I was worried when someone said you had a family emergency. The fact that Ida seemed to know that Izuku won, but not that he's been kidnapped set off alarm bells. Ida was usually the best informed of anyone when it came to news having to do with the school. If he brother was truly alright, would he be so out of the loop? Your concern is very touching, Ida said, actually looking like he meant it. My family asked that it be kept quiet for a couple of days so we could determine how serious his injuries are and prepare for the onslaught of media attention. They'll likely make an announcement later today. But you say he's out of danger. Izuku pressed. Yes, of course. I wouldn't be here, otherwise. Ada said, not sounding as convincing this time. Didn't you say you needed to see Recovery Girl? I do, but... Are you sure you're okay? That's really scary to go through. If you want to talk about it, I have some experience in scary things. And I'm a good listener. Izuku asked. Not able to shake off the idea that something was still bothering Ida. I really do appreciate it, Midoriya, Ida said. I'll let you know if I decide I want to talk about it. It doesn't have to be me, Izuku said. But I'm here. Thank you. Now, please don't neglect your own health to worry about me. I'll see you in class. Try not to be late. As class rep, it's up to you to set the example for the rest of the class. Izuku smiled, because it seemed like Ida wanted him to, and nodded. I'll try. He watched Ida stride stiffly toward the stairwell and didn't go to Recovery Girl's office until Ida was out of sight. This will scar, unfortunately, Recovery Girl told him. It will probably fade over time, but for now, this is as good as it's going to get. 
I'll take a scar over a stump, any day, Izuku said with feeling. He'd explained to her about the brace on his arm slipping down, and she promised to look into it. But in the meantime she pinned a piece of gauze to the top of one side of the tube of neoprene and looped it over his opposite shoulder before pinning the other end of the gauze to the back of the tube. It didn't look great, but it was at least effective at keeping it up, like a pair of suspenders might hold up pants. Once he put his shirt back on, it wasn't even visible, though it did feel weird. She advised him that long sleeves with the brace over it was probably the best answer for short term. Once he got a clean bill of health and instructions to wear the brace, especially when exercising, he went back to class with time to spare. Most of the students had arrived early to check on Izuku and Ada, and since Izuku hadn't been there when they arrived, they'd crowded around Ada to find out what had happened. Izuku could see he was in the midst of telling the rest of the class the same story he'd told Izuku. He was interested when he saw that Yuraka didn't look convinced by his upbeat attitude, either. Once Aizawa arrived, they settled down, especially when everyone noticed that he had Kaken with him. To the casual observer, he looked defiant and unapproachable, with his slouch and having his hands jammed in the pockets of his sagging pants and his trademark sneer. To Izuku's trained eye, he looked slightly embarrassed and uncertain as he came into the room, his eyes darting around to try to gauge everyone's reaction. Starting today, Bakugu is restarting the hero course, Aizawa said blandly. Welcome back, Kaken, Izuku told him loudly enough for everyone to hear. I've got the notes for anything you missed. Kaken locked eyes with Izuku and nodded almost imperceptibly. He moved to take his seat, and Kirishima spoke up, too. His voice wasn't its usual loud and enthusiastic tone, but it wasn't mocking or unkind, either. Welcome back, man. Nice job at the sports festival. Welcome back. A couple of others muttered, possibly a little grudgingly. You should join the class group chat, Mina whispered to him, even though there were two rows of seats between them. Settle down, Aizawa said with disinterest. First things, first, Midoriya, since you missed the medal presentation, I have your medal for safekeeping. You can see me after class to collect it. Izuku nodded, somewhat surprised when Bakugu turned in his seat to look at him inquiringly. Where were you, anyway? Got snatched by villains, Izuku said. I'll fill you in later. Kaken's eyes widened at that. But he turned back around in his seat and paid attention when Aizawa started talking again. Izuku glanced back to where Ida sat and saw him looking confused. Maybe about the news of Izuku missing the metal presentation. Today you'll be doing something very important, Aizawa announced. The door slid open instantly, as if Midnight had been waiting outside for her cue. Choosing her hero names, she cried out as she came in. The class broke into excited cheers at this news. Consider your hero name carefully, because while it can be changed later, some names will stick and you'll be stuck with them. Right, Eraser. The class's eyes shifted to their teacher, who was stepping into his puffy, yellow sleeping bag. He paused, as if thinking about something, then shrugged. I'm terrible at this sort of thing, so I'll leave you in Midnight's capable hands. She'll help you decide if what you choose is appropriate. This is who they chose to decide appropriateness. Izuku whispered to himself in disbelief. Next to him, Siro snickered. Midnight handed them all whiteboards and dry erase markers to write with, then returned to the front of the room. Your hero name should be something personal. That inspires you and tells others what kind of hero you want to be, she told them. I'm sure most of you have been thinking about this, at least since you got accepted into UA. Izuku's mind went into panic mode. With all of the training and pushing himself to get this far, he hadn't really thought about what his hero name should be. At least, not since he was a little kid, back when his mother was still alive. He had vague recollections of playing heroes with her and thinking up all sorts of variations of All Might so he could be just like his favorite hero. That seemed a little childish and unrealistic, now. His mother had even called him Small Might a few times as a hero name when they played, but there was no way he could go with that, even to honor her. He cast his eyes around the room, feeling increasingly nervous, but then noticed that not as many people were as busy scribbling out their answer as he expected. Ada was staring blankly at his whiteboard, lost in thought, and so were a couple of others. There was some low talking around the room, as others discussed it. Does anyone want to go first? It was silent for a few moments before Ayama stood and made his way to the front with a flamboyance and self-assurance that Izuku found both odd and was somewhat envious of. Then he flipped his whiteboard for everyone to see, and Izuku's mouth dropped open. He could hear quiet murmurs around the room as they all read what he had written. I cannot stop twinkling. He'd even embellished it with doodles of stars with rays of light around them. What the hell is that about? Kaken said quietly to himself. Izuku could only agree. It wasn't a name, it was a sentence. Come, Midnight said, apparently unfaced. I see what you're going for here, but... She took the whiteboard and began erasing and rewriting as she spoke. If you remove this, and change this to a contraction by putting an apostrophe here. There, that's better. She turned the sign back toward the class and showed them that it now read. Can't stop twinkling. How was that any better? Still Izuku supposed he had at least thought of something. 
The rest of the class seemed as incredulous as he felt, staring in disbelief. Ashido jumped up next and bounced her way to the front. I'm the acid shooting hero, alien queen. Izuku didn't mean to facepalm so hard that others could hear the slap, but he couldn't help it. Like the American horror movie. Too grotesque. Try again, Midnight told her brusquely. Ashido's lower lip jutted out in a disappointed pout as she went back to her seat. May I go next? So you asked politely. Surely she wouldn't choose something bizarre, Izuku thought. The girl with the frog-like quirk had always seemed very pragmatic and outspoken. This is a name I picked out when I was younger, but I've always liked it. She turned her card, which read, Rainy Day Hero, Froppy. The class as a whole breathed a sigh of relief. That's perfect. Friendly and approachable sounding. Midnight approved. Tsuyu took her seat, looking pleased and relieved. After that, others seemed to find their courage or think of names they liked, because they strode to the front one after the other. Shouji was tentacle. Jiru decided on earphone jack. Ashido tried again and got approval for Pinky. Then Kakin got up and strode to the front, slamming down his card to show everyone. Izuku facepalmed again, dragging his gloved hand down his face to cover his mouth. King Explosion Murder. Even the handwriting looked violent. Izuku sighed. That's not going to work, Midnight said flatly. What? Kakin groused. Then, fine. He flipped the board around and erased something. Then flipped it show. Lord Explosion Murder. No, Midnight said in immediate rejection. Why? Kakin demanded angrily. Because it has the word murder in it. Izuku finally suggested, breaking the disbelieving silence. Yeah, that's a villain's name, Kirishima ventured. Go with something fun. Like Blasty. Shut up, weird hair. Kakin told him rudely. Kirishima just grinned. Explodey. Kaminari teased. There were a couple of other teasing suggestions. Just because it was funny, then Midnight sent him back to his seat to rethink. Kirishima was the next to reveal his, which Midnight recognized immediately as paying homage to the pro-hero Crimson Riot. Red Riot. Kaminari seemed confident in his choice of chargeable, which Izuku thought was pretty cool. Todoroki seemed to be completely apathetic when he held up his sign to show them his. Shouto. Izuku was getting a headache. Yuraka was extra pink-cheeked when she revealed her hero name, Yuravity which Izuku thought was both clever and cute, which matched her personality. Ajiro followed with the apt tailman and then Takoyami revealed his, Tsukayomi, both of which Izuku approved. When Ida finally went up to the front, he was excited and interested to hear what name he'd come up with. But Ida looked stoic as he flipped his car and it simply said, Tenya on it. Another one, Midnight asked as if in complaint. I think those of you using your actual names are going to end up regretting it. Luckily, this isn't necessarily a permanent choice, so there's still time for you to change it. Yeyarazu chose Kreati for her name, which was well-received, and Hagakir's invisible girl was predictable, but adequate. Minda earned approval with grape juice even though it sounded a bit weird to Izuku. He remembered then that he meant to talk to Aizawa about Minda's behavior at the sports festival. The very shy Kota seemed extremely relieved when everyone liked Anima and Sato went with Sugar Man which was cool, since his power relied on the strength that Sugar gave him. Once Siro chose Cellophane, they were almost finished. Just two left, now. Midnight said, sounding expectant. Izuku cringed as all eyes turned to him, and also Kakin, who was rethinking a name that didn't include the word murder. The, I haven't really been able to decide, Izuku demurred, but I've narrowed it down a bit. Come on up and show me what you've got, Midnight suggested. Maybe we can help you decide. Just go with Broccoli Boy. Kaminari called out as Izuku made his way up to the front. Almost everyone laughed, including Kakin who had gotten his share of teasing earlier. Even Midnight gave a little chuckle and the good-natured encouragement. Izuku nervously showed Midnight his board, which had three names written on it in tiny letters. Hum, she said as she read them silently. Then she pointed to the middle one and said, None of them are bad, but I think the meaning of this one might confuse people. Izuku used his marker to strike out the name, Tribune. This one is also good dot 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 so good that it's already taken by another hero, though he lives in the United States, and not Japan. You could still use it, especially since he's not super well known. Izuku studied that one. Not quite ready to strike it off, yet. What about the last one? I like it. It's powerful sounding and forthright. That one gets my vote. Izuku nodded, still not completely sure, but comforted by the fact that it didn't have to be his permanent hero name. It could just be a placeholder, for now with a deep breath and wiped Tribune and Beacon from the board, then turned it to face the class before he could change his mind. Vanguard? Sato read out loud. Vanguard? Duraraka repeated, testing the feel of saying it. I like it. Good one, Midoriya. Jiru said approvingly. Izuku shot a glance over to Kakin, who for once didn't look derisive. He looked, impressed. There was a first time for everything, Izuku supposed. Bakugu. Midnight said as Izuku took his seat after his hero name reveal. You're the last one. Have you come up with something? I need more time, he said, sounding sullen. 
That's fine, but don't wait too long, or the press might give you a name of their own for lack of anything else to call you on the news, Midnight warned. Kakin nodded with a slight scowl that seemed to be more directed at himself than anything. All right, kiddos, Midnight said with a smile and a wave. My job here is done. Aizawa stepped out of his sleeping bag and gathered his papers. I know you're all excited about being back after the sports festival, but you still have your regular classes to get through, as well. The door opened again, and present Mike stepped into the room with a cheerful smile. Good morning, listeners. The rest of the morning was spent going over English, math, history and other subjects required for them to pass as a high school. Izuku dutifully took notes on everything, including everyone's chosen hero names. It felt good to write his own, but he wondered what All Might would think of it. Would he think that Izuku should have consulted him first? Had All Might chosen his own name, or had the previous holder of one for all helped him decide? He supposed he'd find out soon enough. When the time came to go to lunch, Izuku stood and stepped up to Kakin's desk, offering him a packet of papers. What's this? Kakin asked, taking them with a frown. The notes from last week. And a rundown of the attack on the USJ, Izuku told him simply. The stack had Izuku's and Ida's cell phone numbers, and information about the group chat handwritten at the top. Let me know if you have any questions. He didn't wait for a reply, instead hurrying off to join Yuraka and Ida for lunch. They were joined there by Yurashi and Tetsu Tetsu. A few minutes later, Tsuyu joined them as well. Kakin settled at a table next to theirs, blatantly listening in. Hiroshima and Kaminari dragged Ashido over to join Kakin's table and while he looked somewhat annoyed, he didn't protest. The main topic of discussion, of course, was Izuku's disappearance after he finished the final event of the sports festival. Izuku gave them a slightly edited and abbreviated rundown of what had happened, and tried to downplay how utterly terrified he had been. He made it sound like an unknown explosion had taken place that the villains had blamed on him and that was what made them want to be rid of him. It wasn't a lie, exactly. But he did his best to make it sound like he had no idea where the explosion had originated. That's way different than what they reported on the news I saw. Irashi said excitedly. They just said you mysteriously disappeared. And that police had been called in to investigate. There were rumors that you'd been kidnapped and stuff, but none of it came close to what really happened. They were saying you were being held for ransom. Let's try to keep it as vague as possible, Izuku said. The school doesn't need any more bad press. Izuku winced at a sudden sharp pain as something smacked into his head, just behind the ear, and turned to see a kid from 1B smirking and holding a cafeteria tray. The corner of the tray must have been what hit him, and Izuku rubbed the spot more in annoyance than pain. Can't class want to do anything without causing drama for everyone around them? The boy asked with a loud voice. Bug, Monoma, don't you have better places to be? Tetsu Tetsu asked his classmate. What's your problem? Hiroraka demanded. Kaminari had gotten to his feet. You all think you're high and mighty because you got to fight villains. And your golden boy won the sports festival, Monomise. And you couldn't even finish the festival without attracting villains and inconveniencing everyone and disrupting everything. He had obviously been eavesdropping at least a little. Izuku was wondering if he was supposed to feel intimidated by this obnoxious newcomer. And, Izuku asked with a raised eyebrow. Monoma looked confused. What do you mean, and... I assume you're going somewhere with this, Izuku prompted, turning to face the boy. What's your point? Villains cause trouble. That's what they do. They especially tend to cause trouble for me, in particular. So I'm here in the hero course to get stronger and learn how to defend myself and others. Why are you here? Buuin, Kaminari said gleefully, proving they had an audience beyond their table. But you're putting others in danger, Monoma argued. A dot 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 and oh, your rock countered. The villains are doing that. Not only that. But no one but Midoriya was in any danger from those villains at the festival. Are you suggesting that every single hero there, including All Might could have failed to keep us safe if the villains had done anything more than take one student? A student that messed them up so bad that they sent him back to get away from him. Ashido chimed in. Wait, what? Monoma asked, looking confused. The news just said that the student was returned safely. I thought a hero had. Do you really think any hero out there wouldn't take credit for getting a kidnapped student back? Their name and face would be all over the news. That would mean a serious paycheck, too. Izuku was stunned that Kakin was the one to point that out. But, Monoma, just quit while you're behind and go eat your lunch, a red-headed girl said from behind him, holding up a stiff hand, sort of like Ida tended to do. Izuku recognized her as 1B's Kendo, who was their class rep. Her quirk enabled her to make her hands huge, and it was really cool. Izuku hadn't talked to her much, but she seemed very capable and nice. Monoma startled when he heard her voice. And when he noticed her hand he looked as if he'd seen a ghost. I was just causing trouble for 1A, she finished sternly. They're being ridiculous. Go. Monoma scurried off as if the devil was nipping at his heels. Sorry about him, she apologized. Vlad-sensei has been bent out of shape that your class has been getting tons of attention. 
and Monoma gets riled up on his behalf. The rest of us know you're not trying to show off. Thanks, I guess, Izuku said. She smiled and walked away and Yurashi shuddered. She's scary. Tetsu Tetsu nodded. The casual chatter resumed, as people realized the show was over and went back to their lunches. Scary how? Suyu asked. Before either of them could answer, Yeyarazu spoke up from a table behind theirs. Ida, I just heard about your brother. I'm so sorry. Is there anything you need that I can help with? Izuku could swear Ida's shoulders sagged just a bit, and defeat flashed in his eyes for just the briefest of moments before he straightened again and put on a mask of normalcy. Thank you Yeyarazu, but I am fine. My family is dealing with this, set back as best we can, and have called in the finest experts to see to everything. But they said, Yeyarazu began uncertainly. Yes, I know what they're saying, Ida interrupted, softening his tone when he realized he'd snapped a little. We're working to remain optimistic, and I must do my part by not worrying them any further with truancy or endangered grades. Of course, Yeyarazu said with a nod, though her eyes were full of concern. If you'll excuse me, I've finished my lunch and need to see to something. Ida left the cafeteria with a ramrod straight back and his head held high, but looking very stiff. Izuku met Yeyarazu's eyes and mirrored her worry. Yuraka looked sad, as well. What happened to his brother? Yurashi asked in a tone that was quiet, for him. I just checked the news. An ingenium was attacked by the hero killer, Stain, Yeyarazu said, turning around in her seat to face the others. Jiru, who had been sitting beside her, did the same. If they hadn't found him when they did he would have died. Everyone got quiet at the news of how serious it really was. That's probably why he left the sports festival early, Kirishima murmured. There were quiet murmurs of agreement. There's more, Yeyarazu said. The news is saying that his spine was severed. And he's lost all feeling from the chest down. Damn, Kaminari said sadly. That seriously sucks. Izuku's heart had jumped to his throat, then sank to his feet. Ida had given no indication that his brother had been in such serious condition. Izuku had just assumed that he would be in recovery for a long time. This, this was something permanent. Life-changing. Ida hadn't chosen a hero name earlier. And it made Izuku wonder if he was having second thoughts about becoming one himself. The Ida family had been in the hero business for generations. But this might put an end to that. He hoped he was wrong. Ida was an amazing person with a strong quirk, perfect for heroics. Ida was back in his usual seat, looking composed as he waited for everyone to return from lunch. Izuku, as class rep, made sure everyone was accounted for and that the board was erased and ready for its next use. He slipped into his chair just as Aizawa entered. Today's basic hero training class will be spent discussing the sports festival, he told them. But first, I have the lists of offers for your student internships. There are several of you who have offers from very prestigious agencies. It will be up to you to decide the pros and cons of each opportunity. And choose one. For those of you who didn't receive any offers, there is a list of 40 contracted agencies or heroes that will accept students for you to choose from. Again, research them and choose one that best suits your goals. You have until the end of the week to decide. Remember that internships last one week, so take that into consideration as well. Izuku and Ida helped distribute everyone's lists, while Aizawa wrote on the board, showing that Izuku, Kaken and Todoroki had the highest number of offers of the class, and the numbers dropped off sharply to double or single digits after that. Yeyarazu got the highest double-digit number, and Yuraka and Tsuyu weren't too shabby in that department, either. They all had a lot of decisions to make. Izuku wasn't surprised to see the Might Agency at the top of his list and wondered how many others from the school had been offered an opportunity to learn under Sir and All Might. There were also quite a few others that interested him. From there, they went over footage from the sports festival. The footage had been edited so that they watched how students cleared each major obstacle, instead of following individual students through the complicated maze of tunnels and caverns and oubliettes. Once everyone had cleared the first major obstacle, the footage switched to another until all who had encountered it had gone through. Then it would switch to the next. Aizawa stopped the footage after each section so they could discuss observations about their own performance and how they could have improved. If anyone had done anything particularly clever or horrendously wrong, they pointed that out, too. It was interesting to see how it had been filmed with night vision cameras in the darkened tunnels, and how many passageways all of them had missed by sticking to one side of a tunnel or another. The parts where Minda had tried to hitch a ride on Yeyarazu's back had been captured as well, making all of the girls in the room scowl. It had been a well-lit, tall and narrow cavern with lots of obstacles that Yeyarazu could easily climb over with her superior height and creation quirk to produce tools to help her. Minda, who was basically half the height of the tallest person in the class, would have had a much more difficult time, and decided to make others do the work for him. There had been a lengthy discussion about that one, even though many of the students had cleared the area quite easily. 
It was pointed out that Minda could have easily gotten over the obstacles by using his hairballs to create handholds that only he could use. He could have even trapped those who tried to use them after him, since they would stick to them. Your perversion probably cost you a better placement in the final finish of the event, Jiru told him. She's not wrong, Aizawa told Minda with a piercing gaze. I'm sure we'll find time to discuss it one-on-one -on -one very soon. Minda looked cowed by this and began to bite his nails. That cavern had been a path that many of the students had found themselves in. And Izuku wasn't sure exactly how he'd missed it, but suspected it had something to do with putting his left hand against the wall to guide him instead of his right. There had been a pitfall into a deep, slick-sided hole almost as soon as a competitor had cleared the cavern. Right after the light completely faded and left them in the dark, that was where most of the students who got stuck ended up. There was a small ledge at the bottom that allowed them to stand under an overhang, so that any other falling students wouldn't fall on top of them. Clever, that had been where Ayama had ended up, after successfully using a short burst from his naval laser to rocket across the room. It seemed that he'd used up so much energy for that, that he hadn't wanted to risk it again just to light up a dark tunnel. That mistake had cost him his place in the competition for the rest of the day. It had cost a total seven students their place by the end. Most of the others hadn't encountered the bubble room, it seemed. It had been an offshoot room that was on the opposite side than most of them had chosen. Enough fell in to make it entertaining, though. The look of revulsion of each face as a bubble popped and released the stench was comical, seen again and again. Though Izuku had been tricked by the dead end at the top of the first ladder, most of the others hadn't. It was the overwhelming odor that had done many of them in, causing them to lose their grip on the ladder. One student even passed out there, having a quirk that enhanced his sense of smell. They didn't have nearly enough time to get through all of the footage in one sitting, so they stopped for the day after discussing an area that featured a section of water that had been dyed pink and rigged with bubblers to make it seem like it was boiling. Competitors had to immerse themselves completely and swim about three meters to another branch of the maze. It had been dimly lit, and there had been a staff member inside a compartment that hung over the underwater tunnel, ready to assist anyone who began to drown. One person had to be rescued, because they'd been startled by another student who had entered the water immediately after her. Once class was over, everyone was full of chatter. Izuku found himself being asked if he wanted to hang out, since Kirishima and Kaminari and a couple of others were considering stopping at a family restaurant for a snack after school. He turned them down, and was surprised to feel real regret to have to do so. It would have been a novel experience, and a good chance to get to know them better, but knew it wouldn't be allowed. They all accepted his wanted man excuse with the villains still on the loose, and Izuku trotted off to find All Might. He was surprised to find Sir in the teacher's lounge, sitting on the shabby sofa there, talking to All Might and Aizawa. Sorry to interrupt, Izuku said awkwardly. I can wait in the hall. No need, my boy, All Might said with a smile. I didn't bring a car today, and so Mirai came to be a chauffeur this afternoon. How was your day? Sir asked. Did you hear about the kidnapping? Izuku asked, arranging his face into a mask of excitement. All three men instantly looked shocked. It's okay. She woke up. Aizawa wasn't looking at him, but the smack that Izuku felt on the back of his head had definitely been caused by his teacher's capture weapon. All Might looked relieved, and Sir looked proud. Izuku chalked it up a win and grinned widely. I hear you chose hero names today, but Shota here wouldn't tell us what you chose, All Might said. It was weird to hear his teacher referred to by his first name. I thought you'd want to tell them yourself, Aizawa said, getting to his feet. See you. He left the room without another word, and Izuku shifted on his feet and fidgeted a bit. I wasn't really prepared when they told us it was time for our hero names. He stalled. And I know I should have though of it before, and I did when I was a kid, but everything I thought up as a little kid sounded dumb, and I didn't know if I should try and wait until I had time to talk to you both about it, and kid, it's just a name, All Might said, cutting off his nervous rambling. And it's yours, not ours. What did you choose? Anything you chose is fine, Izuku, sir assured him. You can always change it later, if you decide it's not the right one for you. I chose. Vanguard. Both men were silent long enough that Izuku had to fight the urge to apologize and start rambling again, but managed to wait it out. Vanguard. All Might said quietly, testing it out. It's a strong name. A good name. A vanguard is someone who leads the way for others to follow in their footsteps. Someone who is a beacon to others, Sir said. Very well chosen I'd say, but you'll have to work hard to live up to it. Izuku sagged with relief. Izuku's father was equally excited by his son's choice of hero name. That's a great choice. From everything I've gathered, the main problem Japan is facing is that All Might has been the biggest load-bearing pillar holding up our society. When he steps down, it's going to take an army of others to stand up and lead the way into the future. That's what a vanguard does. He leads an army. That was what I was thinking, but then I wondered if it sounded too arrogant. I want to inspire people, but I'm not there yet. I think you're wrong about that, he said. You inspire me every day. I'm sure there are a lot of others who see you in the same light. 
and you just don't recognize it. Now that you've chosen a name, make it your goal, and before you know it, people will be looking to you to lead the way. Izuku knew he'd be discussing this with his therapist, who he really liked now that he'd gotten to know the man. Dr. Fujimori was a good listener, had a keen sense of humor and didn't tell Izuku how he should feel about anything, just guided him through sorting out his feelings and determining what was causing some of them. However, the longer Izuku thought about the name, the more he wanted to make his own in every way. He was determined to step up his game and become someone dependable and admirable by the time he became a real pro hero. I got a call from Sir Nainai -Nai today, his father said as they washed the evening dishes together. He said that the Might Agency had offered you a real student internship, but that you'd likely also received a lot of other offers. Oh yeah, Izuku said, drying his hands and going to his room to get the list he'd been given in class. He handed it to his father, who had been drying the dishes and already had dry hands. Take a look, there are some good ones on there, Izuku told him. They'll finish up these. There are only a couple of pans left to wash, anyway. Izuku, this is amazing. You have offers from six of the top ten heroes. I know. It's crazy. At first I was thinking I'd just go back with All Might and Sir, but I think it might be good to look into some of the others and see if any of them might be able to teach me something new. You know, step out of my comfort zone. I want to talk to Sir and All Might and see what they think. Izuku finished the dishes and wiped down the counters while his father stood staring at the list intently mouth moving slightly as he read the list of agency names. There were five pages to the list, and two columns on each one. It was a lot to look over. I had honestly expected you to just accept All Might's offer immediately, his father said. But this list, there are a lot of options to consider. I don't know if you could do better than the Might Agency, but at the same time, you always have access to All Might and Sir, even outside of school. That's what I was thinking. Do you think they'd be upset if I went somewhere else? Izuku couldn't imagine they'd be angry, but enduring their disappointment might be even worse. No, they want what's best for you, and they'll know if an agency you're considering would be a good fit or a challenge for you, I'll bet. Talk it over with them. Izuku nodded and retreated to his room. He had to make a choice by the end of the week, and the week was already nearly half over already, thanks to the school shutdown. He messaged All Might to see if it was a good time to talk, and his phone rang immediately. Midoriya, my boy, I was wondering when I'd hear from you. Izuku immediately relaxed just hearing his mentor's friendly voice. He explained his thinking about the internships, and all I might didn't seem upset at all at the idea of Izuku going elsewhere. In fact, he thought it might be a good thing, considering that the villains would expect Izuku to go to Might Agency, and part of the internship would include going out in public. It might be too tempting for the seemingly unhinged Shigaraki to resist attempting another attack. Will you and Sir take a look at my list and give me some advice? Izuku asked. I have a couple that I'm leaning toward and want to know what you think. Of course, of course. How about tomorrow after school? You come back to Might Tower with me and we can take a look. Izuku felt a lot better after talking it over with All Might. And better still the next day when Sir agreed with the notion of Izuku doing his student internship elsewhere. I have extended a few offers to students in second and third year at UA. And I believe that they need far more instruction than you do. Some of them have phenomenal quirks, but need some rather specialized training to really make the most of them. Obviously, since All Might can only appear for an hour each day, the main mentoring would fall to me and the sidekicks to handle. All Might looked a little deflated by this, but they all understood it was not a complaint, but a simple statement. Actually, Izuku said sheepishly, I know it's not my place, but... Both men looked at him with interest. Go ahead and speak your mind, young man, All Might urged. I was going to ask if you might consider possibly... Maybe, making an offer to, Kaken, Izuku said, afraid to look at them to see their reaction. You're speaking of Bakugu Katsuki, Sir clarified, even though Izuku knew full well that he knew who was being talked about. The boy who bullied you for much of your formative years and attempted to seriously injure you during your first battle training class. Sir's expression was calm, as was his voice, but it was obvious that he was holding a grudge over Kaken and Izuku's past interactions. All Might looked stunned at the request as well. He's got an amazing quirk. And I think that if he really tried to get his ego under control, he'd make an amazing hero. I don't expect miracles, but all of those lessons and discussions about morals and ethics and everything I got would probably be good for him and help him understand better what hero work is really about. He's never been in a situation before where he wasn't told that he's great or where he didn't excel at everything he did. He needs help. Izuku realized he'd been talking non-stop and blushed. I'm not trying to tell you what you should do. I just think that if anyone could teach him how to be a decent human being, it would be the two of you. He already idolizes All Might. Thank you for the suggestion, Sir said slowly. I can only promise that I'll give it the attention it deserves. Izuku nodded, feeling that he'd at least tried. He wasn't even sure why he thought it would make a difference, just that he knew he needed to try. Is there anyone else you think might benefit from our infinite wisdom? Sir asked with an arched eyebrow that held a hint of teasing amusement. 
Um, maybe. Todoroki Shouto, Endeavor's son, All Might asked with surprise. Yeah, he seems. Off. I think maybe he doesn't have a sense of humor, or something. You mean he's broken? Sir asked with a furrowed brow. Maybe. He doesn't really show much emotion, but he doesn't seem like a bad guy. He's just flat, I guess. His quirk is half hot, half cold, but he only uses the cold side. I've never seen him do more with his hot side than melt his ice. Perhaps the cold side is more powerful. Having two opposite elemental quirks in one body is pretty volatile sounding. It might be too much for his system. Maybe. I guess I can try to ask him about it. Izuku didn't think that would be a comfortable conversation. But it might help the other boy to talk to someone about it. Anything else? Sir asked. Nope. I'm done interfering. Izuku said with a cheeky grin. No corny joke this time. Sir asked. Nah, I had a construction one, but I'm still working on it. Izuku deadpanned. All Might groaned. Let's have a look at your options and decide from there where you want to go, Sir said with a small grin. The meeting that followed involved a lot of notes, a list of goals, pros, cons, safety issues involving Izuku's need for extra security and location all played a part in the process. After a lot of consideration, Izuku made his choice, and All Might promised to do what he could to ensure that he would be safe during the week he was learning from a different mentor. The next day at school, Izuku turned in the form that his father had signed and handed it into Aizawa, who was there extra early for a change. He looked at the form and raised an eyebrow, but said only one thing. Interesting choice. They only extended one other offer this year, which is two more than they usually do. I'll send your acceptance notification so they know to expect you. Izuku was surprised to hear this, and wondered why they'd made two exceptions this year if they normally never took any. He also wondered who would be interning with him. Ooh, Midoriya, did you just hand in your internship papers? Yuraka asked with a glint of excitement in her eyes. Yep, how about you? I turned mine in just before I left school yesterday. She said, I'm going to Gunhead's agency. I was so happy to get some good offers after how bad I failed in the last event. I really want to learn some hand-to-hand -hand combat skills. She made a few air punches to punctuate her announcement. Where did you decide on? She asked. A few others in class paused to hear his answer. Oh, uh, I'm going with Endeavor's agency. He said, feeling embarrassed for some reason. Seriously? Kaminari asked, sounding impressed. He's the number two. I bet All Might's agency only takes kids from third year. He probably wouldn't take first years, especially since he's our teacher right now, and it might look like favoritism, Kirishima guessed. Congratulations, Midoriya-kun, Yeyarazu said with a smile. I'm sure you'll learn a lot. The conversation revolved around where everyone was going to intern. But Kakin sat at his desk, hunched over, seemingly lost in thought. Hey, Bakugu, have you decided where you're going, man? Hiroshima called across the room. I'm still narrowing it down, he said, sounding grouchy. Your list was pretty long, Minta said with a sage nod. I'll bet it's not an easy choice. I think it's easier this way than it would be if we had to apply to places and risk having to wait for rejection, Siro said. At least we know that we'll automatically get accepted to the one we choose. Class started shortly after, with Todoroki just barely making it in time. Izuku thought he looked more sullen than usual as he slid into his seat and sat back with his arms crossed across his chest. He did not make eye contact with anyone, even when Yeyarazu attempted to greet him. The day's announcements basically had to do with expected behavior while at their internships. Things they could expect to encounter, and the fact that their mentor would be giving them an evaluation at the end of the week that would help determine their grade at the end of the semester. In hero training, they went over the second event of the sports festival, where Minda got excited that Midoriya had grabbed Hagakure right away, and that she had obviously been naked when he did so. Midoriya blushed to the roots of his hair, making everyone tease him a bit. While the girls made it known how disgusting it was that Hagakure's stealthy quirk was reduced to her being a naked girl in Minta's estimation. Aizawa let the conversation go for only a few seconds before making eye contact with Minda and saying, Strike one. Minda visibly paled, and he started to stammer. But dot 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 but dot 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 why do they think it's cute that Midoriya? Because he obviously wasn't copying a feel. Ashido told him sternly. He was treating her like a threat and an equal. Like, he, should. Even the boys were nodding along. Though Kaminari looked as though he could sympathize with Minta, Izuku was still blushing, and muttered an apology to Hagakure, just in case he'd touched her anywhere inappropriate. She laughed, and he felt her pat his head in a friendly gesture to let him know there were no hard feelings. Izuku wasn't sure what strike one meant in this situation, but he could make a good guess. He didn't know what would happen if Minta ever reached strike three, but he hoped for the other boy's sake that he never had to find out. Aizawa didn't seem like the type to mess around. 
It was interesting to see the others battling to push or throw other participants off of the different stages. Some used clever strategies, while others were opportunistic hunters. Yurashi had taken one of the top tiers for himself, but the way the stages rotated and revolved around the uppermost platform, he had limited success with his wins. He was still the one to knock the most people off, but as he'd realized that day, he should have started at the bottom, where the highest concentration of bodies ended up at the beginning. He could have used his whirlwinds to pretty much sweep them clean of anyone who didn't have a seriously good grip on something solid. In fact, if he'd used strong enough winds, he might have been able to move the stages, as well. Izuku wasn't sure if he was capable of that, though. Kaken had been a come-and-get-me kind of fighter, using his strength and explosions to knock people off of the topmost stage and cause havoc on the ones below. He probably would have had a lot more students removed if his stage had been a bit lower, but that wasn't necessarily the point. If his strategy was to stand his ground and simply wait for the others to take out the weakest opponents, then he had been very successful. Anyone who faced him got thrown or blasted to a lower stage, even if they weren't eliminated from the game entirely. Izuku even said as much while the class discussed what caught their eye. No one disagreed with that assessment. And they continued watching, observing a lot of foolish mistakes as those with less situational awareness got eliminated from the game. They made note of how many students had quickly abandoned their provided weapons, and fell back to relying on their quirks to fight. Izuku remembered using two simultaneously at the beginning, but then dropping them to improve his mobility. They also commented on the cooperation between a few students, including Yuraka and Izuku, and how it had worked in their favor. They also applauded the way Todoroki kept most attackers at bay by icing up his stage to make it super slippery, and then using the spring end of the weapon to fend off anyone who managed to get in its range. Then he used his ice to create a ramp that slid anyone besides him off the stages completely. The moment when Izuku brought his fists down on the stage, the others in the class all made noises of dismay or astonishment. Didn't that hurt? Sato asked him as they watched the end of the stage that Izuku had been standing on dip dangerously low. Yes, Izuku said with a nod as he thought back. Yes it did. Laughter from the others made him grin in embarrassment. It was nice to be in a group of people laughing at him without it being mean or goading. This was good-natured, and easy to laugh along with. The end of the event was signaled soon thereafter, and the timing was perfect because it was nearly time for dismissal. They could finish tomorrow with the flag tag, and Izuku would finally be able to see for himself how it ended. They were all gathering their bags and getting ready for the bell to ring when there was a knock on the door. It slid slowly open a moment later to reveal Principal Nezu, who looked as neat and unruffled as ever as he strode into the room. Please pardon my interruption, he said as he approached Aizawa, but I just received a rather impressive offer for one of your students, and I thought it should be delivered with utmost haste. Aizawa took the folded sheet of paper and his eyebrows shot up in a rare show of surprise. Bakugu, he said, getting everyone's attention. You've got an offer here from the Might Agency. The class turned into a madhouse as everyone lost their collective mind. Even Izuku was surprised, since Sir had made it sound as though he wasn't going to be even considering the idea. The most surprised of all was Kaken who, for once in his life, was rendered completely speechless. As the excitement died down, everyone started to congratulate him and gather around his desk. You're gonna take it, right? Hiroshima asked. Uh, Kaken answered, seeming stunned. Of course I am. But he didn't sound as excited as everyone else, and Izuku suspected he was in shock. Guys, give him some room. Ashido told everyone. You okay, Bakugu? Bakugu's lips slowly stretched into a smile that, for once, had no trace of sneer in them. Yeah, he answered as the reality sunk in. Hell yeah. Yes. He fist pumped the air, and everyone got excited and started cheering again. Nezu cleared his throat and everyone suddenly remembered he was there and settled down. Bakugu-kun, please remember that this internship is a huge opportunity, but also a huge responsibility. You'll be representing our school as you work with a very prestigious agency. Act accordingly. Yes, sir. Bakugu answered, still smiling. Izuku thought he might faint at the sight of a completely unsarcastic, genuinely respectful and truly happy Kaken. It was so out of character. Who are you and what have you done with Bakugu? Jiro asked him with teasing, narrowed eyes. He flipped her the finger with a smirk, and Izuku nodded. There it was. That was better. For a few moments, the world had tilted wildly on its axis and nothing made sense. He should have known that a cheerful Kaken couldn't last that long. Still, it had been nice to see he was capable of it. Maybe he was on the path to recovery from a lifetime of being in a hole. As everyone started to file out of the room, Izuku remembered that he had meant to ask Ashido a favor. Ashido, he called out. You can call me Mina if you want. Most people do, she said easily. What's up? I uh, I was wondering if you knew anyone here at the school who knows how to cut hair. Her eyes widened and took on a gleam that made Izuku vaguely nervous. He actually startled when Hagakir managed to sneak up on him. I do, I do, she said excitedly. Do you want me to cut your hair? 
My mom is actually a hairstylist, and she taught me the basics. Really? You mean we get to give Broccoli Boy and makeover? Ashido asked excitedly. Makeover? Izuku asked. His gulp was probably audible all the way down the hall as both girls started running their fingers through his mop of wavy curls. Oh my god. Hagakir squealed. It's so soft and slippery. Why does it look so fluffy when it should seem oily? No idea, Izuku said, blushing furiously. Hiroraka came over to find out why the other girls were fondling Izuku's head. Do you want me to come to your place tonight to do it? Hagakir asked excitedly. Um, Izuku wasn't sure if that would be allowed, though he couldn't think of any real reason why not. Let me check really quick. He pulled out his phone and sent off a message to Sir, who would probably be the fastest to reply. Within a few moments, he got an okay, as long as whoever was on watch escorted them up. While he was waiting for a reply, Mina had chimed in that if Hagakir got to go, then she was coming, too. Then she hooked an arm through Yuraraka's arm and included her, as well. Hey, Kirishima said. You're all going to Midoriya's. Izuku wondered exactly when he had lost control of this situation. I just need a haircut, he said. This is going to be so much fun, Mina announced. Hagakir hopped up and down. I'll get a cape and shears and everything and come by in an hour. Give me your address so I can use my maps app to find it. Izuku sighed and messaged her the address and let her know about security. Is it really okay if we come, too? Kirishima asked. You want to come see me get a haircut? Izuku asked, truly baffled by this turn of events. Sure, why not? He asked. If she's up for it, Hagakir could give me a trim, too. The girls were entirely too excited by the prospect, but Izuku just sighed. There wasn't any harm in it, and it seemed like they really wanted to. I guess, Izuku finally said. Why don't you all just stay for dinner? We can work on homework, if you want. Pretty much everyone else had gone, except for Todoroki, who was watching them with a flat expression. Izuku felt bad for leaving him out. You're welcome to come, too, he offered the bi-colored boy. I don't expect it to be all that exciting, but I can't, Todoroki said shortly. I have training. He got up and left without another word, leaving Izuku feeling like maybe he'd missed something. He's lucky, Kirishima said once Todoroki was out of earshot. He gets to train with the number two hero whenever he wants. They all separated, and Izuku had to ask All Might to stop at a grocery store on the way home so he could get ingredients for dinner to feed four extra people. He had three bulging bags and a cake box by the time he got home, and had been extra grateful for the ride. He got to work on meal prep, intending to make katsudon, since it was a large enough group to make it worth all the effort. It wasn't a complicated dish, but it could get a bit messy, so he didn't make it often. He had barely had time to finish tenderizing the pork before the door buzzer sounded. Bubble Girl's cheerful face filled the screen as she told him that he had visitors and would be bringing them up. He quickly washed his hands and slipped on his gloves, and made sure everything was tidy. He felt oddly nervous, never having had guests over before, and wasn't sure how formal he should act. Before he could decide on anything, Bubble Girl knocked on the door and then left the four classmates in his care. Hey Midoriya, you live in such a fancy place, Hagakir said, keeping her bag with her after she removed her shoes. Izuku smiled, feeling relieved when Yuraraka, Mina and Kirishima all stepped out of their shoes and made themselves at home. It wasn't so daunting after all. He gave them a brief tour of the apartment, which Yuraraka described as roomy and they marveled at his All Might collection, most of which had been signed by the man himself. He told an abridged story of Granny Ito, and how he had first met All Might and that he'd signed all of his stuff in one go at that time. He made it seem like a one-time encounter that had happened many years ago. They all sounded impressed, and didn't tease him too much about being such a huge fanboy. So, should I cut your hair before dinner or after? Hagakir asked. We could get our homework started before we eat. Then do the haircuts after. The girls decided that it was a good plan. Kirishima was laid back enough to let them run the show, and Izuku just let them do what they wanted. He was kind of out of his depth. They got out their school work and began with math, with Kirishima asking for a lot of help along the way. They finished relatively quickly, since they worked together and compared answers. Then they breezed through a history worksheet, an English worksheet that Izuku was able to help them all finish in record time since, if someone read the paragraph out loud to him, he could easily tell which parts needed correcting. When Izuku's father came home, it was to find them all bent over their notes about the sports festival's second event, each writing short essay on their observations. I'm home, his father said, sounding somewhat surprised. Welcome home. Sorry, I forgot to let you know I had some from friends coming over. Hagakir's going to cut my and Kirishima's hair, so I invited them all for dinner. I see. Well then, welcome. Please continue taking care of Izuku. You're in for a treat. He's a great cook, his father said. You're cooking. Uraraka asked in surprise. Yep. In fact, now that my dad's home, I should get started. I lost track of time. He made a quick introduction of his father to his friends before his father retreated to his bedroom. 
Izuku moved to the kitchen, and there was scrambling as all of them packed up their school supplies and crowded around the counter to watch Izuku cook. Um, what are you doing? He asked, seeing them all watching with avid interest as he whisked the egg and put breadcrumbs in a pan for breading the pork. I can't believe you can cook, Iraraka said enviously. I could burn rice dot 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 if I had a rice cooker. Izuku laughed at that. Same, Kirishima admitted. I can cook eggs and rice, and that's pretty much it, Mina said. My mom says I'm too hyper to have in the kitchen. I can cook, Hagakir said easily. But it freaks my mom out when I do. I get my invisibility from my dad. He doesn't cook, so she's not used to seeing an invisible person at work in the kitchen and gets nervous about colliding with me. Your mom is visible, then? Izuku asked as he dredged the pork in flour before moving it to the egg. Yep. They actually expected me to get her quirk when I was little, because my skin was already blue like hers. You have blue skin? Kirishima asked curiously. If it was visible, it would be, she affirmed. My mom can hold her breath for a really, really long time. Like, almost an hour, without any ill effects. That's amazing, Izuku said, slipping the first breaded cutlet into the hot oil. I guess I just assumed you were born invisible. Me too, Kirishima said. So did I, Yuraka admitted. Nope, I just gradually disappeared around the time I turned three. Hagakir said, my mother was so sad about it, saying she wouldn't get to see her baby girl grow up. Oh, that's so sweet. Mina gushed. Every once in a while, she'll dust me with powder, just so she can check to make sure everything's okay, Hagakir said with a laugh. Especially when she cuts my hair, though I don't know why it matters if it's a bad cut. It's not like anyone will know. Izuku listened while he cooked and the others peppered Hagakir with questions about her childhood. Midoriya, Kirishima suddenly said loudly. What is this? Izuku looked up to see him holding a picture frame and the girls all saying, Uo. The picture in question was a good one. Izuku was wearing a competition shirt and stirrups in a typical gymnast style, and was in the middle of a routine. He was doing a split with his arms raised over his head, and a broad smile on his face. He remembered the moment well, because his dad had been at that particular event and cheering on the sidelines while he took pictures. Uh, that was taken a couple of years ago during one of my gymnastics exhibitions. I wasn't allowed to compete because of my quirks, but I still did a few exhibitions here and there. Well, he wasn't sure who said it, but they all seemed impressed. Can you still do the splits like that? Mina asked excitedly. Yeah, it's been a while since I did an actual gymnastics routine, but I still practice the basics as part of my workout at home, since I can't exactly go to the gym with all the restrictions on me. He continued cooking as he talked, and the conversation finally moved on to other subjects. When he finally assembled all of the meals, they were all hungry and it was a lively group that sat down to eat. Izuku's father declined to join them, saying he would eat a little later and made an excuse about work to give his son some time with his friends. Everyone was impressed with the food, though Izuku insisted that something was missing from the flavor, though he couldn't pinpoint it. It didn't stop everyone from enjoying the meal and a piece of the cake that followed. They all helped with dishes so that the kitchen was clean and tidy in no time. Then it was time for haircuts. Hagakir made Kirishima go wash his hair, since it was full of gel and styling products to make the spikes stand up like they did. While he did that, the girls put towels down on the floor to catch the hair and got Hagakir's equipment. Soon there were a couple of different pairs of scissors, combs, a brush, a water bottle, electric hair clippers and hair clips lined up on the counter. Izuku's hair just needed to be spritzed with water, which didn't do much to keep it wet. He sat nervously on a kitchen stool with a cape fastened around his neck. The girls had apparently already consulted with each other on what was about to happen, and it was hard not to fidget when Mina had an almost manic gleam in her eye. Hagakir seemed to know what she was doing, though. She sectioned his hair and twisted it so that the clips could hold it as she worked. Kirishima reappeared with damp hair and a towel around his neck just as the buzz of the electric clippers filled the room. You look so different with your hair down, Kirishima, Yuraraka said. It almost distracted Izuku from that fact that he could hear the soft pattering of clumps of hair falling to the towels on the ground. Kirishima looked sheepish as he nodded. Not very intimidating, is it? He said ruefully. That's why I wear it spiked. Looks more heroic that way. Izuku thought he had a point, but it looked good either way. That might be a good thing. When you're a pro, Izuku said, turning his head obediently when Hagakir told him to. You'll be able to disguise yourself better when you're out in public if you're off duty. I guess so, Kirishima said, sounding as if he'd never considered it before. I could maybe even do undercover work with it down. The red might give it away, Mina pointed out but maybe not. More clumps of green hair slid down the front of the cape around Izuku's shoulders and then onto the floor. You're leaving me at least a little hair, right? Izuku asked, only partly joking. You've got a ton of hair, Hagakir told him. It's a bit fine, but there's a lot of it. It's looking good, man, Kirishima told him reassuringly. It really is, Yuraka told him with a nod. You already look older, without all the bulk and fluffiness around the sides. You do have a bit of baby face, Mina told him. 
but I think this will fix that problem. The electric clippers were turned off after a few minutes, and Hagakir went to work with the scissors. More hair than Izuku even thought he had began to fall down from his head and slide off the cape. Only the fact that no one was gasping or giggling at what was going on helped him relax. Finally, there was no more cutting, and only fingers running through the strands on his head, rearranging it this way and that for a couple more minutes before Hagakir declared him finished and unfastened the cape. Izuku put his hand to the back of his head and was somewhat stunned to find it so short that it felt like the bristles of a soft toothbrush under his hand. Mina produced a large hand mirror with a flourish and held it up for him. That looks amazing, Hagakure. Thank you so much. Izuku was beyond pleased. She had given him a very short undercut almost to the crown of his head and done a decent job of blending it into longer curls on the top that revealed more of a forehead than he'd seen in years. They had been right, he did look older. Hiroraka and Mina had come forward to run their fingers over it, making him blush. Kirishima gave him a thumbs up. Since you went first, I know I can trust Hagakir with my hair. He joked, but I just want to trim. My spikes are getting a little too heavy to stand up straight, and it's taking forever for my hair to set in the morning. Izuku took a seat with Mina and Yuraka and watched while Kirishima got his hair cut. It wasn't as dramatic a difference as Izuku's hair, but she did thin it out with weird-looking shears and cut about two centimeters off of the length. It was a much faster cut for the redhead than it had been for Izuku. After that, Izuku gathered up the towels and shook them gently over the trash, then put them in the washer. His friends gathered their belongings and he saw them to the door, where there were cheerful goodbyes before they went. The apartment felt almost unnaturally quiet after they had gone. Those are some good friends you've made, his father said, finally making an appearance. Yeah, Izuku said, feeling some surprise that he actually thought of them as friends. Now, yeah, they are. Are you sure you have everything? Izuku's father asked for the third time as Izuku slipped on his shoes. I'm sure, he answered for the third time. I know you're going to be just across the city, but you can never be too careful, his father continued, even as they left the apartment together. Izuku holding a duffel bag in addition to his school bag. Endeavor's been told everything he needs to know, and you'll be staying in a dormitory full of psychics. Izuku let his father ramble, aware that he was saying these things to reassure himself more than his son. Endeavor's agency was second only to Might Tower as far as security went, and Izuku had no doubt that he'd be perfectly fine while he was there. All Might and Sir had given him similar speeches about safety protocols and what to do in an emergency. It was a wonder that Izuku didn't feel more apprehensive than he did with all of the warnings and lectures he'd endured from nearly every adult in his life over the past couple of days. At the school, they had all met in the classroom to get their hero costume cases, and then Aizawa saw them to the train station and gave them final instructions. Todoroki had been strangely silent about Midoriya going to Endeavor Agency, even though Izuku knew that his classmate was also going to be joining him for the next week. Izuku went to stand beside him but suddenly realized that Ida had not said anything to their classmates about behaving in a way that demonstrated that the meritorious reputation of the school was not unfairly earned, or something. In fact, the deputy class rep had been uncharacteristically quiet for the past week, though that could be because of the heavy emotional toll of having his brother so gravely injured. It had been revealed that Ingenium had suffered irreparable spinal damage, and would almost certainly never walk again. Izuku shouldn't let him go to his internship without at least a word of moral support or encouragement. Ida, he called out, jogging after him before the taller boy had a chance to disappear into the crowd. Ida, Yuraraka was suddenly there beside Izuku, obviously for the same reason. She shared a look with Izuku when Ida stopped, but did not immediately turn around. When he did face them, his face was composed into a fake, bright and cheerful expression. Ah oh yes, good luck on your internships, you too. I'm sure you'll learn a lot in the coming. Ida, Yuraraka said, we're worried about you. Izuku nodded in agreement and was concerned when he saw Ida's shoulders sag, as if they'd just added a weight to them. You haven't been yourself, Izuku said quietly. We've noticed, and we've been giving you space to deal with your personal stuff, but we still want you to know we care. Yeah, Yuraka added. I know we've all been crazy busy and excited about the internships, but we're never too busy if you need someone to talk to. I. Ida looked glossy-eyed for a moment before his backbone straightened and his expression turned determined. I very much appreciate the sentiment, but I'm afraid that I'm the only one who can deal with what I need to deal with right now. Please don't worry about me. I'll want to hear all about everything you've learned when I see you next week. Oh okay, Yuraka said, not sounding convinced at all. You have our numbers. I do. Thank you, Ida said. Then he was gone, swallowed by the crowd of commuters. Izuku and Yuraka went back to the group together, feeling a lot less jubilant than before. Yuraka's train arrived, and she dashed off with a little wave. And Todoroki simply said, the train we need will be on the other side of the platform. Izuku followed him curiously, and stood waiting for Todoroki to say something else. When he remained silent, Izuku tried to make conversation. 
What made you decide to go to your father's agency? I'm sure you had a ton of other top heroes to pick from. I didn't. It was decided for me, Todoroki said with what passed for a scowl in his perpetually stoic face. I got offers, but wasn't allowed to pick from them. Weren't allowed. Doesn't that mean your father really wants to mentor you? Izuku guessed. Todoroki just looked at him as if that was an adequate answer. Maybe he's just excited to be able to take you on your first official patrol, Izuku suggested. After saying that, he wondered if All Might or Sir had been disappointed that Izuku would have his first patrol with another hero. Todoroki huffed out a humorless laugh at that. Maybe you're right. Nothing about me excites him more than controlling my every action. Izuku blinked at that, not sure what to make of it. Do you not get along with your father? In a word, no, Todoroki said. But still, he's the number two for a reason. He should be able to at least teach me something during this internship. Have you not trained with him before? Izuku asked, feeling bad for having made that assumption. Not everyone got the same advantages, after all. Todoroki had refused the offer to go to Izuku's place the other day because he had to train. But that didn't mean it had been with his father. Oh, I train with him all the time, Todoroki assured him. But neither of us enjoy it. Let's just leave it at that. You'll see what I mean soon enough. Their train arrived shortly thereafter, and they boarded for the trip to the other side of the city. The ride would only be about 15 or 20 minutes, so they had plenty of time to get there when their agenda said they should. Todoroki didn't seem all that inclined to chat during the ride, so they sat in silence, and Izuku observed all of the different commuters, especially those with visible quirks. He spotted rapid fire at the end of the car, looking like a college student with a backpack slung over one shoulder. He didn't acknowledge Izuku in any way, and Izuku pretended not to see him. He was supposed to be there to monitor the train after all. He would likely follow Izuku and Todoroki all the way to Endeavor Agency before returning to whatever else he regularly did for the Might Agency. From the train, they walked two blocks to a high-rise building that was very modern-looking, with a large, stylized E on the front entrance. When they went inside, a receptionist was waiting for them with badges on retractable lanyards. These will allow you access to most of the department doors and are keyed to your dormitory rooms, so be sure to keep track of them. They're not easy to replace, she told them. Endeavor wants you to drop off your things in your rooms and get changed into your costumes. You'll have 15 minutes to meet him in his office on the 17th floor. Izuku and Todoroki took the packet of papers she offered each of them, then directed them to take the elevator to the 4th floor. Izuku was in room 411 and Todoroki was in room 414. Izuku quickly changed into his costume and met Todoroki in the central common area that all of the rooms faced. Instead of the white costume that was half ice that he had worn before, Todoroki wore a dark blue jumpsuit with white boots, a leather belt with small pouches and five tube compartments hanging around it, which Izuku assumed held tools of some sort for hero or rescue work. There were interconnected plates of some kind looped over each shoulder, which fit snugly against Todoroki's body, but Izuku couldn't figure out if they were practical or decorative. As far as costumes went, it was pretty plain, but still looked much better than his previous one. I hope you're up for this, Todoroki said as they rode up the elevator together. My father isn't exactly a friendly man. Izuku could have countered that Aizawa wasn't particularly a ball of cuddles either, but was certainly respected and a good teacher. He kept his opinion to himself, reserving judgment until after he'd actually met the man. But further up the elevator went, the deeper the lines carved between Todoroki's eyebrows became. When the elevator pinged and the doors slid open, Izuku noticed that the other boy had to take a moment to visibly relax his muscles and unclench his jaw. Within a few seconds, he looked sullen, but not tense. Endeavor is expecting you, said a woman at a desk outside of a tall, black lacquered door. Go right in. Izuku stepped up the doors and opened the one on the right. He stepped through into a large space that took up at least half of the floor, but the only furniture was a dark, imposing desk with a lamp on it and a low table with a leather couch and two matching chairs on either side of it. The only decor was a large painting of a pastoral scene, and the largest Persian rug Izuku had ever seen in his life under it all. It was boring and stark, despite the earthy tones and huge chandelier, and the imposing man wreathed in flames standing behind the desk. The room felt cold. Izuku immediately bowed in respect and gave his greeting. I'm Midoriya Izuku, in your care this week. Please allow me to learn from you. Endeavor nodded and looked over to his son, as if expecting a similar greeting. If so, he was disappointed. I'm here, just like you wanted, Todoroki said instead. Izuku looked between them, and could almost hear the tension vibrating through the room. Endeavor's glare went from Todoroki to Izuku after a moment. I invited you to intern here in the hopes that you would be able to be a worthy opponent for my obstinate son, Endeavor told Izuku. He has fire powerful enough to rival, or even surpass mine, but stubbornly refuses to use it, insisting that ice is enough for him to surpass me. Izuku's eyes widened. Todoroki's fire was that strong. 
and he didn't use it. Maybe it was the cause of the burn scar over his eye. He could understand being afraid to use a power that had the potential to hurt you like that. I see, Izuku said, keeping his tone noncommittal, even though he really didn't understand at all. I'll have you facing off against each other and many of my psychics while you're here, as well as myself. You'll join the psychics for morning workouts, then breakfast, training, and we'll patrol this afternoon after lunch. If you perform well, you will be allowed to accompany psychics on patrols. His eyes shifted to Todoroki, who looked bored and impatient. Try not to embarrass me. He pressed a button on the phone on his desk and said, send in Burnin. The door opened, and a young woman with flames for hair strode in with a grin. Newbies, she said in a cheerful voice. I'm Burnin. Come with me, and I'll show you the ropes around here. Burnin wore a costume that looked a bit like an old bellboy or doorman uniform, at least on top. The bottom was very short, with stockings that had visible garter straps holding them up. She was also masked, and appeared to have a medium-sized fire extinguisher strapped to the small of her back, as well. Endeavor had already taken a seat at this desk directing his attention elsewhere, so Izuku followed the peppy woman back to the foyer. Todoroki followed, his manner shifting to calm and even slightly cordial as he nodded at the sidekick in greeting. What are your names? Burnin asked as they waited for the elevator. Shouto, Todoroki said. Izuku had almost forgotten that he'd gone with his first name for a hero moniker. Needs work, Burnin declared boldly. Don't worry, one'll come to you. I'm Vanguard, Izuku told her, using his hero name in an introduction for the first time. It felt good, right? Ooh, good one, Burnin approved with a grin. Maybe you could give Shouto some pointers. I'm sure that's exactly what Endeavor wants, Todoroki said cryptically. If Burnin was aware that Shouto was Endeavor's son, she gave no sign of it. She jabbed at a button on the elevator panel and took them to a floor that looked very much like an expanded version of All Might's personal gym. There were treadmills, stationary bikes and stair climbers lining one wall. Another wall had tons of free weights as well as weight machines. There were places to stretch and do calisthenics, too. There were only about a dozen people currently using the room. This is where we do morning workout, Vernon told them, from 6 in the morning to 7 every day. This is where you'll be expected to be, building up muscle and endurance. Unless you're on duty, that is. The night shift has a different schedule, from 7.30 to 9. There will be training for you too. There will be a schedule for that in the packet you were given when you got here this morning. But for today, you'll be working with me and Kaido. We'll give you a half an hour with each of us before we switch. Then for the second hour you'll battle us together. After that there's a half hour break. You should come to the bullpen and meet some more of the flaming psychicers and see how things work on a normal day. After that, more training for an hour, and then there's the briefing room. She pointed to a clock on the wall that said it was nearly a quarter after seven. Go ahead and use the next fifteen minutes to stretch and warm up. We'll grab some breakfast, and we can get to know each other before we start. Izuku immediately went over to a padded area of the floor next to a wall that had a bar for stretching. There were also yoga balls, medicine balls, resistance bands and a stretching apparatus. He went through a series of stretches, ending by grabbing the bottoms of his feet and resting his head against his legs. Shouto was also stretching, but didn't have the flexibility that Izuku had. That was okay, since he probably didn't have a background in gymnastics, either. Once he finished stretching, Izuku decided to get onto the elliptical machine, since that would get his heart rate going faster than a treadmill. He wondered if he would be allowed to come to this area earlier than six, or else be allowed to run up and down the stairwells during his off time. He had missed regular workouts over the past week, because Heroic's class had been mostly discussions and observations about the sports festival. He wanted to move, and was thrilled that he'd be getting intense workouts starting today. They went to a cafeteria on the first floor for breakfast, where the heroes were able to purchase their meals for very inexpensively. Izuku was glad that his meal plan was part of his internship, since he hadn't brought any money in his costume pockets. He supposed he should remember to keep a few hundred yen in there for emergencies. Shouto got a traditional Japanese breakfast set meal, and Izuku followed suit, simply because it was easier. He took his tray and followed Burnin to a table with empty seats, where a couple of other heroes were sitting. New sidekicks, one of them asked. Interns, Burnin told him. So don't ask him what their quirks are. I'm training with them after this, and it's going to be part of my demonstration to come at them not knowing. So, the hero said with raised eyebrows. We're pretending that we don't know that that kid is Endeavor's son. Yep, he's an intern. No special treatment, Burning confirmed. Got it, the other hero said with an easy smile. Well, welcome to the agency. My name's Cinder. I can turn rocks into flaming projectiles. You'll find that a lot of the burning psychicers have flame-based quirks, but not all of us. Nice to meet you, Izuku said with a wide smile. My name's Vanguard. Shouto, Todoroki said with a nod. He wasn't unfriendly exactly, but he definitely didn't show the enthusiasm that Izuku was feeling. You're both from UA. 
Cinder asked as he ate a huge portion of Amaris. Cinder was a burly man with close-cropped white hair, and his costume was basically just orange pants and combat boots. Even so, he appeared to have a light sheen of sweat covering his body, maybe because he ran hot inside. Izuku knew his own father had a much higher core temperature than normal. Yes, sir, Izuku said. Shouto and I are classmates. First years. Another hero at the table asked. This hero had mostly been paying attention to the television screen mounted near the ceiling by the door while they had been talking. Yes, Izuku confirmed. Wait, the woman said after really looking at Izuku. You were the winner of the sports festival, but you didn't show up for the award ceremony because you got kidnapped. True, he said, trying hard not to blush in embarrassment. It hadn't really been his fault he'd been taken like that. Vanguard, Shouto, this is hot spot. Vernon introduced. Both boys nodded to her. Things are getting crazy out there. Recently, a kid gets taken from the middle of the UA campus, a hero killer's on the loose, and crime is just generally on the rise. All Might's been teaching, and now all of the scum think it's okay to show their faces in public. That stained guy is the most worrying. If you ask me, Cinder said, guy's as crazy as a. Well, he's crazy. Endeavor really wants to be the one to take him down. Izuku had a feeling the man had censored his speech because of him and Shouto. He absently handed the pepper shaker on the table to burn in and the soy sauce over to Cinder. They both just looked at him for a moment before taking the offered items to season their food. Ingenium is our classmate's brother. His family is taking it pretty hard, from all accounts, Izuku said, thinking of how strangely Ida had been acting. All of the heroes at the table winced and looked sad. He was a great hero, Cinder lamented, and a really nice guy. He's not dead, Izuku pointed out, finally getting started on his breakfast. He's still a great guy. And his quirk is in his arms, so his hero career doesn't really have to be over, does it? He can't feel his legs, kid. I appreciate that you don't want to believe. He's right, Todoroki said quietly, making everyone in the table look at him. Once he recovers as much as possible, he could still do hero work. It would just have to be a different kind. Izuku nodded and shot Todoroki a grateful look. Exactly, Izuku insisted. The engines in his arms could still move a vehicle, even a specialized wheelchair. Anyway, I wouldn't count him out just yet. Huh, I guess I just assumed he was done. Cinder admitted. Would you give up like that, if it happened to you? Vernon asked him. Hell, no, Cinder declared. I'd rig up a wheelchair to have pouches full of rocks for me. Izuku looked pleased that his point had been understood. He didn't believe a serious hero could just give it up when things got really rough. There had to be a part of Ingenium that was impatient and longing to get back out there, making a difference. If not, it wasn't because he couldn't physically adapt, but because he'd had enough for other reasons. They finished breakfast and were led to a pair of training rooms on another floor. Todoroki was sent to meet a hero named Kaido in one room, while Izuku went with Burn into one just down the hall. The room they entered was a simple empty square, with windows along one wall. There didn't seem to be any cabinets or equipment, just a bare concrete floor and plain walls. Don't worry, Burnin told him as she walked to the center of the room. Everything around here is fireproof or fire retardant. Izuku nodded, wondering if that was confirmation that she'd be wielding fire in some way, or if she expected him to. Okay, Vanguard, she told him with a smile. I thought we'd start off with a little sparring. I want to see how you move and react. I'll come at you, both using my quirk and my skill. And your job is to try to evade me or incapacitate me by pinning me or getting me in a hold I can't break out. Use your quirk or any skills you have, too. Sounds fair, Izuku said, taking quick stock of his surroundings. He knew that super strength was a bad idea indoors, especially in the upper floors of such a tall building. He would have to dial it down, if he needed it. Other than that, he didn't see any of his other quirks hampering his success. Let's begin, she said with a gleeful grin. Vernon hadn't been kidding when she said she would come at him. One second she was smiling at him, and the next, she was hurling flames at him by gripping the ends of her flaming hair and using them as weapons. Izuku dodged the first volley of attacks with some simple gymnastics. He was thankful for the fire-retardant qualities of his costume though. When she landed a hit to his leg, the impact made the flames seem to splash, almost like a liquid, and he feared for a moment that the flames might actually be lava or some sort of flammable liquid. The flames extinguished themselves, and he breathed a sigh of relief even as he was forced to keep dodging. The speed of her attack was impressive, and she advanced on him as if she wanted to drive him into a corner. When dodging and trying to advance on her didn't get him anywhere, he levitated to the ceiling and crawled over the tiles, glad they were reinforced to withstand the pressure he put on them. He scrambled to get over her head, but she proved to be quick on her feet, as well. You can float, huh? She said with a smile. Pretty useful quirk. I thought it was super strength. He could see how she might think that, due to his performance at the sports festival. But if she didn't know about his levitation... What else didn't she know about him? Not that she would be impressed by his transparency or knowing that she really wanted to have a cupcake for a snack. 
He simply had to keep trying things until he found something that worked. He finally let himself drop to the floor again, and charged up one for all, green sparks webbing around him. Interesting trick, Vernon said, staying on the balls of her feet and keeping her eyes glued to Izuku. Is that for distraction? Before she could blink, Izuku had already thrown her over his shoulder onto the floor and was holding her immobile with his own body. He easily forced her to flip over and put her wrists together behind her. He held them in place with one gloved hand while he used pull to summon restraints from a pouch on his hip. From there, he was able to secure her, leaving her unable to reach her hair while he also secured her ankles. Hold on, you have two quirks. Three, she squawked indignantly. Thirteen, actually, Izuku said with a grin at the flabbergasted look on her face. Thirteen, that's crazy. No one has that many quirks, she said, squirming against her bonds. I do, he corrected. So, does this round go to me? Yeah, yeah, she said, grumpily. You win. This time, Izuku took a moment to release Burnin, who rubbed her wrists and scowled before hopping to her feet. What the heck, kid? Your moves are crazy good. Izuku grinned before admitting, I trained with pro heroes off and on since I was ten. The temperature in the room was noticeably colder now than it had been before, and now they could see their breaths on the frigid air. Seems like shadows use in his ice next door, Burnin observed. Izuku raised his eyebrows at that. These walls were undoubtedly thick. How much ice would Shadow have to be putting out to chill adjacent rooms to his extent? Vernon's hair seemed to become fuller around her head and burn a little brighter, possibly to compensate for the temperature change. Izuku was about to question her further, but there was a loud beeping coming from the closed door. Vernon strode over and unlocked the door, which slid open to reveal Shadow and a man wrapped in bandages everywhere there might have been exposed skin. He wore a flak jacket and gloves, and Izuku surmised that this must be Kaido, who Vernon had mentioned earlier. Change of plans, Kaido said as he moved into the room. The other room is now an ice cube, so I was thinking it would be a good idea to combine into one group. Shadow didn't show the slightest bit of emotion when all eyes turned to him at the words ice cube. He simply followed Kaido into the room and looked around. Fine by me, Vernon said. It's a little early, but we were planning on doing that anyway. Izuku soon learned that Shadow found it harder to maneuver his ice when there was another person he had to avoid freezing. The power behind his ice quirk was incredibly strong but Shadow didn't have the finesse to craft anything with it. He could control how much he produced. And he could produce it incredibly quickly, but he couldn't make it do much else. Izuku tried to stay out of Shadow's way, but Kaido had a quirk that allowed him to change the direction of anything in motion, including people. It was harder to stay still while burning through flames at them with lightning speed, but it was even harder to move when they kept getting whipped around in odd directions, often into the path of flames, ice or each other. You cover me from Burnin for a minute, Izuku told Shadow after the second time they collided with each other. They'd been getting led around by the nose for at least a half an hour by this time, and he was getting worn down. Shadow nodded and focused his attention on Burnin, who kept herself in motion and difficult to freeze. Izuku allowed himself to levitate to the ceiling, ignoring the way he skidded across the ceiling tiles as Kaido directed his motion like a conductor directed a symphony. When friction did its job and Izuku came to a stop, he braced his feet and back before charging up one for all and using pull on Kaido. Not knowing how well it would work, Izuku put as much power as he could into it and was rewarded with a very undignified shriek as both Burnin and Kaido shot toward Izuku. This was tricky, because he needed to avoid pulling Shado as well. Before they could reach him, he let go of the pull and let them drop. Shado, now, Izuku called out as the two were falling. Shado stepped forward and sent ice out to catch their opponents, encasing them. Izuku Crab walked sideways to avoid the ice jutting up below him before he dropped down to the floor and walked over to the captives. Nice work, Izuku told Todoroki with a small smile. Both boys were a little worse for wear, with scrapes and bruises that would surely surface soon from all of their collisions with the walls, floor and each other. Not to mention the burns. You too, Todoroki said, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand to find his lip was bleeding. There was a hissing sound as steam began to erupt from the top of the ice, and Izuku could see a yellow-green glow around Burnin's head. She was using the flames on her head to free herself. They would have needed to be freed anyway, since Todoroki didn't have the capability to wrap the ice in a bubble with air enough to stay stuck for a while without suffocation. It was interesting that there were enough air bubbles in there for her hair to stay lit or reignite. Nice try, but as long as I have my flames, I can still fight, Burnin said as soon as her head was free. Her hair burned brighter as she emerged more from the ice, and Kaido's head was also becoming unstuck and he took a huge gasp of air as Burnin's boosted her flames even more. Izuku counted the pouches on his belt until he found the sixth one and pulled a pellet about the size of a marble from inside and flicked it at Burnin's head. The pellet expanded and then seemed to sublimate, snuffing out the flames and leaving a powdery residue behind. Shadow actually let out a snort at that, surprising Izuku. 
What was that? She demanded. First, are we the winners? He asked, just to be sure. She looked like she was concentrating on something, maybe trying to reignite her hair, before Kaido spoke up. You win. Just get me out of this ice. I'm gonna freeze to death. Izuku nodded in acceptance and slammed the heel of his hand against the ice, causing it to shatter and fall away in chunks. Both heroes were visibly shivering, and Shouto walked over to raise a hand and radiate heat to warm and dry them a bit. That stings, Kaido complained, shaking his hands and jogging in place to increase circulation. What did you do to my hair? Burnin demanded again. Quick snuff pellet, Izuku said, holding up another for her examine. When it comes in contact with intense heat, it'll explode into a fire extinguishing powder. At this size, it'll put a normal-sized human out if they're on fire, or a small blaze of any other kind. Since I found out that one of my classmates had a fire quirk, I decided it would be worth it to keep a supply on hand. So, it'll wash out, she asked, sounding more annoyed than worried. It should. If it doesn't, let me know and I'll ask the person who gave them to me, Izuku answered. He guessed he should have asked Sir about that to begin with, but would be happy to report how well they'd worked the next time they met. For now, he was sure that Sir had his hands full with the three interns he'd taken on this year. Well, I'd say that even though this training session didn't go as planned, the end result was good. You two discovered that making a plan and working together is the best way to tackle a problem that's too big for a single person. Vernon said, sounding satisfied. And we learn not to underestimate interns, just because you're only first years, Kaido said, still shivering. Vernon and I need to hit the showers, so you two have some free time until your next round of training. You should take the opportunity to check out the facilities and find your way to the bullpen on the second floor. That's where calls come in requesting heroes, and we get dispatched based on what's needed. Shouto nodded and turned to walk away. Izuku paused to thank Vernon and Kaido for their training and then jogged to catch up with Todoroki. Have you spent a lot of time here before? As Izuku followed him into the elevator. Not really, Todoroki answered. My father likes it when I show any kind of interest in learning how this place works. So I tend to avoid it. Izuku just stared at him, trying to figure out why he'd shoot himself in the foot like that. Um, I know you don't get along with your father, but that's kind of. He paused to change his wording, because he wanted to say dumb, counterintuitive. You wouldn't understand, Todoroki said flatly. Maybe not the part about your father, but do you really want to be a hero, or is it like your dad's making you? Todoroki thought about that for so long that Izuku was almost sure he was just going to ignore the question. The elevator dinged and the doors slid open to the second floor before he finally answered. I guess it's both. Okay, so why not take what you can from this experience? I mean, he's still the number two and knows a lot about the business and how to run an agency. That's valuable knowledge. No matter who you learn it from, right? Izuku shrugged when Todoroki just looked at him for a moment and then continued walking through a set of double doors across the hall from the elevator. The room they entered was a hive of activity. There were people walking around in a hurry and coming in and going out, sometimes even through an open window, for those who could fly. There was a small seating area with a few heroes sitting and discussing things to one side, and a wide aisle down the middle of rows of desks pushed together that seemed to make up workspaces for all of the heroes to do their paperwork or await assignment. There was office equipment as well, and aside from the brightly colored costumes and the sometimes loud conversations, it seemed like any other busy office space. Hey, aren't you the newbies who were supposed to be training with Burnin and Kaido this morning? Someone asked when they were spotted. We finished early, Izuku told the man. This hero was tall and thin, and had bushy gray hair. His hero costume was white with gray accents, and he had aviator-type goggles perched on his forehead. That's odd, the man said with a frown. Is one of you injured? We have an infirmary. Huh, is someone hurt, Mamunga? Another hero asked, looking up with concern. This hero's skin was so dark brown it was nearly black, which was a startling contrast to his yellow eyes. His costume was a one piece that was bright yellow at the bottom and gradually turned to orange near his waist and then red at the shoulders. He walked over to Izuku and Shouto, also looking concerned. Your endeavors, kid, he said in recognition. Shouto sighed quietly. We're interning this week. Ah, uh, well, that explains it. Welcome to the bullpen. He said, his manner turning friendly in an instant. I'm Rocket. Mamanga frowned and looked at Rocket. They were supposed to be training with Burnin and Kaido, but said they finished early. Early, did they have to leave on a call? I didn't hear anything about it, Rocket said. They both needed to shower. Izuku said sheepishly. I kind of put out Burnin's hair, and Kaido was frozen in a block of ice. Twice, Shouto added. Rocket and Mamanga burst out laughing. You put out Burnin's hair. Mamanga wheezed. She's gotta be pretty pissed. Izuku suddenly wondered if he was in trouble. She hadn't seemed super mad, but maybe she hid it well. Should I be worried? Izuku asked. Well, if she didn't strangle you on the spot, I think you'll be okay, Rocket said with a grin. But she's a spitfire, so be on your toes. Noted. Anyway, let me show you around a bit, Rocket offered. 
What are your names? I'm Vanguard, Izuku said enthusiastically. Shouto, Todoroki supplied. You might want something a little more. Private, Rocket warned Shouto. You're bound to become relatively famous because of your roots, if nothing else. Using your first name as a hero name could strip you of a lot of privacy in the future. Shouto blinked slowly and finally nodded when it seemed like Rocket was expecting a response. Okay, Vanguard and Shouto, he said. I'm Rocket, as you heard from Mamanga, here. Mamanga waved, then turned back to his desk as his phone rang. This is the main work and dispatch area for the flaming psychicers. He spread his arms out to encompass the entire area proudly. Everyone had their own desk, since there's a lot of paperwork, well, computer work anyway. Once you get your hero license in a year or two, you'll learn really quickly that bureaucrats love everyone to fill out tons of forms. Rocket moved further into the space and pointed to an area in the far corner. There's a main switchboard that most calls come through, kind of like police dispatch. Sometimes we're just given an assignment and head out immediately. And other times we take calls to determine what's going on and how we can help. He went on to explain about the different types of jobs they could be called out on, and what they might be likely to run into while on patrol. It was very clear that they were all proud of their work and their status as burning psychicers. This building wasn't just a place they worked for many of them, but their home, as well. The dormitory housed at least two-thirds of the psychics in Endeavor's employ, and many had been with the agency for years. Izuku found it a fascinating concept, and wondered if the new psychics and interns were also living in Might Tower. He would have to remember to ask, since it didn't seem likely that he'd be having a nice little chat with Kakin about it once they got back to school. By the time Rocket was showing them the leaderboard by the switchboard, Vernon returned with her hair alight as bright as it had been when Izuku had met her earlier. Sorry about your hair. Izuku apologized when he saw her. Never be sorry about an honest victory, she told him. Still, there was a glint in her eye when Rocket looked at her in surprise. The newbie beat you in a fight. That turned heads and there was some murmuring from those nearby. Vernon straightened to her full height and glared. Wait until it's your turn to train with them, she said. These two are no joke. Shadow's been trained by Endeavor. And Vanguard has moves I certainly didn't have as a first-year student, maybe even as a first-year rookie. They're good, and they're only going to get better. Izuku tried not to swell too much with pride and excitement. She could be laying it on thick to save her ego, after all. Vernon had Izuku and Todoroki hang around the switchboard for a while to get a feel for how frequently calls came in. And what types? Then she told them to wander around and observe what everyone was doing with their time, and to feel free to ask any questions that they had. Izuku went back to talk to Mamanga, since he was wondering if his quirk had any relation to his name, which was a type of flying squirrel native to Japan. It turned out that it did, and that the hero was able to manifest wings similar to the flying squirrel made out of flame between the wrist and ankle on each side of his body. They had been talking about it for a few minutes when Endeavor strode into the room. Every person in the room stood and bowed politely until he nodded and they all went back to what they were doing. He made eye contact with Izuku and gestured for him to follow, then did the same to Shouto. You'll be training with me for the next hour, he said as flatly as his son often spoke. We'll go to my personal dojo. Shouto seemed to stiffen at the words private dojo, but didn't object as they followed Endeavor to the elevator. It turned out that the space they'd be training in looked like a traditional Japanese dojo with tatami mats covering the floors and the floor-to-ceiling windows treated to look like shouji with dark wooden lattice work to complete the illusion. Tall wooden pillars at even intervals around the room were simply well-disguised support beams, and the room had an overall calming effect when they entered. What sort of martial arts do you practice? Izuku asked as he surveyed the space with appreciation. My own, Endeavor said. I've taken aspects of all of the ones I excel most at and have added them to my training regimen. Mixed martial arts then, Izuku guessed, something he himself should probably look into learning more about. This could be an excellent opportunity. Shouto made a quiet scoffing noise, and Izuku glanced at him. Do you practice martial arts, too? He's supposed to, Endeavor answered for him, but he's stubborn. Have you been trained? I did some judo in primary school, and had some private instruction from mentors, but nothing really extensive as far as a particular martial art other than boxing, Izuku said. I'm ready to learn anything you can teach me. Hopefully that attitude will rub off on Shouto, Endeavor said, pointedly looking at his son as he said it instead of Izuku. Izuku wondered what the problem was between the two, but understood that it would be prying into things that were none of his business if he brought it up. Now was not the time, either. Still, he had a feeling that the best way for Endeavor to endear himself to his son might be to not constantly compare him to others. Well then, let's begin. Shouto, you will stand aside and observe for the moment. Vanguard, you will do your best to block my attacks. Should I be trying to take you down? Izuku asked, shaking his limbs to loosen up a bit. That earned an incredulous look from Shouto, and a sharp bark of laughter from Endeavor. You can try. Izuku had no doubt that he'd fail at attempting to take down the flame hero, but it seemed wrong not to try. 
If All Might and Sir had taught him anything, it was that failures taught a person much more than success did, and he was here to learn. I assume your suit is at least flame-resistant, Endeavor asked as he moved to the center of the room. You don't seem to be singed or burned from your earlier training with Burnin and Kaido. Izuku did have a couple of spots on his skin, especially his cheeks, that stung from earlier. He wasn't going to complain about a few first-degree burns though, when he was being given an opportunity to learn from one of the best in the business. He made sure to palm a couple of the quicksniff pellets as he took his place across from his opponent, possibly to use on himself. From the moment the match began, Izuku was constantly on the move. He had a feeling that if Hagakure hadn't trimmed his hair so short on top, he'd have had the excess burned off by the time they were a minute into the fight. Dodging and blocking the flurry of punches and kicks was keeping him busy enough, but there were also jets of flame shot his way at the same time. He mentally thanked every teacher he'd ever had for the lessons and footwork in a fight. Even then, he took several glancing blows that he was given no time to recover from. The heat was making Izuku sweat even more than the exertion and it seriously seemed that Endeavor was toying with him the entire time. The hero didn't even seem to be concentrating all that hard, and kept making offhand remarks to Shouto about a move Izuku had made or what Shouto should have done in the same situation. It felt like he was using Izuku as an object lesson, which wasn't bad, per se, but it was frustrating to know he was working so hard against someone who didn't seem to even be trying. Izuku didn't have time to look at where Shouto was standing to see if he was even paying attention. He continued to use acrobatics, speed and levitation to keep from being pummeled or burned, looking for any openings or patterns to Endeavor's movements. There didn't seem to be any. Even when the match spread out into the room instead of being centered in one spot like a normal spar, Izuku was given no quarter. He dodged, flipped, leapt and spun, and used the huge pillars around the room for cover for a few seconds to regroup and catch his breath. He needed a strategy. Izuku began to change the colors of the accessories on his costume each time he was out of Endeavor's line of sight for a moment. If the fiery hero noticed, he didn't mention it, but Izuku knew he was no fool. First one shoe, then the other. Belt, gloves, headgear. On one final dodge behind a pillar, he changed the base suit of his costume, so he was the same color as the wood he was hiding behind. Then he levitated to the ceiling and held his breath to add transparency to the mix. He could hear his heart thundering as he pulled in as tightly as he could and turned himself upside down with his legs bent. And his feet against the ceiling coiled like a spring. He strained his hearing to try to sense Endeavor, to see if and when he'd approach. This was the longest he'd let Izuku out of his sight since the bout began, and Izuku wondered if he'd called it quits or if he was waiting for Izuku to beg for mercy. Izuku deliberately didn't charge up one for all, not wanting the verdant sparks to give away his location, and knew he'd have to really strain to use what he could call forth past his normal level in the few seconds he had for his plan. I'm not finished with you, kid, Endeavor said, sounding as though he was just on the other side of the pillar. Enough stalling. When Izuku still didn't budge, even though he was straining with the effort to hold his breath, Endeavor rounded the pillar with a spurt of flame, but from a short distance. Izuku didn't wait to see if Endeavor was confused when he didn't find Izuku where he should have been, but thrust his legs straight and shot out toward his opponent. The pellets of quick snuff were flung out, one from each hand, and Endeavor managed to smack one away before it exploded, while the other hit and dispersed near his shoulder. The resultant cloud of powder extinguishing his flames was enough of a distraction for Izuku to get in close enough to try to tackle Endeavor, but it didn't quite happen that way. Hitting the hero was like smacking into a brick wall. Izuku let out in an audible oof as he collided with the huge form, then yelped when he felt a scorching heat envelop him before he could recover from the impact and roll away. The situation wasn't helped by Endeavor, who shoved him backward hard enough for him to smack his back against the pillar he'd just launched from. He was dazed for a moment, but managed to dodge when Endeavor reached for him and crouched into a fighting stance. Stop and let me check you for burns, Endeavor commanded sternly. It took Izuku a moment to register that Endeavor had extinguished his usually perpetual flames and was scowling at him. Izuku snapped out of fight mode and stood up straight, breathing heavily. He looked over at Shouto, who was staring at him with his mouth hanging open. Is it bad? Izuku asked, feeling suddenly concerned by the look on both of their faces. Endeavor looked Izuku over without touching him for a moment and then asked, Pain. Izuku took stock of himself before shaking his head. Sore, but nothing out of the ordinary for a pretty intense sparring match. My face stings. It should be blistered, or even charred, Endeavor said cautiously. Whatever you threw at me was hard to burn off, so I used flash fire for a couple of seconds. Ha, huh, was all Izuku could think to say. He assumed that flash fire was especially hot. He raised his hand and touched his cheek with his exposed index finger and hissed. His skin felt as hot as it might if he had a bad sunburn. Good to know that the quick snuff will only buy me a couple of seconds if the fire's hot enough, Izuku noted. 
That's enough one-on-one -on -one for you for now, Endeavor decided. If you don't need to visit our infirmary, take a seat over there and watch. He motioned to Shu Izuku over to where Shouto was standing with his arms crossed and a calculating expression on his face. Shouto, Endeavor barked as Izuku walked over to the wall and sat down. Shouto walked over to where his father was waiting, defiance written in every line of his body. You'll have the same goal as Vanguard, Endeavor told him. With one exception, Izuku watched as the hero waited for his son to make eye contact with him. No ice. Todoroki's scowl intensified as he stared down his father. You've become too dependent on it, Endeavor told him. If you won't use your flame, then at least learn to fight without your ice as well. It could save you in a fight. This will be a no-quirk fight for both of us. This made perfect sense to Izuku, who had been taught not to rely too heavily on anything but his own resourcefulness and skill. Quirks were absolutely great tools. But in the end it was your intelligence and ability to think clearly in tense moments that would serve best. Still, he had been hoping that ice filling up some of the room would help cool his burned face. He noticed that little flecks of ash fell from his hair, and he realized that it was pretty singed, after all. The fight that followed was brutal, and Izuku wondered if Endeavor had been going easy on him as he watched father and son face off. Neither of them pulled any punches, though surprisingly few hits actually landed solidly. Shouto didn't actually land any hits. But Endeavor only got a couple in, either. They were both excellent at blocking and their kicks and punches were powerful. Endeavor had the advantage of reach because of his superior height. But Shouto was not as inadequate as he'd been made out to be. Even without his eyes, Shouto was a formidable opponent, which was why it was even more puzzling when Endeavor kept taunting his son. You're weak, Shouto. You're never going to surpass me, let alone All Might, at the rate you're going. Shouto merely grunted as he continued to block, but he was beginning to lose ground. At least Vanguard made an attempt at a plan. You don't even have that. A sudden vicious kick to his leg had Shouto falling to the ground, but he immediately sprang back up and dodged another of the same. It was clear that the constant berating and barrage of hits that were making more and more frequent contact were beginning to anger Shouto. He was getting sloppy with his strikes and his breathing was far more ragged than it should be, even with how long they'd been at it. He needed to take a break and calm down, but it was clear that Endeavor was not going to let that happen. Maybe Endeavor was trying to goad Shouto into using flame, even though the match was supposed to be without quirks. The fight lasted another five minutes, but by the end, it was more one-sided that Izuku was comfortable with. Endeavor was basically just delivering a beating, and Izuku was on his feet and about to intervene when a wall of ice sprang up between father and son. To CH, weak, Endeavor spat angrily. Get yourselves cleaned up and get to the briefing room. Patrol starts immediately after lunch. Izuku gave a hasty bow as Endeavor strode past looking disgusted then rushed over to Shouto. Are you okay? He asked, crouching beside the bi-colored boy who was looking defeated and angry as he sat on the ground and caught his breath. Yeah, he said with a gravelly voice, wrapping an arm around his middle. This isn't really anything new. Still, he winced when he got to his feet. Izuku's eyebrows rose at the statement, but stood back to give Todoroki room. You might need a trip to the infirmary, Izuku suggested. No, like I said, this is nothing new. Izuku didn't like the sound of that. He decided to try a new tack. Well, okay, but, could you show me where it is? I'd like to see if they have some ointment to cool my skin. I think I might be a bit more toasted than I thought. He must have looked and sounded convincing, because after only a short pause where Todoroki studied him, he nodded and gestured for Izuku to follow him. You spar with your father like that a lot, Izuku asked while they rode the elevator down to the third floor, pretty much daily. He said without emotion, some days he goes a little extra to prove a point, like today. Seems he likes having an audience. Izuku hoped that that it didn't get more extra than this. So, he was going easy on me. Izuku guessed as they exited the elevator. They passed a sidekicker on the way who took one look at them and winced in sympathy. You think he was going easy on you? Shouto repeated, stopping in his tracks. Easy. Well, I'm not saying I found it easy. Izuku said with a shrug. I just think that he definitely had the power to take me down a lot faster than he did. He's crazy strong. It seemed like he was harder on you. But he didn't take you down, Shouto told him. He stopped the fight because he thought he'd nearly killed you. But it was just a matter of time. Izuku insisted. He won, either way. I don't think you get it, Shouto said, resuming walking. I've never landed a hit on him before. Never, Izuku asked, falling into step with him again. I mean, I technically never hit him, either, but I'll bet you've trapped him with your eyes. Not for more than a half a second, and probably only because he wanted to teach me a lesson. His fire's too much, Shouto said. You saw how he burned through the quick snuff. They reached a door with the red cross sign on it and Izuku followed Shouto in. Yo, a voice said, as a man on a rolling stool propelled himself into sight with a little spin. Yikes, were you in a wreck? The man got to his feet and walked over to Shouto, which is what Izuku had hoped would happen. 
You really took a beating, the man said with a nasally sounding voice. The name tag on his white lab coat said, Doc on it. He seemed to have a cold or allergies, and his nose was clogged. Something like that, Shouto said. I'm fine. He's the one who needs to be looked at. Nice try, but you look way worse than he does. I'll give you both a once over. You two are new here. In turns, Izuku told him. Training was a bit. Ah, uh, well, don't feel bad. Our burning psychicers are strong and intense. They take their jobs seriously. Doc told them with a sniffle. You're right, Izuku told him. They're amazing. He wasn't sure why he didn't just tell the man that Endeavor was the one responsible for their injuries. But Shouto didn't say anything, either. It was something to think about. That Endeavor had told Izuku that Shouto had fired to rival his own. Still, Doc said, looks like they really went all out. I should tell them to take it easy before they break something. My quirk can only handle so much, you know. I was just hoping for something to soothe the burns, Izuku told him. He pulled off his headgear and revealed much harsher burns where the straps touching his face had been. It seemed the plastic had held up under the intense heat, but had also stored it and transferred through to Izuku's skin. He might do well to ask for a silicone coating for it in the future. Why didn't you take that off right away? Doc asked him, examining his face. I didn't think it was any worse under there. I thought maybe my sweat was just making it sting more. Izuku told him. I kind of hand other things on my mind at the time. Okay, Doc said, blowing his nose into a neat white handkerchief. I can handle this, at least. Close your eyes. A moment later, Izuku could hear water or liquid sloshing and feel damp cloth on his face, including his eyelids. The burning instantly receded, leaving a nice, cool tingling in its place. The cloth rubbed a few more times with Doc murmuring about how the moisture just beat it up. That should do it, Doc told him after a minute. You can open your eyes. Izuku did, and saw that Todoroki had a look of revulsion on his face. The doctor tossed the cloth he had used on Izuku's face into a hamper for towels and smiled as he looked Izuku over once more. Looks like your fingers got toasted, too, Doc said, grabbing Izuku's wrists. Hold up your hands. Izuku obediently held up his hands, noting that his index fingers, which his gloves left bare, were red. Doc produced another white handkerchief and blew his nose then dipped the handkerchief into a beaker of water, then used that handkerchief to wipe down Izuku's fingers. Uh, that explained the revulsion of Shouto's face. Izuku suddenly felt very soiled. Um, thanks, Izuku said, trying not to sound ungrateful as the man wiped his hands on a towel from his pocket. The redness and burning was gone. At least, don't mention it. Sinks over there, he pointed to the counter against the wall. You can rinse your hands and face. Your skin's a bit weird, though. Rinse, no, wash, with soap. Lots of soap. He was super glad for his Teflon quirk at the moment, knowing that there couldn't be much residue left behind. Izuku's face and hands stung for a different reason after he was done scrubbing his skin, and didn't blame Shouto one bit for stepping back away from Doc and insisting that he was fine. Don't be such a baby, Doc told him. My snot quirk only heals burns, anyway. You only get ice packs and bandages. That seemed to mollify Todoroki enough to let Doc wrap his ribs with stretchy bandages and clean up his abrasion. He produced his own ice. Do you need anything else? Doc asked, making notes on his computer. Where's the briefing room? Izuku asked, tugging his gloves back on. A moment later, they were on their way, Izuku feeling much better, but also much worse. He wondered if he'd have time for a shower before their patrol after lunch. Todoroki looked okay, but Izuku knew he had to have some bruising in his future. Did he really go through this sort of thing that often? The briefing room took up half of the ninth floor, with rows of chairs facing one end of the room, where there was a table and a lectern set up, and large screens for sharing computer images or videos on. Brennan saw them and waved them over to sit near her. Glad you made it. Almost everyone who's available is strongly encouraged to come to the daily briefing session. It's where we find out the latest on what's happening in our area, things we should be keeping an eye out for, where crime has been highest recently and that sort of thing. There are increased patrols in the afternoons through to morning. When crime tends to be the most common, she explained as the room filled up. Izuku saw some heroes with notebooks or tablets, and pulled a small notepad and pen from his pocket, just in case there was anything he thought was important, and settled in to listen. Still, he kept thinking about Shouto's match with Endeavor and what he was missing between them. Lunch was a lively affair. When they heard that Izuku had gotten the snot treatment and everyone had a good laugh over their revulsion, they regaled Izuku and Shouto with accounts of times when Doc had tried making himself sneeze on burns to heal them, then realizing that there wasn't enough mucus to do the job and having to go the other route. Izuku didn't eat much after hearing about it, but was good-natured about it. Shouto didn't eat much either, and Izuku wondered if it was because he was in too much pain. After lunch, they were directed to meet Endeavor at the front entrance, and patrol began. It was different than Izuku had expected, but he still paid close attention making mental notes of everything he experienced. Unlike when All Might or any of the other heroes Izuku had observed outside of fighting villains, no one really approached Endeavor. 
There were excited whispers and pointing and even people shouting greetings to him from doorways of business, but he didn't really interact beyond raising a hand and acknowledgement every once in a while. Shouto and Izuku trailed slightly behind the flame hero, but didn't chat with each other or speak at all, really. It was kind of boring. There weren't many criminals or villains that would dare to commit a crime with Endeavor patrolling the street. Apparently there were not many law-abiding citizens who weren't cowed by him, either. Izuku found this to be disappointing, but understandable. At the end of the hour's long patrol, the biggest excitement that they'd had was when Izuku had levitated up to help a storekeeper hang a banner over their shop window, and Shouto had helped an old lady carry her two heavy grocery bags. Endeavor left them after their patrol with a satisfied smirk, telling them that when you cut an imposing figure, the streets were safe and patrols were practically unnecessary. He told them that they were finished for the day and that they should get some dinner and get a good night's rest. Typical, Shouto grumbled as Endeavor walked away. Izuku looked at him inquiringly. Did you learn anything from that patrol? Anything at all? Shouto asked. Not much, Izuku confessed. Except that Endeavor is intimidating to pretty much everyone. Exactly. Shouto walked away then, heading for the elevators, and Izuku followed. He was tired, but not sleepy, and decided that he should change out of his costume and wash up, then get food. Shouto didn't say anything beyond, see you, before disappearing into his own dorm room. He'd washed and gotten some food inside of him. Feeling better after a meal, Izuku took out the notebook he'd bought especially for this internship and went to sit in the common area outside of the dorm rooms. There was a television that some off-duty heroes were sitting around watching, and another on the adjacent wall where a few were playing video games. The seating areas were grouped so that several people could sit and visit with each other, and a few smaller places where anyone who wanted to be alone or talk with another person in relative privacy could go. It was a nice open space that felt comfortable and homey. Izuku didn't want to seem too antisocial, but at the same time he wanted to observe more than he wanted to talk. He chose a comfy armchair that was situated off to the side next to another, unoccupied one. If someone wanted to seek him out to chat, it was available, but he busied himself with his notebook to kind of discourage it at the same time. He didn't realize how long he'd been engrossed in making notes about Burnin, Kaido and Mamanga until Todoroki flopped into the chair beside him and he looked up to find the room nearly empty. Couldn't sleep either, Todoroki asked. I, uh, Izuku hedged. I haven't tried, yet. Todoroki raised an eyebrow, and Izuku wondered exactly how late it was. I guess I was so busy with this that I lost track of time, Izuku confessed. You're having trouble sleeping. I'm used to sleeping in a futon, he said simply. What are you working on? Uh, I have a habit of making notes about all of the heroes I meet. Analyzing quirks is sort of my hobby, Izuku told him, feeling slightly embarrassed. Can I see? Todoroki asked, holding out his hand. It's not very good, Izuku said automatically, feeling protective over the notebook, but not really having an excuse to hide it from anyone. He handed it over, and Todoroki took it and thumbed through the pages. You did all of this just today, he asked, studying the page about Mamanga. The page included a rough sketch, what little he knew about the quirk and its mechanics, and a list of questions he had about it. There was also a small section on possible ways to counter any attacks by the hero. Yeah, Izuku said, fidgeting to avoid making grabby hands to ask for his book back. There isn't a page about Endeavor, Todoroki observed, flipping through the blank pages at the back, just to check that he hadn't missed anything. He has pages in another book, Izuku said, not missing the fact that he hadn't referred to him as his dad or father. Is there a page on me, or do you only do heroes? Todoroki asked, closing the notebook and passing it back. Izuku blushed in embarrassment. I, uh, I have a notebook full of pages about everyone in our class. He admitted, including you, hum, Todoroki said. Izuku was just glad his classmate wasn't creeped out or offended by the idea. Which reminds me, Izuku said. I know you have your ice, and once you use it, it has to melt or be melted to go away. But what about your fire? Can you like, suck fire in like a vacuum? Say, a car is on fire and there are people inside. Could you make the fire go out, or redirect it? I, don't know, Todoroki admitted, seeming like he was considering the matter. I've never tried. Is that one of the questions from your pages about me? Izuku nodded. I've been making notebooks like this for as long as I can remember. Quirks are so different and fascinating. Of course, even though no one really knows exactly what his quirk is, All Might was my first entry, Izuku said, feeling the sudden need to fill the silence. Since he's always been my idol. Mine, too, Todoroki said. Izuku looked over to see if Todoroki was teasing him, but his face was as stoic as ever. Really, even with your dad being a hero. You didn't grow up with him, Todoroki said, looking as if he'd smelled something unpleasant. He's a great hero, but he's not a particularly good man. Izuku felt awkward hearing such a thing, but he was curious. His own father was a good man. And in many ways, Izuku saw him as a hero, too. Is that why you don't use your fire? Because you don't want to be like him, sort of, Shouto said with a sigh. 
Have you ever heard of quirk marriages? It took a moment for Izuku to switch gears and search his memory banks for the answer. Isn't that when two people with really good quirks get married, so they can have kids with even better? Oh, yes. Oh, Todoroki nodded slightly, sounding bitter. Except my mother wasn't exactly a willing participant. It was an arranged marriage. Her family had status, but not wealth. My father had both. He expected her to produce one or more children with both of their quirks, so he could train them up to surpass both him and All Might to create this great legacy. My earliest memories are of my mother trying to protect me from him and his so-called training. He was obsessed with training me, and ignored the others. I was never allowed to play or spend time with my brothers or sister. I don't have a lot of memories of my mother where she's not crying because of him. He drove her into a corner, and she finally snapped one day and poured boiling water on the half of my face that looked most like him. When she realized what she'd done, she tried to use her quirk to stop the burn, but that only made it scar more. Todoroki pointed to the scar over his left eye. Izuku had always assumed that his scar had been the result of an accident with his quirk. It wasn't that unusual for kids to be injured when they first manifested, though it was rarely so severe. Um, that's really. Izuku had a whole slew of words he could use to describe how he felt about what he'd just heard. But none of them seemed very polite. Disgusting. Unreasonable. Abusive. Appalling. Todoroki suggested. Drawing his feet up onto the seat cushion and resting his chin on his knees. Any of those would work. I'm the youngest of four. And the only one who got both quirks equally balanced. He likes to call me his masterpiece. The expression on Izuku's face must have betrayed his horror. Because Todoroki nodded, as if in agreement. It was hard to imagine growing up in a family where the only reason you were born was because your father wanted to force his child to succeed beyond what he had been able to. But I still don't understand. You're not using your fire, just because it's what he wants you to do. Exactly. I refuse to become a pawn, using his power to attain his goals. I'm going to become strong using only my own power, and I'm going to surpass all might, like my father never could. But, Izuku said, his brain whirring at light speed. All might is like, old, at least for an active hero. He's going to retire soon, I'll bet. There won't be anything to surpass, except maybe the number of people you save. It's not like you're ever going to face off against him in a one-on-one -on -one fight to prove you were better. By the time you ever hit number one, he'd probably have stepped down already. Todoroki stared at him as if he hadn't really considered that part. It was easy to overlook. Because All Might was larger than life, and it was almost impossible to imagine a world without him always in the spotlight. Izuku knew that time was coming faster than anyone probably realized. But it was still a logical conclusion even with his insider knowledge. And if you're aiming to surpass the number of people saved, you're cheating yourself and doubling your workload by only using half of your power, Izuku pointed out. Think of how many more people you could save, or villains you could take down. I told you, I won't use my father's quirk too. But it's not his. It's yours, Izuku said simply. Does your ice quirk belong to your mother? Or do you think of it as yours? You have twice the power he does, he even said so, and in a few years everyone will know it, if you work hard and don't cripple yourself. Shouto looked unhappy to be told that. Look, Izuku persisted. I don't know what kind of people my quirks came from, except my mom. For all I know, they could have been villains. All I have control of is how I use them, now that they're mine, and use them to be the best person, the best hero, I can be. I can get by fine with my eyes, Todoroki said stubbornly. I'm sure you can, Izuku said with a level gaze but only half as fast. And there are others out there giving 100% of everything we've got trying to be the best hero we can. If you think half-assing it is going to get you where you want to be, I think you might be in for disappointment. Just like at the sports festival, you're not the only one that wants that number one spot. Izuku got to his feet and stretched, feeling the sore muscles from his earlier training. He felt bad throwing the sports festival in his face, but it was still true. He imagined that Endeavor had been deeply unhappy about Shadow's performance, too. Maybe that was where all of his aggression with training his son today was coming from. Anyway, that's just what I think. It might be worth looking at it from a different point of view. Good night. Izuku left Todoroki there in the common area and retreated to his room, hoping he hadn't overstepped his boundaries too much. He still had six days left with Todoroki in Endeavor and didn't want to make them hell for himself. Todoroki didn't seem angry, but he didn't look like Izuku's little speech had helped him reach an epiphany, either. The next day, Shouto acted as he usually did. They worked out with the burning psychikers in the morning, and Izuku got a lot of attention for the amount of weight he could bench press even without one for all. The heroes they had been scheduled to train with after the morning workout got called out for work, and Izuku and Todoroki were allowed to stay in the gym and continue their workout. Can I ask you a question? Todoroki asked Izuku as they washed up after their workout. You said last night that you have your mother's quirk. Of all the things that Shouto could have taken away from their talk, was surprised that it was that small detail that had stuck with him. Yes, when I was four, we were in a train wreck together. 
It was caused by a villain rampaging, and she didn't make it. Right after that, we realized that I had pull, and thought I'd just manifested a quirk like hers. But then I got other quirks and it became obvious a bit after that that it was literally her quirk. Oh, Todoroki seemed to need time to process that for whatever reason, and didn't ask about anything else. Later, they train with two different heroes than the day before, and Izuku was intrigued by Vertigo's quirk. She could put people within a 3 meter radius off balance by making them dizzy. This was especially interesting because one of Izuku's quirks was a balance and agility combination. They sort of cancelled each other out. Though Izuku did still feel the effects of the dizziness, he retained his ability to stay on his feet, even though his aim was off. Added to this was the fact that she was an excellent fighter, and nearly as agile as Izuku. I'll bet we could put together an amazing acrobatic team, if we wanted to, she said with a grin as they almost literally danced around each other as they sparred. In the end, it was Izuku's stomach that lost him the match nearly vomiting all over his opponent in the process. His equilibrium was tossed around for too long as they learned the ins and outs of each other's style, and his stomach couldn't stand it. He surrendered, and lurched to the nearest wall to put his head between his knees. This must be how Yuraka felt when she overused her quirk. Vertigo pulled an airsick bag from a pocket in her costume and offered it to him. You gave me a run for my money, she told him with a grin, breathing as heavily as he was. Izuku took the bag, but managed to wrestle his nausea back down even though his mouth had been watering the way it often did before he was sick. After he recovered, it was time to switch partners, and this time Shouto was sweating. There was steam expelling from his mouth and nose with every breath, and Izuku guessed he was working to regulate his body temperature. Something about his training session must have kept him from strong arming through with his eyes. He glanced at Izuku and looked warily at his green complexion before turning his eyes to Vertigo. You're with me, now, she told him. Hope you didn't have too big of a breakfast. Izuku handed Shouto the airsick bag as he passed and murmured, might want to keep that handy. The man that had accompanied Shouto to the room smiled and gestured for Izuku to follow him. So Izuku took a steadying breath and exited the room he'd been in with Vertigo. Her quirk is wild, isn't it? The man asked. It's usually a hurl fest when someone trains with her for as long as you did. Izuku knew from the schedule he'd looked over that this hero's name was Fugu, which made Izuku very curious about his quirk. Did he blow up like a puffer fish? He was about to find out. Introductions were made, and Fugu immediately asked about his quirk, then had a dozen or more questions when he learned about inheritance and the resulting quirks Izuku had. How are you going to handle being around scenes where people are dying without being overwhelmed with new quirks? I'm still working on that one, Izuku admitted. You'll want to make it a priority, Fugu warned. Our job is to save everyone we can, but it's not always the reality. You will see people die, sooner or later. In disaster zones, we're usually called out after the main chaos is over, but you can't count on it. Izuku nodded, swallowing hard. He had been getting increasingly worried about this fact, and needed to ask All Might and Sir if there was anything more he could be doing. All right, enough talking about things you can't do anything about right now. We're here to train, Fugu said. You've got some great quirks, but I don't know how much good they'll do you when you're fighting me. Your job is to find a way to capture me without destroying the room. A lot of the fights you'll be in are going to be indoors, in enclosed spaces. You need to take into account how sound the building's structure is, if there are any other occupants that are innocent or unaware of what's going on, and a dozen other little things. Sometimes a quirk that you really rely on will only end up hindering you, and you'll have to deal with it the best way you can. Am I allowed to ask about your quirk before we get started? Izuku asked, glad the nausea had passed and his mind was clear. Nope, the man told him cheerfully. For this session, I'm the villain, and you're trying to subdue me without injuring the hostages. Hostages? Izuku asked, looking around the brightly lit, but empty room. Fugu pressed a button on what looked like a car's key fob, and a panel in the wall sprang open to reveal a small storage space. Inside was a pair of chairs with cloth dummies tied to them, back to back. One wore a bubblegum pink wig and a flowery dress, and the other wore a business suit and had a goatee painted on its face. Fugu dragged them over to the side of the room, near the windows and grinned. Meet Mako and Takashi, he said. They're made of cloth, because many of us need to train in being careful not to accidentally burn bystanders or hostages. Izuku nodded, already trying to formulate a plan, even though he didn't know what the man's quirk was. Green sparks began to crackle around him as he charged up one for all. Begin, Fugu said. Izuku was moving before Fugu had even finished speaking, zipping to the hostages and lifting them over his head, chairs and all. He zipped back to the door on the other side of the room as Fugu was still turning to see where he had gone. Quick, aren't you? Fugu commented, beginning to charge toward Izuku and the hostages. Izuku opened the door and shoved the hostages out before closing himself back in the room with Fugu. Oh ho, Fugu said with what sounded like glee. A hero who uses his head. Let's see what you've got. But these words, a force field of some sort expanded around Fugu, tinged with swirling yellow and red. 
There were small spikes poking out of it that did indeed resemble the shape of an angry puffer fish. Izuku was entranced for a split second before Fugu punched one of the spikes from his side of the bubble. Whatever it was in the spike came flying toward him as if it was an arrow shot from a bow. Izuku dodged and reached for a quick snuff pellet. Not sure if it would work, but willing to test it out by process of elimination, at least. Green sparks crackling around him. He leapt over the force field, landing on the side of the room near the windows. The arrows kept coming, and seemed to replace themselves instantly once launched. They also stuck into whatever surface they hit, leaving a spike sticking out that added a new obstacle to the room with each impact. The room's temperature didn't seem to be any different from the time he'd stepped into it than after the force field had formed and Izuku didn't hold out much hope when he flicked the quick snuff at Fugu. Sure enough, the pellet bounced off harmlessly and landed intact on the floor. Izuku used pull to retrieve it and tuck it away again. His supply was running low, and he didn't want to exhaust it on the second day of his internship. What will you do, now, Vanguard? You saved the hostages, but how will you save yourself? Fugu asked with a manic grin. He continued to punch projectiles as Izuku dodged. And Izuku appreciated the fact that the hero was hamming it up to make the little scenario seem more real. Izuku tried to use the same mindset, and envisioned Fugu as an actual villain who had endangered innocent people. He considered his options. Breaking out the windows in any way was a danger to anyone below, so that should be avoided at all costs. Using his strength quirk on the floor or walls was out for the same reason. Maybe it was time to take a risk. He allowed his leg to brush one of the arrows that was protruding from the floor, and noted that nothing harmful really happened. He timed his dodges to allow him to position himself directly in front of Fugu, a willing target. The next arrow that came toward him would have hit Izuku dead in the chest if he hadn't dodged, but instead of jumping or tumbling out of the way, he treated the arrow like an attacker and waited for the right moment to lean to the side and reach up to snatch it out of the air. The force behind it was no joke, but Izuku had one for all charged up and the strength and speed helped him keep his grip. The spike vibrated in his hand and sent a humming all the way up his arm that didn't dissipate once it stopped flying, but there was no pain. That gave him options. Fugu was so surprised by Izuku's catch that he stopped punching out spikes for a moment, but then resumed at an even more furious pace. Izuku tried to catch as many as he could, letting them fall to the floor. Fugu advanced on him, and the force field advanced with its owner, but Izuku stood his ground. If the arrows didn't cause pain, would the force field? He let the bubble approach with Fugu inside, and continued to swat and kick the arrows out of the way, using his balance and agility to hop from the tops of the embedded spikes when he needed to. His shoes didn't melt or spark or anything when they came in contact with them, and he deemed them safe enough, so he waited until he was close enough to touch the bubble. It had the same strange vibration, only stronger, and sent a zing up Izuku's arm that bordered on pain. Excellent. Izuku drew back his arm and punched the force field with a decent bit of one for all behind it, and found it to have an almost rubbery, elastic surface tension, but it also forced Fugu backward a few steps. It definitely had some impact absorption qualities, if the punch hadn't sent him flying. It seemed that Fugu was at the center of the bubble and if the bubble moved, then so did Fugu. Interesting. One of the arrows got past Izuku and left him with a stinging gash across his left cheekbone. And he had to remind himself that he was fighting a villain intent on hurting him. The arrows weren't harmless, and he needed to take them seriously. He took an arrow to his hip, but his suit held up the way it was supposed to, and didn't tear or puncture. He was sure he would have a spectacular bruise later, but there was nothing broken. He needed to find a way to end things before he got too tired. Izuku backed away again and scooped up two of the discarded spikes from the floor, then grunted when he was hit in the shoulder. The multiple hits meant he was getting sloppy tired. Aiming carefully, Izuku threw the spike back at Fugu, not to strike him, but to test his theory. Sure enough, the spike pierced the force field and came out the other side, burying itself in the wall behind. Nice, Izuku said aloud, his lips stretching into a grin. Fugu had a moment to look wary before he was also being forced to dodge his own spikes. The room was full of obstacles at this point. And as Fugu moved around the room, the spikes implanted in the floor and walls hampered him just as much as his opponent. Soon, Izuku had reached a stalemate of sorts, with plenty of ammo bristling out of the walls and floor like porcupine quills. Finally, Izuku made up his mind to force the issue and took several direct hits to get in close again, using one spike in each hand to come at Fugu from two angles. He had backed the man up into a corner and was now pressed as far into the force field as he could get, the point of each spike up under his chin. Fugu froze. Well played, the hero said, leaning back as much as he was able. I concede. Izuku breathed out a sigh of relief and stepped backward. Fugu let his force field drop, making all of the spikes flicker and disappear along with it. The only sound for a few moments was their heavy breathing as they settled down. You took quite a few hits, kid. You've gotta be hurting. Fugu finally said. Well, it doesn't feel good. 
Izuku agreed. But that was a fun fight. Fugu laughed. Would it have been as much fun if you'd lost? He asked, wiping sweat off of his brow. Maybe not, but I did learn a lot. Izuku was still grinning as he stretched his shoulder and winced. It was painful, but it was manageable. He'd likely taken over the counter pain reliever before patrol, though. Shouto had been a no-show at the briefing meeting, and he was later getting to the cafeteria than Izuku. He sat across from Izuku, but was most definitely not eating anything and looked like he might throw up at any second. She beat you, too. Izuku asked upon seeing him. He noted that no one else was sitting with Shouto today, probably worried about being in the splash zone based on his appearance. Ugh, right. Izuku agreed, interpreting the groan as queasy affirmation. My balance quirk kind of worked against her quirk, but it was still super hard. Izuku took a huge bite of the egg sando that he'd chosen from the cafeteria menu. Shouto averted his eyes in revulsion, and Izuku wasn't sure if it was because he didn't like eggs or if he just felt that sick. The effects didn't take that long to pass, so if you still feel sick before patrol, you should see Doc about something to help. I saw him, Shouto said quietly, as if afraid to open his mouth too widely. He gave me a couple of pills and had me lie down. I'm still waiting for them to kick in. Gotcha, Izuku said, looking at him with sympathy. Looks like it hit you harder than me. Sorry, Shouto waved off his concern. The schedule said we would be patrolling with Anima and Burnin today, Izuku said. I wonder if we'll learn something new. I hope so, Shouto said, seeming to get some color back to his pale face. Yesterday's was crap. Izuku hummed an agreement and continued to devour his sandwich. He still had a salad and soup on his tray, and offered Shouto the soup, but the boy shook his head. Apparently he still wasn't feeling up to it. The afternoon patrol was a lot more interesting and engaging than the one they'd endured with Endeavor. Anima was a large man with headgear that featured two short horns above each eye, and an X-harness across his chest that reminded Izuku of Kakin's hero costume in a way. He had a serious disposition and was intimidating looking, until he smiled. When he smiled, he appeared friendly and approachable. They headed out into their district with a much lighter attitude than Endeavor had displayed, and Izuku noticed immediately that the public was familiar with them and liked seeing them. There was lots of waving, and Izuku and Shouto were introduced to shop owners and chatted with children and their parents. These two heroes had obviously made an effort to get to know their community and become a part of it. No request or job was too small, from tying a schoolboy's shoes for him to lifting a cat from the branches of a tree. Everyone was treated with kindness and respect, and Izuku really enjoyed watching everyone's relaxed attitude. He also didn't miss that the heroes still kept a sharp eye on their surroundings, prepared for any trouble that might arise. Shouto even smiled a little when a baby in a stroller wordlessly offered him a half-eaten cookie. He didn't take the cookie and pretend to eat it, but he did smile and refuse with a quiet, that's yours. By the end of the patrol, even though nothing big had happened beyond getting to stop a motorbike that a new rider had lost control of, Izuku felt a sense of accomplishment. It had been a good day. At the end of it, he spontaneously took a selfie with Burnin and Shouto, though Shouto didn't seem to care one way or the other about being in it. He sent it to his dad, All Might and Sir to show them with his grin that he was doing okay. He also sent it to the group chat, which wasn't very busy beyond a couple of comments about being in pain or exhausted by Kaminari, Siro and Minta. Izuku and Shouto both washed and sank into the communal bath, glad to have a chance to soak their sore muscles after a busy day. Shouto didn't say a word about all of the bruises decorating Izuku's body, possibly because he himself didn't look too much different. The bath was huge, and there were a couple of other heroes soaking, as well. Izuku put his towel on his head and leaned back against the side, telling himself he shouldn't fall asleep, or he'd drown. You, Shouto began to say, then stopped and considered before saying, your strength quirk. Izuku opened his eyes not even realizing that he'd closed them and looked at Todoroki in question. When you use it, you get these green lights, kind of like in a plasma ball. The kind where you touch the glass ball and little lightning bolts get attracted to your hand. Izuku knew what he was talking about. He'd had one as a child, but it had fallen off of his desk and shattered. He nodded and waited to see if there was a question attached to the observation. That kind of gives away that you're about to do something big, Shouto said. I don't make the sparks on purpose, Izuku told him with a slight smile. They just show up when I charge up that quirk. Why does it have to be charged up? Shouto asked, sounding curious, but exhausted at the same time. Does it run out of power or something, so you have to turn it on and off? Like a light switch. Izuku opened his mouth to answer, then paused. That was a very good question. All Might didn't have to charge up before he used his strength, did he? He didn't have any dancing webs of light telegraphing his moves, either. So, why did Izuku? I don't know, he admitted, brow furrowing as he considered it. I get tired like anyone else who exerts energy, but it doesn't drain me or anything. It's just what came naturally to me, I guess. You're strong all the time, 
but you seem to draw on this will of extra strength sometimes. I guess I just wondered why it's not always there, like my ice is always there. That's something I never considered, Izuku said, wondering why he'd never thought of it. It seemed like the most obvious thing in the world. He was always using at least a small percentage of one for all in everything he did, wasn't he? But the green sparks weren't always there. Did All Might and Sir wonder the same thing? Had they been watching him, waiting for him to figure it out for himself? This was definitely worth exploring. He just needed to figure out how to go about it. Thank you, Todoroki, Izuku said, standing and starting to leave the top. I want to go try it out and see if I can do it. Aren't you tired? Shouto asked. His tone seemed to say, I am. I was almost asleep when you started talking. Izuku confessed. You might want to get some dinner, get some sleep, and maybe try it out in the morning. Izuku knew he was right, but didn't want to admit it. Instead he sank back into the water with something akin to a pout. He would probably need to consider how to go about keeping one for all switched on all the time. Anyway, would he have to walk around all the time with green lightning webbing around him? All Might didn't. You're funny, Todoroki told him suddenly. I wasn't trying to be, Izuku said, wondering what he meant. You were telling me that I was half-assing it by only using half my power. But you're doing the same thing, aren't you? Not intentionally, Izuku pointed out. It's different for me, since I'm not refusing to use it, and I'm willing to try to fix that as soon as possible. I just have to figure out how. Hmm, Todoroki said noncommittally. Izuku didn't push him any farther about it, because he was suddenly a lot more awake, and his brain was worrying with new possibilities. He had a lot to think about. Was it too late to text All Might or Sir? Izuku's sleep that night was so deep that he felt like he had barely closed his eyes before his alarm was waking him. He had spent part of the night seeing just how far he could charge up one for all in his dark room without the green glow showing up, and seeing if he could extend it. He hoped that maybe whoever he trained with during the morning session could give him some advice, but he couldn't count on it, since it seemed to be a pretty unique problem. Morning, Vernon. He greeted her when he saw her in the gym that morning. There seemed to be more activity this morning, and the vibe of the room was tense. Change of plans for today, she said as Shouto also entered the room and stood beside Izuku. We're going to go to Hasu this afternoon. Hasu? Izuku asked. His first thought was that he was pretty sure that was where Ida had chosen to intern with Manuel. He's going after the hero killer, Shouto said. It wasn't a question. Someone's gotta bring him down, Vernon said philosophically. You two are coming with us. Endeavor wants you to watch him work. You mean he wants us to watch him show off? Shouto grumbled. I'll bet that even if he's showing off, we can learn a lot, Izuku said. Shouto made no comment. And they began their morning workout with a sense of excitement. Izuku knew that it probably wasn't going to be as exciting as it sounded. If Stain was in the area, he wasn't exactly going to advertise it, and Hasu was a huge place to search. There was probably going to be a lot of walking involved, like a huge game of hide-and-seek, where everyone was it, and they weren't sure the hider was even playing at the same time. The training for the morning was more interesting for Izuku. He spent time with a hero named Torchlight who had a background in judo and who was happy to give him some refresher lessons and offer suggestions on how to better utilize some moves to work in tandem with his quirks. The schedule had been amended because of the afternoon's outing. He got to spend an entire hour with Torchlight, who could light his fists on fire during a fight. Izuku explained his problem about his strength quirk charging up, and asked for any advice, but there wasn't much his mentor could offer. If it was me, I think I would try to envision it as a rheostat switch, like they have for lights. Try to determine what the strongest setting is, and figure out what percentage of power you're currently using without turning the dial. After that, just nudge it up a little at a time, until it's always at full. Not sure it can work that way, but you could try it. Izuku nodded, thinking it was as good of advice as any, and promised to give it a try. It wasn't all that different from what he'd been trying last night. Once their hour was up, Izuku moved to the training room where Shouto had been working with Flamewhip. Shouto nodded to Izuku as they passed in the hallway, but he didn't seem to be injured at all, so the training probably went well. The room was almost oven hot when he entered, but it seemed to cool quickly with the door open. Izuku was surprised to see all sorts of obstacles bolted to the floor in this room, representing walls and pillars of varying height, poles and just random shapes. He introduced himself to the hero, who was tall and thin, with skin as pale as an albino. Maybe he was albino. His hair was concealed by a snug hood, and his eyes were covered by reflective goggles. Today, we're going to play a game, Flame Whip said with a smile. The floor is lava, and the ceiling is out of bounds. We'll play tag using only our quirks, skills, and the obstacles around us. The walls, Izuku asked to clarify. Fair game. Flame Whip decided after a moment of consideration. Can I assume your name is the same as your quirk? Izuku asked. Flame Whip laughed and nodded. So, if you tag me with your whip, am I it or do you have to actually tag me with your hands? Izuku pressed, wanting to be sure he had the rules clear. This sounded like a fun and challenging game, 
and a good exercise in physical and situational awareness, not unlike some of the training they'd done at UA. Getting tagged by my whip counts as a regular tag. If you have anything similar in your quirk arsenal or support gear, that counts too. Izuku nodded with a grin and hopped up onto a cement ball, and Flame Whip hopped up on a low wall. What followed could only be described as chaotic fun. The burning whips that shot around the room had real tensile strength to them, and could be used to wrap around the poles and pillars and swing by. Izuku used his gymnastic skills to flip, handspring and ping-pong around the room, bouncing off of obstacles and walls, and spinning around poles as the two of them took turns being it. In the end, it was a draw for the number of times each got tagged, though secretly Izuku felt that he had won because he'd gotten in close and used his hands, and Flame Whip had gotten his tags in from a distance. Still, the precision he had with his quirk was amazing and not to be discounted. After that was the briefing room and it was packed. Izuku sat hip to hip with Shouto as everyone squeezed into the room and Endeavor took the place up front. He announced their destination, the team-ups, and the orders he wanted them to follow. There was a large map of Hasu broken up into sections that he wanted everyone to scour and made it clear that he wanted to be alerted at any sign of the stain. Shouto and Izuku would be assigned to patrol with Endeavor's team, with Torchlight and Mamanga there to keep the interns under closer supervision in case Endeavor had to engage in battle. The meeting went on for well over an hour, with every angle being covered and tons of questions being answered. From there, they were all given box lunches and loaded into vans, then onto a bullet train that would take them to Hasu City. Two and a half hours later, they were at their destination. Izuku was impressed with how quickly and smoothly the teams divided up and spread out, disappearing into the streets and getting to work. Izuku and Shouto stood by while Endeavor directed everything and everyone into place. Torchlight and Mamanga stuck close to the pair of interns, but didn't seem particularly tense. We've got a while before sunset, and that's when crime usually picks up, Mamanga told them. We're not here for just any crime, Endeavor said when he heard him. Stain sticks to back allies and blind turns, so that's where we'll be searching. Leave no stone unturned. He'll still be in the area. He always hits the same city four times before moving on. Izuku nodded along with the others. Shouto, you stick close to me and pay attention, he ordered, pointing to his side. Vanguard, you make sure you're always in sight of Mamanga and Torchlight. Do not wander off. We'll steer clear of hospitals like I promised in your contract. I wouldn't expect Stain to attack near anywhere his victims could readily get help. Anyway. With those clipped words, Endeavor strode forward, ignoring the surprised expressions of the citizens that saw him, wondering aloud why he was in their district. He slipped into the first alley they came to beside a karaoke bar and led the way through a maze of back alleys and dead ends that every city is made of, but few people ever see. He only ever paused if Shadow dared to fall behind a step or two, and kept up a quiet commentary for his son about what to look for, smell for, and how to approach different situations, like closed dumpsters or boxes large enough to hide anything larger than a dog inside. He grilled him with questions about how he would go about investigating in various situations and growled at him if he didn't answer satisfactorily. He mostly ignored Izuku, and it was not lost on any of them that Shouto was getting preferential treatment in the training department. Neither psychic tried to educate Izuku in the same manner, since it might mean speaking over Endeavor. Izuku caught the looks that Mamanga and Torchlight threw at each other behind Endeavor's back, as if they thought he was being unfair to Vanguard, but he didn't care. Even if he wasn't being catered to the way Shouto was, he could still hear everything Endeavor was saying and file it away in his mental notes if it was anything worth noting. They had already learned a lot of what he was saying at school, and All Might and Sir had also taught him plenty. Shouto also seemed to dislike the special attention, scowling and saying, I already know that, over and over. It wasn't that Endeavor didn't have wisdom to impart, it was that he was being overbearing about it and not taking his own turn to listen. He came across as almost dangerously arrogant, except that Izuku had seen him fight and knew that he could back up the arrogance with action. Nothing much happened for the first hour, except scaring the crap out of a couple of vagrants getting high behind a kanbini and flushing out quite a few stray cats and a couple of raccoons scavenging for a meal along the way. Then they started hearing strange sounds, screeches that were definitely not human, though could have been caused by a quirk. Then, there were sounds of shouting and screaming, along with crashing sounds. Through a narrow gap between two buildings they could glimpse a fire burning not too far away. Sirens began. Endeavor began to run toward the nearest outlet onto the main road with everyone else following along. Izuku's heartbeat began to pick up speed as he noted the chaos beginning to erupt on the main street. What on earth is that? Endeavor asked. Obviously a rhetorical question. Shouto answered anyway, and Izuku stared with wide eyes at the scene in front of them. That looks like the Namu from the USJ, but different. Izuku felt the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. If there was a Namu, there was probably also Shigaraki and Kirijiri. He stepped up beside Shouto, taking in the scene of a creature similar in style to the Namu from the USJ, but not as bulky. 
It still had the exposed brain, but this had multiple eyes and pale, gray skin over its muscular form. It was only torchlight grabbing his arm that kept Izuku from charging in to fight the thing as it raised whipcord arms and slammed its fists onto the hood of an occupied car. Endeavor raised a single hand and shot a concentrated blast of fire from his palm, punching into the Namu from over ten meters away. It screeched and loped away, but another hero appeared on the scene and smashed into it hard enough to send it flying toward the elevated train tracks that ran by the city. Endeavor was about to pursue, when another Namu swooped out of the air, grabbing at random people as it flapped huge, leathery bat wings. This one had yellowish skin and the talon-like feet of a raptor. Its brain had a smaller exposure area, and its face looked like it was covered in something that looked like a gas mask. There's two of them, Shouto observed, taking in the mayhem that their presence was causing. Maybe more? Mamanga pointed out, seeing small explosions going off deeper in the city center. Shouto, you come with me. Mamanga, you go after the flying one. Call for backup if you need it. Torchlight. Take Izuku and get him as far away from the main disaster as possible. Help fleeing citizens find shelter. Mamanga took to the air on his fiery wings, running to get the lift he needed, like a kite taking to the breeze. Endeavor was only a few steps away. When Izuku shouted after him, I can fight. I've fought them before. Endeavor simply looked at Torchlight and bellowed, Take him. I don't have time for this. Torchlight grabbed Izuku's arm and pulled him down the sidewalk while Endeavor and Shouto took off running toward the explosions in the distance. Come on kid, don't fight me on this. I want to be out there as much as you do but this is the boss's orders. You don't even have a provisional license. He finally let go of Izuku's arm when he felt his charge fall into step with him instead of pulling away. Izuku pulled his phone out of his pocket and quickly sent a message to All Might and Sir. At LSD2 Namu in Hasu City Mac and TR Blee. I am safe. He pocketed his phone again as they found a group of confused citizens. Torchlight approached them and let them know there were villains at large and advised them to take shelter immediately in a nearby business. They continued down the street, clearing people as best they could and keeping an eye out for signs of trouble. They passed an alleyway, and Torchlight backtracked and motioned for Izuku to be quiet. I heard something down there, and I think I can see. Someone down. The hero said softly, Stay here while I check it out. Can I trust you not to run off? Izuku nodded, wanting to follow him. Good. As soon as it's clear, I'll either come back or call for you. Torchlight hurried stealthily down the dark passageway and disappeared into the gathering gloom. Izuku waited and listened, but after a full three minutes, there was still no sign of anyone. He gave it another few seconds before he levitated himself to the top of the two-story building and raced to the back side, looking down at the scene below. The visibility was terrible and it was hard to see in the ambient light of windows and insufficient security lighting. But there were three people lying on the ground and one standing. Izuku recognized Ida's hero suit instantly, and Torchlight was not far from him, also down. The third man was slumped against the wall and looked like he might be unconscious. There were rumbling voices, but they were too muffled to hear, and Izuku's heart was thundering too loudly. Izuku prayed that none of them were dying as he pulled out his phone again and dropped a pin on a map, sending it to Shouto's phone, then after a moment, to Sir and All Might's. Then he texted a quick help. Torchlight down. To Shouto is an afterthought. Then he started quickly tapping on his suit to turn it dark gray to match the dim lighting. He ran out of time when the only man standing below lifted a large sword above his head, aiming it straight for Ida's back. He took a leap of faith. He shouted as he fell, not from fear, but as a distraction. He landed near the man slumped against the wall and crouched. Where did you come from? The man with the sword demanded. So many interruptions. Get out of here, kid. The man on the wall told him without moving. That's the hero killer. He cut me and now I can't move. He recognized this man as the hero called Native. Aside from apparent paralysis, he seemed relatively unharmed. There was a small gash in his arm and no other visible wounds. Don't worry, I'll get you out of here. Izuku eyed the man called Stain and noted the spikes on the tips of his boots were stained red with blood, and the armor over Ida's right arm looked crushed. He also had a lot of weapons strapped to his body. The villain was dressed shabbily, with ragged scarves around his neck and a mask with long trailing cloth tails. His face beneath his mask was oddly flat, as if his nose was crushed or absent altogether. His tongue hung from his mouth much like Tsuyu's tended to do, but was pointed and bumpy and grotesque. Midoriya, Ida cried out in dismay. What? How? Get out of here. This has nothing to do with you. Shut up, Ida, Izuku said harshly. If all you're going to spout is nonsense, I'm going to save you. I'm going to save all of you. He will, will you? Stain asked silkily. At the same time, Torchlight shouted, Run, kid. Find a hero. I am a hero, Izuku told him. A hero doesn't leave people in danger to save himself. Well, 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 Stain said, sounding pleased. Finally someone with his head in the game. Why do you want to be a hero, kid? 
tell me, and I might let you live. Izuku shifted, wondering how much he could charge up one for all before he started glowing. If he could keep this guy talking, it might give Shouto time to muster up some help and get here before this got very, very ugly. The same reason as anyone else, Izuku said firmly. To save people in trouble, right now, that includes these three men. If you could follow through on that, you'd be famous all over Japan, Stain fairly crooned. Wouldn't you? How would I know? Izuku asked in bewilderment. What does it matter? Is that why you've been attacking heroes? To make a name for yourself? Are you working with Shigaraki, now? Is that why the Namu are destroying the city? Such an inquisitive boy, Stain said with a smile. I'm not with that idiot, though I'll have to deal with him soon. No, I'm ridding the world of all of these false idols. These heroes who only save people so they can have power over others, or money or fame. Fakes. All of them. How are you any different? Izuku asked, starting to sweat as more and more time went by without any sign of help. You're sowing terror in people's lives and killing heroes based on what? Their desires. You're ridding the world of people willing to put their lives on the line every day. No matter why they do it, it still gets done, and people are safer for it. All Might. All Might is the only true hero out there. Stain declared, cutting Izuku off. Only he has the purity of heart and mind to call himself a true hero. And he is the only one I will allow to bring me down. That's crazy, Izuku said, moving toward the side of the alley that would keep the downed heroes safe from Stain's attention. Sure All Might is the greatest, but there are a lot of fine. Fine isn't good enough, Stain growled. Maybe you don't understand yet, because you're too pure yourself to understand the underlying greed in the hero community. That one, there, he pointed to Native slumped against the wall. Who Izuku had already checked on. He was telling me about the fat paycheck he'd earned for taking me down. Izuku glanced at the hero, who was still not moving. And that one, he jabbed his sword in the direction of Ida's prone form, came here for vengeance, to make me pay for hurting his brother. Another wannabe hero with a complex, looking for power over others. And that one, psychic to endeavor, the most insufferable of them all. I'm doing the world a favor by dispatching them. You should cut your losses and get out of here. Izuku straightened, his fists balled tightly, and green lightning began to crackle faintly over his form. Then I wouldn't be able to call myself a hero. Pity, Stain said. His movement was so fast. Izuku never even saw it. A dagger grazed his cheek, right beside his eye, and buried itself in the bricks behind him. A trickle of blood seeped out of the wound, and he didn't wait to see if he would become paralyzed like the others, he just moved. He began to run, but only got a meter away before he felt the jolt of all of his muscles seizing. He fell to the ground like a ragdoll, landing in a heap and unable to move any of his limbs. Shit, Stain was standing near the wall, holding the dagger he'd thrown at Izuku. Don't feel too bad, kid. I'm gonna let you live. You might actually end up being a decent hero one day, Stain told him. But these others are lost causes. Oh good. A serial killer has taken a liking to me. Izuku thought wildly. Aloud, he shouted for the villain to stop. He pleaded with him to spare the others, talking about how Ida was just a student and needed time to learn how to be a proper hero. Izuku kept trying desperately to get the man to monologue again. To buy time, but even though he couldn't see what the villain was doing he could hear him just fine. His heavy boots on the concrete, and the chains hanging somewhere on his clothes rattling faintly. I'll make their deaths swift, as my gift to you, starting with your friend, Stain told him. But if you disappoint me, you will not find me merciful when your time comes. Inooo. Izuku shouted himself hoarse as waited helplessly for the sound of a blade piercing Ada's armor. Just as he was about to fall into the depths of despair, an icy blast tore through the alley, and Izuku felt the ice forming under his body, lifting up slightly, and sliding him in the direction he knew Stain was standing. A bright light, along with a FWOOSH sound filled the air for a second, and Izuku could see flames as he tumbled along the ice. Had Endeavor arrived with Shouto, was he really that lucky? Well, he was half that lucky. Shouto stood above him as Izuku slid to a stop at his feet. Stain had retreated backward, away from the flames and ice, facing the newest person on the scene. Izuku strained to look around him to get his bearings, and saw part of Native's costume in his periphery, and could hear Ida close by his head. Todoroki, Ida was saying. Shouto, Izuku said, both sides at once. I've been thinking about what you said, Shouto said quietly. I'm still not sure. You two shouldn't be here. Ada all but screamed at them, desperate tears in his eyes. I'm the one who has to do this. I inherited my brother's name. I'm Ingenium, now. I never saw the Ingenium I know make a face like that. Todoroki told him coldly. You have to do what? Die in an alley. You think he'd want that? Izuku yelled at him, even though he couldn't see him. Ben Stain was charging toward them again and Shouto put up a huge wall of jagged ice to keep him at bay. Shouto, I think Stain has to ingest your blood to paralyze you. Izuku said. He cut my face, but I didn't get paralyzed instantly. It has something to do with the blood. He licked the knife after he cut me. Native confirmed. 
That explains all the blades, Shadow grunted, as two of them sliced away at the ice wall. I'll have to keep my distance. Even as he said it, a blade whizzed by, slicing Shadow's cheek open just below the scar around his eye. Shadow quickly put a ball of ice around the knife, so any blood on it was enveloped. Izuku could only stay where he had ended up, straining to move any part of his body while he listened to Shadow and Stain fight. Shadow tried to keep him talking, but Stain seemed to be ready, willing and able to talk while he wielded his blades. Another one who thinks of saving people before themselves, Stain was saying to Shadow. Though your father, can the apple fall far from the tree? I'm nothing like my father, Shadow snarled. The air was filled with the chill and sounds of crackling ice being formed and cut down. Close one, Shadow breathed, barely loud enough for Izuku to hear. Maybe now that they've got All Might teaching the next generation, there's some hope, after all, Stain said. But this one had his chance and didn't take it. The sound of boots on crunching ice sent dread through Izuku like an electric shock, making him strain even harder. Obstructing your own view during a fight with an opponent who's faster than you is a terrible strategy. By the way, Stain criticized. You think so? There was more light. And the sound of more ice, and it was maddening not to be able to see what was going on. Izuku strained as hard as he could against the invisible bonds holding him, letting his fury grow. His helplessness, the anger at Ida for being so stupid, everything else he'd ever been angry about became fuel for the fire he tried to build up inside of him, and suddenly, he could move again. He shot forward like a bullet from a gun and used the walls on either side to ping-pong upward faster than his levitation could have managed. He slammed in disdain from the side as the villain was falling downward above Shadow, getting a fistful of scarf and shirt as he dragged the villain away from his friends and the two helpless heroes. Mido, Vanguard. Shadow shouted after him. I can suddenly move just fine. Izuku shouted back. Time limit. Shadow called. Izuku didn't think so, since he had been the last to get dropped, and Native, Torchlight and Ida were still down. Looking back to check that his friends were still safe cost him, and Izuku took a sharp elbow jab from Stain in his back. The villain twisted in Izuku's grip and got himself free, leaving Izuku to topple to the ground as Stain skidded to a stop a few meters away. Get out of there, Shadow called to him. Izuku was now facing Stain, halfway between the villain and Shadow. Stain was eyeing him warily, and slowly reached to draw a very large weapon from somewhere behind his back. Izuku used pull as Stain twirled the blade into position and the enormous serrated bowie knife flew to Izuku, who didn't dare try to catch it in his hand. He leaned and let it drop behind him, and heard a shhkt that told Izuku that Shadow had encased it in ice. Interesting, Stain said, keeping a firm grip on the next knife he drew. Seriously, how many knives does this guy have on him? Native asked loudly enough for Izuku to hear. The answer to that was too many as Izuku ducked multiple small blades that were flung past him while he'd been watching the larger one in Stain's other hand. He heard Shadow gasp, but didn't dare tear his eyes away from his opponent. Are you okay? Izuku asked. He was worried about the answer, but he was also trying to figure out a way to get to the other side of Stain, so they'd have him surrounded. Fine, Shadow grated out. Got nicked. Hey, Izuku said to Shadow. I'm gonna try something. Be right back. Wait, what? Shadow asked in surprise. Izuku didn't wait to explain, since it would give away his plan, anyway. He simply engaged his levitation in combination with bouncing from wall to wall until he was on the roof of the building they were fighting behind. From there, he bolted to the building next door and dropped down to the ground behind Stain, boxing him in the way Izuku wanted. He could hear Shadow telling Ida that if he wanted to help, then he needed to stand up and remember the kind of hero he wanted to be. Izuku had just enough time for Stain to turn and stare at him in calculating surprise when he charged forward at him, aiming low in an attempt to get his feet out from under him. From there, Shadow should be able to freeze him in place, giving them time to get Ida and the two heroes to safety. The best laid plans can go awry though, and as Izuku was charging for Stain's legs, Ida broke free from his confinement and rocketed forward, taking Stain from behind. The result was Stain being swept off his feet, but getting slammed backward onto Izuku's back by Ida's tackle. Shadow did take the opportunity to freeze Stain in a block of ice, but he also caught Izuku in the process. Once again, Izuku was rendered immobile. Izuku couldn't hear more than muffled sounds, as if from underwater, and his eyes were closed. Even if his eyes were open, he had a feeling that he wouldn't be able to see anything. Shadow's ice was seldom clear. He thought the muffled sounds were coming from Stain, who was struggling to get free. He could feel the villain's muscles bunching against his back. A moment later, Izuku could breathe a little as a narrow hole formed around the area of his mouth, allowing air to get in. He gulped what air he could before attempting to speak. Stain, too. He'll suffocate. He wasn't sure he was sufficiently loud or if his words were decipherable, but he had to at least try. They weren't murderers. They weren't villains. They weren't like Stain. They couldn't afford to be. It seemed like an eternity that Izuku was frozen there with Stain at his back, 
and it was an extremely unsettling experience. The other man was clearly still conscious and struggling. And as long as that was true, Izuku was stuck there. He was shivering at first, and the cold became painful before long. His breathing was labored because his ribs and chest were encased in ice, with only a little give where he was back to back with stain. It was becoming slightly easier as the ice around him melted from body heat generated by two people still caught in an adrenaline rush. Eventually, after a series of strange hissing and rumbling sounds, stain went still above him. Izuku worried that he might be dead, and wondered if there was a corpse stuck in ice with him. He tried very hard not to have a panic attack as he tried to shout to get someone to tell him what was happening. Finally, Izuku could feel the ice melting around him at a rapid rate, and the weight of Stain's body being lifted off of him from above. Midoriya, Ida shouted at him. Vanguard, a couple of other voices cried. Izuku concentrated on drawing sufficient air into his lungs and trying to stop his teeth from chattering against each other as the shivering racked his entire body. He's bleeding, a voice said. Get a first aid kit. Izuku fumbled for his belt, but his fingers didn't want to cooperate to get his first aid kit from his pouch. I can warm him up, Shouto said from close by. No, warming him up too quickly will be painful. Torchlight warned. Is he every one sss safe? Izuku managed to get out. He looked around and saw everyone on their feet again, with the addition of Endeavor now being present. We're safe. Stain is restrained and being disarmed right now, Native told him. A plastic, metallic emergency blanket was wrapped around Izuku in an effort to get his body to warm up gradually with his own body heat. At the same time, someone was pressing a thick wad of gauze against his ear and jawline and wrapping it around his head from multiple directions. They kept muttering about the bandages sliding off his head. Izuku realized that his headgear was gone at that point and wondered when that had happened. Th 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 the NNN Nomas. Izuku asked, still being contained, Endeavor told him. One's dead, but the other two are still out there. I got a call from Sir Nidai about your situation, and came looking for you. GGG go. Izuku told him, pointing to the entrance of the alley. GGG get them. He noted that Stain was lying on the ground face down, with restraining cords binding his hands and feet. He wasn't moving as torchlight and Ida pulled blade after blade from his outfit. There are other heroes working on that, Native told him. You should rest. We'll get you to a hospital. And then and Izuku tried to say. No, Endeavor, Shouto and Ida said in unison over Izuku's voice. At least that much was going right. Okay sadly the chapter is over. And if you enjoyed the video just leave a like. And subscribe with post notification. So when the next chapter is ready, you will be notified. Okay see you in the next video. Bye.